Welcome back to beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada, where it is the best time of all. It is time to duel. We're back here today for the second day of our Team YCS. We have two rounds of Swiss. After those two rounds of Swiss will conclude, then we're going to cut to our top 16, which means it'll be a single elimination tournament from there. You won't want to miss it because we're going to have some incredible teams up here, and we've already showcased them. So before we get into any of that dueling action, why don't we go ahead and check in on our caster desk so we can see what we've got in store today. Thanks, Steven. Hey, Joe, how do you feel about today? I think we had an incredible Yu-Gi-Oh! yesterday, but things are just going to get even more heated up today, don't you think? We can finally settle some of those questions that we had from yesterday, differentiating between Fire King strategies with Snake Eyes and just the Snake Eye strategies themselves, and then saw a variety of decks that have tried to compete with those Fire strategies. Today, we can solidify exactly what the strategy was that was necessary to take down this incredible tournament. That's right. I mean, we've seen a giant amount of variety. We had the fire, of course, of course, we had the voiceless voice. We even got to see you Bell doing very, very well, as well as Fluunderies and even the dreaded gimmick puppet. Okay, I'm not a big fan of that, but you know what? You do what you need to do. We also saw some cash tier decks in the in the top tables yesterday as well, and there are still some in the tournament. Yeah, so everyone just kind of came in with a, a game plan, hoping that they can take out the best deck. And but we're only down to the last two rounds of Swiss. Some of them already qualified, and others, well, they're fighting as hard as they can to stay in and hopefully make that top cut. But let's take a look at our format. So, day one has already completed. So now into day two, we have two more rounds of Swiss, 45 minutes each. Then we're gonna cut to the top 16. Again, 45 minutes, and once we reach top eight and top four, there's gonna be 55 minutes per round. And finally, in the finals, we'll have a 65 minute round. Again, all of these are best two out of three. So after all of those rounds yesterday, two more rounds of Swiss before that top cut, Playing these last couple of rounds, you know, you were able to get that night sleep last night. Hopefully you got a good night sleep, you feel rejuvenated. Those last rounds of Swiss in day one can be very stressful, but today you've been able to take that rest, come back today focused, trying to win those last two rounds and potentially get into that top 16 cutoff. Yeah, hopefully. And uh, of course, these players, they're playing for some amazing prizes. So first place, team prize. All of them will be receiving an Ultra Rare Team Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series prize card, another versus Glutonia. Team Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series trophy, the Team Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series premium messenger bag, Nintendo Switch, and a Team Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series top cut game mat. And it is certainly that trophy that to me is the prize out of all of those, the prestige of winning and that trophy. Yeah. That's the one that you get to take home. You know, the Nintendo Switch someday will cool. fade out, but in 20 years, 30 years, you'll be able to always look back at that trophy and remember the incredible weekend that you had here in Las Vegas, not only winning a YCS, but doing so with two of your best friends. Yeah, I agree. But, uh, well, we're going to be going in for a short break. Uh, don't go away. We're getting settled for the next round, which will be round nine of Swiss.
Welcome back to Team YCS Las Vegas here in Nevada. We're here at the Expo at the World Market Center. We're just about ready to get into round nine. The players are getting ready. I mean, these players, there's a lot on the line. They need to make that top cut or to even have a chance to win at that trophy. And I think a lot of it comes down to whether or not they're patient. This is going to be an interesting match, I think. It's a match that we have yet to see this yeah, weekend. Yeah. So we've been featuring a lot of different decks over the course of day one. And now into day two, there are still decks that we've yet to profile on stream. So it's really exciting to see that opportunity again here. I mean, we're going to bring some classics back. It gives a lot of hope, I think. You know, you're, just because maybe your cards that were put in the Forbidden Limited list doesn't mean that the deck is done. That's the epitome of this matchup. Decks that have had to compensate for changes in the Forbidden Limited list over the course of the last year or so that have definitely taken some of their critical pieces limited them or even forbidden them in some cases, these decks are able to adapt and still find ways in the current meta to strategize enough to compete against the fire decks that have been rampant this weekend. That's true. I think there's like good calls on a lot of these deck choices that they have made, but I think they're not prepared for this. And as we get prepared for round nine, I think we can toss it over to Steven to introduce our teams. Thank you so much, Tom. Again, you're absolutely right. You don't get this far without a few more duels. So let's go ahead and introduce Team PM. That's Playmakers. Holding down the A spot for Team Playmakers is going to be Brian. And then in the B spot is Yui. That's Yuhan. And then finally in the C spot, it's Chans. Now, it would be a duel without their opponents. So let's give it up for Team No Flare Gate. No Flare Gates A is going to be Ricardo. Holding up for the B spot is Nicholas. And then in the C spot, it's Adam. So these players, I believe they are close to making top cut. They need to win this one to secure it. We'll see who actually takes it. I think this is going to be an interesting one. I don't think we want to see as many fire matchups in this one. What do you think? What's going to happen here? Well, there'll be a couple fire monsters in one of these decks. Okay, okay. Maybe actually a little bit in both, so we'll see what ends up happening. But it's not going to incorporate any of the Snake Eye cards. Yeah. So we'll see what that looks like. We, we get a little time to breathe before we dive back into the fire, for sure. I'm looking forward to the matchup here. I mean, I used to play one of these decks. These are actually the two decks that I've played the most of oh, the really? last calendar year, so it's actually really exciting to see these. We saw Kestir already in the feature match area last. Mm -hmm. You know, yesterday, so we'll see it again today. So there are some Castira decks that were able yep. to make it into day two, part of those three player teams. So if you're a Castira fan out there, the deck is still viable, at least getting here into day two. And then another deck that we've yet to see at all this weekend, Pearly. Yeah. Wow. Pearly's still here. I think Pearly has like a lot of great timing. As long as you're able to chain your cards, be able be able to use the the other effect once they're like, equipped and whatnot. Not equipped, but I think it's attached. Well, we'll see if the, all these effects are going to matter. I mean, we're just, it's all about that removal, right? You need to be able to remove monsters without destroying them. I think that's going to be one of the most crucial things that they have. But against a Cash Tier matchup, how much is that going to matter? It doesn't really necessarily matter. The Castira strategy is going to try and go wide, meaning it's going to try and put a lot of monsters on the field like Fenrir, Unicorn. And the thing with cards like Unicorn is you can pick off cards out of the pearly extra deck that are really important. So it's going to be really, really vital for a chance to play multiple copies of some of those critical pearly XC monsters. And with the popularity of Castira much lower than it was last year, there might be some cases where he's only playing one. Mm, that's true. Now there's like a lot when it comes to the side deck because pearly obviously not at the forefront of the big target. And therefore, you'd lose cards like, what is, which one's that one? The Xyz Encore. Xyz Encore, you're not going to see. a lot of those big cards that would normally target the big pearly monster. That Herald. Normally, yeah, Herald as well, Herald of the Abyss. Like, these are not going to be in there. So maybe that provides a bit of a safety net. Maybe making the pearly choice maybe is correct because there's less things, there's less targets on your back. Who knows? Yeah, pearly is definitely one of those strategies that the power of X Pearly Noir and kind of the way in which it plays and the type of cards that you need to counteract it, if those cards are just not in people's deck lists, it is a strategy that can kind of go under the radar but see a lot of success because X Pearly Noir is still as powerful as it was last year. And if people are not incorporating those main deck outs or side deck outs like you commented on a moment ago, like actually the Encore, it can take down a lot of games. And that's probably what's happened this weekend. Yes, and I kind of want to compare the Pearly matchup, I guess not with the Cash Tier matchup, but using that against, say, the Fire deck. They also have a non-destructive removal, which bottom decks the monsters. I think maybe that's also one of the key parts that keeps them in this tournament. And you can also use that on monsters in the graveyard as well, so you can start to eat away some of the resources in your opponent's graveyard. So in that Fire King matchup, 
we can see some of those interactions. But that's not what we're going to see here. We're going to see a Kashtir versus Pearly matchup here. Round nine, game one, Team YCS. All right, Chance versus Adam. So th these teams, they are six wins, two losses, and zero draws. In other words, if they lose this one, they likely will not make it to top cut. Everything's on the line here. They're, they're, solid, solid, <laughs> they're clearly on the bubble. Solidly on the bubble here. They need to win these last two rounds, unfortunately. A loss here would knock them out of the tournament. Yeah. It's seven. Adam rolls a seven. Chance rolls. I cannot see. Oh, That's a nine. Like a nine, yeah. Gotcha. So Pearly will be able to go first. Pearly is one of those decks that with the release of E Pearly Noir has the flexibility of going first and second really quite well. There was a period of time when Delicious Memory was limited to one, and E, per and e Pearly Noir had yet to be released, that going first wasn't quite as ideal. You needed a really really strong combination of cards, but with the release of E Pearly Noir, going first is no problem, and going second has always been one of the strengths of the Pearly matchup. Any deck that gets to incorporate Zeus has that advantage. And we're starting off with my friend Pearly. That's going to pay 500 life points to add a Pearly card into hand. I believe it reveals three and one random one gets added in. Yeah, so the, the semi-limitation specifically to Sleepy Memory makes it so that you can't guarantee a Sleepy Memory off of My Friend Pearly. But Delicious Memory is usually a pretty sufficient replacement there, so the, the typical reveal is Delicious and too Sleepy, unless he actually wants a Pearly monster card as opposed to one of the Quick Play spells. But if he is going to the Quick Play spells, it's probably going to be Sleepy, Sleepy, and Delicious Memory. Yeah, those are the ones that you most likely can activate without committing too much onto the field. And you just want to get that summon out. You just want to be able to push Pearly Monsters onto the field. Just be careful of when you choose the timing of when you want to activate the card. Now, the regular Pearlies, they are able to activate, you know, they're not once per turn, but the, uh, the, the Pearlily per is, yes. is once per turn. So he searched actually a happy memory, which makes it so that he probably doesn't have a monster in his hand, because obviously you need to have a target for some of these quick plays. So by searching it out like this, it, it might mean that he doesn't have a monster in hand. Okay. Sorry, it was actually Pretty Memory, but Sleepy and Pretty Memory are two of the quick plays that you can just activate from your hand even if there's nothing on the field. Mm -hmm. well, we need to get those monsters, and we get hit by a Jordan Lawbreaker. That is huge. This is not a card that you want to see uh, this early on in your combo. No, it's unfortunate for Chance that he didn't have any of the quick plays in his hand because he would be able to activate them in draw phase and kind of circumvent the Drone Lockbird. Mm -hmm. So that means the Pearly, the regular Pearly, will not be able to add an additional card on summon. So that really cuts the resources down. The lines are definitely cut short. He's probably going to have to go into Pearlily. That way he can use the graveyard pretty memory to go into beauty. Ah, uh, Chance reveals that he is going to discard a card to summon out the Pearlily. However, the card that he discarded was another copy of My Friend. That means he doesn't, yeah, like you said, he does not have enough uh, quick play spells here. No, he would have assuredly activated a quick play spell. Now that we know that he had two copies of My Friend Pearly, he would have assuredly activated a quick play that he could activate, right? Again, there are some limitations. Ones like Delicious, for example, you need monsters on the field. Oh, and that is going to hurt the infinite impermanence. Down onto the Pearlily. That's not going to be able to rank into anything. I presume he's now going to probably set his own copy of Infinite Impermanence. Oh, he's going to set two. That's it. Uh, Any cards left in hand at this point? Okay. All right, we'll draw. Stand by main. So we see two cards that aren't going to do anything necessarily, but there is a, a pot of prosperity in Adam's hand to go along with it. Look like a triple tactics talent in an Ash Blossom. So by playing the pot of prosperity, it already telegraphed to chance that Adam is not on the fire strategy because the fire strategy has a lot of drawing capability and enough searches that you do not need to cut your own lines short. And we revealed the Wraith Soth and the Cash Tier cards. The matchup is known to both players now. And he had really everything that he wanted there. He had Birth, and he also had Planet. So if he needed a monster, he had Planet. If he needed an Extender, so there was Birth. Activate planet. Yep. planet activation. Race South has been activated. We're going to be adding a Cash Tier monster into hand. And not to mention that it provides the monsters on field the 100 attack boost per attribute. Looking over Adam's deck list, it does look like he's playing the Deco Talker Heat Soul package. Now, he's used Pot of Prosperity this turn, so he would be unable to draw if he chose to go into that. That's usually something you do more going first. Special amount, Cash Tira Unicorn. 
Though going second, you are able to often go into Axis Code Talker. It doesn't look like he's incorporating that into his strategy this weekend. And with Pot of Prosperity, you're not going to be able to deal enough damage anyway. But that is mm -hmm. something to note that one of the advantages of the modern day Cash Tier strategy is the uh, accessibility of Link Monsters. Something that it seems a bit counterintuitive, but is actually one of their main strategies now. Yeah, adapting Link Spiders into the G Golem Crystal That's Heart. Cool. And we get an infinite permanence targeting the cash tier unicorn, negating the ability to add a spell card. I will normal summon Ash. Normal summon Ash Blossom. This only means one thing. Means Barone to floor. I mean, it's great timing. I mean, you're cutting off most of the access for chance. You can probably get rid of the My Friend Pearly. You can basically attack over the Perlily. And that really puts Chance in a backpedal. Targeting the My Friend. Yeah, yeah my this is friend. critical. If you leave the My Friend Pearly on the field, which without summoning that Ash Blossom he would have had to do, it guarantees the Chance gets access to another Pearly monster. So by doing it this way, he's able to remove that My Friend Pearly from the field. And the big issue here now is Chance is going to start his turn with only one card in hand. Mm -hmm. And it's it can be difficult because that locks you out of all of the quick play spells. You'd have to actually have to naturally draw one of the pearly monsters yep. to even potentially get into a quick play. Oh, oh here he is. An effect Veiler. Veil mm. I didn't believe any cards in him, but he did in fact have a card and it was Effect Veiler. We're going to negate the Effect Veiler with the Baron. I think we should be trying to remove as many cards as possible here on the Cash Tier side. No cards in hand left. And there is a triple tactics. He cannot draw. He can only take control. Yeah, he can only take control. There's only one option here. Hopefully they catch this. He cannot draw because he activated Pot of Prosperity this turn. One of the, there are actually quite a few things in the Castier strategy that don't really blend well with each other. Oh no. I did not go. Hold on. That should not be allowed. Pot of Prosperity. Oh no. Uh, activate birth. But going back to that, the Kestier strategy, unfortunately, the part of our is almost a, a necessity in the sense that you need to get access to some starter card. So people have historically oh. paid Prada Prosperity. Oh, yeah, right. There are numerous cards in the strategy, though, that draw between the Heat Soul and, of course, here, Triple Tactics Talent. Oh, so the, we are running into a judge call. Um, Chance has just pointed out that Adam activated Pot of Prosperity, he drew cards, hands were shuffled. Uh, I believe there's going to be uh, interaction with the judges at this point. Yeah, we'll let them solve that. It's an unfortunate reality here. You gotta be careful when you activate cards like Pot of Prosperity. Being able to draw cards, yeah, it's a, uh, you know, triple attack is really strong. Being able to draw cards, being able to take monsters, but you also have to be aware of all the other cards played and things are live in the current game state. If you're not aware, you could be, be sitting in these kinds of situations. I mean, these are pretty common situations too. It's especially the case with this strategy here where you're paying, playing Pot of Prosperity, but there are multiple ways in your deck to draw. Yeah, I mean, that's why the the fire strategy, they just opted not even to bother playing it because they just have enough draw power anyway. And you don't want to trip into these situations where you lock yourself out of certain options. I mean, looking back at like rescue ace strategies where they do play the Pot of Prosperity, they do have uh, the wanted uh, sinful spoil, a uh, secret of the sinful spoils, they just draw, but they understand that they do lock themselves out. And they have and to they be play careful. Heat Soul in that strategy too from time to time as yeah, well. So as a result, you do need to be wary that if your engine can naturally draw cards, but you also then need to consider the reality that Pot of Prosperity is such a vital card for your deck's consistency that there can be interactions like that. Yeah, we gotta be very careful on those uh, particular situations. So, which do you think is uh, the favorite matchup between Cash Tira and Pearly? Well, I always prefer Cash Tira just as a deck inherently. Mm -hmm. One of the advantages is actually Cash Tira Birth, being able to banish the Pearly Quick Plays from the graveyard. One of the advantages of the Pearly strategy in general is the follow up through my friend Pearly. Mm -hmm. when a Pearly Seed Monster is destroyed, but if you're able to time your Kestira birth well, you can end up banishing some of those quick plays face down. Because that's the underlying issue. As long as they don't go into e EX Pearly Noir, and you're playing kind of that more back and forth grindy type of style, the My Friend Pearly in the long run can end up out grinding you, but Kestira birth can do a really good job mitigating that effect. Yeah. All right. Well, that's a fair assessment. Now, I want to look at these players' side deck options. Like, we have quite a bit of variety coming from both of these, considering they're not the fire deck. So the fire deck, side deck, more or less is kind of solved, depending on how they want to play. But as you know, a deck outside of the fire deck, what do you think uh, they would choose to side against these decks? 
Aside from like dimension shifter, okay. <laughs> that, that one we can cut out. Yeah, so if I was on the Kestira side this particular weekend, it looks like Adam has elected to play a lot of cards that you would expect lined up against some of the fire strategies, but he also has a lot of sort of generic cards, cards like Lightning Storm and Harpy's Feather Duster, cards like even Soul Release. Soul Release might be an interesting one that you wouldn't typically imagine being good against. Yeah. Early, but you might see that potentially sided in. It could be useful just to remove some of those spell cards out of the graveyard. So in case that you do have to play into, say, the My Friend, and you have to remove one of their monsters, you can at least get rid of all the spell cards so they don't actually retrieve anything, and that minimizes like the the, the follow-up threat coming from My Friend. Yeah, like I commented on earlier, if we're going to talk about Kestir Birth being a pretty useful card, Soul Release does inherently the same thing. It is also something that you can just activate. You don't have to wait for anything on your opponent's side of the field. So there's value there potentially in Soul Release, which is an interesting card lined up here against Pearly, card that has really risen in popularity because of the fire strategies, but you could say that the Pearly deck has experienced some collateral damage because of that with the rise of Soul Release too. Mm, okay, very true. Now looking back at the field previously, now Adam was in a very solid position, even without the triple tactics. Yeah, the, it's really unfortunate because that is true. He there was just going to attack over the Perlily. He had already destroyed the My Friend Perly, And I think he was simply just going to pass the turn there. Now, he had already used his negation. So was he going to tag back out into the Unicorn? Yeah, I was just about to say, he was probably going to tag back out into something like that because his hand as currently constituted was just infinite impermanence and the triple attack, that, yeah. which, again, can't allow him to draw, and there's nothing in Chance's hand, so it's not like he had any really viable usage there. Taking the Pearl Lily doesn't mean anything. So he's just going to pass with those two cards, so then getting into Unicorn would be a much valuable, much more valuable use of his Baron after the negation has been used. Mm, very true. So why did, like, Kashtira pivot? Oh, it seems like we're back into the game now. We have reverted the... We have reverted the game state, perhaps. You know, one of the advantages of playing on stream is we did know what was in Adam's hand. Mm -hmm. And uh, judges are settling the call here. Yes, so the activation of Triple Tactics Towns was... Repaired. Repaired. And it was an easy repair. And uh, I think they are just having their final remarks with the judges before they continue their game. So we're actually back in the situation where we do have the Baron de Fleur here. We have an Ash Blossom. And so they've attempted to activate the... Oh, they're appealing the judge call now. Mm, okay. So back to us. <laughs> I was about to ask. I was, there, I was wondering if they're going to require him to actually activate the triple tactics talent. To I take do the not. Pearl Lily. Well, the activation of the card technically was legal, but however, when you activate triple tactics talent, you do declare. You have to declare the effect, and once you declare the effect, and the effect is not available, that is an illegal activation. I'm just putting my, you know, judge two cents in here. So you have to revert to a game state where both players will have to agree is legal and mid-activation is not exactly a point you can actually revert to. And you do not force the activation of certain cards if you have performed an illegal activation. So we're going to wonder where this is actually going to take. The, the, the next question is, if the game kind of proceeds from that point, is he going to shuffle that Baron back in? That is what we presume is the correct play to put the mm -hmm. Unicorn on the field. We'll see if that ends up actually happening, because in the aftermath of using the negation, the follow-up of Unicorn's effect is much more valuable than the destruction of Baron every turn, because at that point, you know, what are you going to destroy? What is Chance going to draw that you're just going to want to destroy that you wouldn't be able to otherwise use something with Unicorn with to access? That's you know, true. Unicorn gets you into birth, or Yosis, which then allows you to get access to whether it's Dark Armed or another destruction effect. So I think the shuffle back of Baron is definitely the right play. We'll be seeing yep. whether or not that ends up happening on the standby phase. A chance, chance is now top decking. There is one face down card that we don't know. It could be one of those quick play spells. Maybe he's going to be able to get the additional summon. Without the additional negate, how much of an impact would that have? If, say we manage to summon into a, well, I guess a per pearly, regular pearly. So, we can assume that it's not infinite impermanence set, that's for sure, because it would have just chained infinite mm -hmm. impermanence to the negation of Barone. Yep. So it actually probably could be another quick play. Could it be the third my friend Pearly? Okay. Uh, so we're going to be shifting over to table A to see the action there, what's going on. Oh, actually, we're back here. Yeah, we're going to take now. a look here take at look these at deck lists because we're going to jump into table A. It's going to be in the middle of their game. Table A, we're going to be able to take a look at, looks like a branded Despia strategy Ooh. against a Fire King Snake Eye strategy. So 
I know I didn't commentate any branded decks yesterday. Were you able to see any branded decks? I was able to see branded decks, but most of the branded decks now have shifted over into playing the dreaded gimmick puppet. Of course, we keep <sighs> see that here. It is very good. I mean, it's such a strong strategy to shut down all the special summon from any, I guess, any deck, except for Fluanderies, perhaps. Of course. But, like, shutting down the special summon, a lot of these decks, they need it. In other words, it's a turn skip. And these turn skips are just one of those dreadful feelings. Getting your turn skip, like, oh, it's my turn now, and you don't get to play. We also saw some of the fusion duplication, where basically branded fusion could be activated during your opponent's turn now. Yeah, that's a really awesome card, and it combines really well with Triple Tactics Thrust. We see that inclusion in Andres Torres' deck last week from the mm -hmm. UUDS. Yep. Combination, of course, Branded Fusion, Fusion Duplication, and Triple Tactics Thrust. I'm actually really glad like a, a card like Fusion Duplication exists. It, it just really feels like you don't get Verte Anaconda, but we'll give you the next best thing. And I love the artwork. Yep. Going all the way back, uh, throwback to Magical Scientist. Oh, that's a classic. I mean, that, that card's in the Forbidden Limited list for a reason. I mean, it just spills out your entire field full of fusion monsters. I'm old enough to remember the interactions with that in Catapult Turtle. <laughs> oh yeah, just launch every single monster. Launch it into the flotation <laughs> ring of the, uh, the Castle of Illusions. That is, uh, that is a, that's a throwback for a classic time. Okay, we're going into game two now. Of, I believe this is going to be table. It's table A, so we're gonna jump a. into Looks like in the middle of our Fire King, Snake Eye versus Despia Branded strategy. And does look like Ricardo won the first game. So he is up one game to nothing. Brian, we perceive here, is starting off our second game. And he looks like he's in the middle of a combo. Mid combo, five cards. Uh, this, is, this is definitely turn one. No uh, disruptions from the hand has dropped down. Nothing in the graveyard from Ricardo. So we hear... We see here is a pretty typical board for the Fire King Snake Eye strategy. We have IP Mascarena in the Spell and Trap Card zone, but we also have Flame Burge in the Monster zone, which allows IP to be special summoned during Ricardo's turn. We see that he brought back a Link Rebo to combine with his Sunlight Wolf. So we know that there's probably some Fire Monster in his hand, assuming that he activated the Sunlight Wolf's effect. He's now probably going to link these two away into either Heatzel or Promethean Princess. Kind of depends what he's yeah. already used this turn. It's very likely he wants the extra draw, but that is a different card. I did not expect uh, this one, a Nightmare Unicorn. So this is a play that is made to shuffle back the island into the deck so that you no longer have to fear it getting destroyed. Okay, so we're getting rid of the liability since island will only trigger if it's sent to the graveyard or gets banished. Yes, this is an interesting play. Sometimes if you have quite a few extenders, you can make this play to play around the potential of a Cosmic Cyclone. And you have to consider this is a sided game, so it's not inconceivable that Ricardo has access to some of those spell and trap card destruction effects. Yeah, no, it makes a lot of sense to actually get rid of it. And it also punishes like Ricardo for our siding in these cards, and maybe they become less yeah. useful. However, it's not going to be completely useless. Even Cosmic Cycling on the IP Mascarina will cut down the line of maybe running into a, an SP Little Knight or an Appaloosa following up. Yeah, I was just about to say, the Cosmic Cyclone is not a zero here. Cosmic no. Cyclone, which we do see in Ricardo's side deck, would actually be somewhat valuable. And so we're going to continue to link summon. I think this might be an Amblo Whale. I don't know what's in the graveyard, but considering that we do see the Fire King items. Oh, so we're going to like go to Appaloosa. This is a bit safer against the Super Poly. This is, of course, a branded deck. Oh, yes. Uh, so, yes, definitely get rid of the Fire Monster. You do not want to pair up your Fire Monsters. It is very, very dangerous. And if, say, Ricardo does have the Super Poly, on the first action of the draw phase, the Flamber Dragon will not be able to get that chance to push the IP Masquerade onto the field. Mm -hmm. So you have to get rid of your Fires. It's, it's just a, too big of a risk to take. And we see here using the Wanted, Seeker of Sinful Spoils, put back the original Sinful Spoils, at least what we assume is original Sinful Spoils, to draw a card. When it comes to playing against a deck that plays Super Poly, you just have to manage your attributes really, really well, or you're going to get punished. Draw turn? Anything on draw phase? No. On draw. Nothing on draw phase. Well, since Despia Branded Stand took it, him. maybe he experienced a Gibby Puppet lock. Yeah, we, don't, we do not know what the first game looked like. Yeah. Six cards in hand, yeah, one... Six in hand, good bit of follow-up and The, uh, I guess yeah. Brian has one face down. In terms of disruption at the moment, if we're able to push the IP Masquerina onto the field, it could be pretty good. But people have been opting to, um, I believe they've been opting to play a... What was it? Edignister. 
Earth Golem. Oh, the Earth Golem, yeah. As an additional as an Super additional. Poly option. That's really difficult for a branded strategy to incorporate. You're already playing the variety of different Despia slash branded based fusion monsters. It's really challenging to fit more into your strategy. So currently the table scores, table A, Ricardo is up one game against Brian. Table B, uh, Uhan is one game up against Nicholas, and uh, table C is still getting the appeal done. <laughs> Uh, but going back to adding Nister, it doesn't look like Ricardo found space for that in his extra deck. As a matter of fact, it only really looks like he has Mud, Drad Mud Dragon and it. Unless I'm seeing this incorrectly, I don't even see Garuna in his extra deck. That is a very interesting choice. I think we're focusing way more into the branded cards. <laughs> the branded related cards. He's of probably uh, going to use the Super Poly to chain to things like Effect Failure, Infinite Impermanence on something like his Alibra, the Jester of Despia, mm -hmm. and that's a way that he's utilizing Super Plumberization where he's relying on his opponent's monsters. Okay, so Fright for Patchwork has been activated. We're going to be adding the Edge Imp cards into hand and the Polymerization. That's going to be the Edge Imp chain. This is potentially one of the best ways of playing around Apollosa, where you're able to navigate your chain links with a Guardian Chimera. Mm -hmm. I think Polymerization is also very crucial for the Guardian Chimera now because a lot of the card effects from the fire decks, they do require targeting. Mm -hmm. And being able to shut down targeting with one of the largest monsters available on the field uh, really cuts things down. I mean, you won't be able to activate the Promethean Princess because you can't target your opponent's card if that's the only monster they're going to be special summoning out. And they can already, already put up so much threat against whatever that's on the field just by battling. Mm -hmm. I love the Fright for, Fright for Patchwork package. Utilizing Polymerization with Guardian Chimera and giving Guardian Chimera the additional protection, though, can sometimes be vital as well. And, like, you get to add more Polymerization into hand if you can uh, just, you know, use the Edgem stuff and get another patchwork. I will say, it feels so much better to just open Fright for Patchwork, though, than open the Polymerization. Or True. Sometimes the Edgem chain is an okay draw, but not always the case. Ooh, here we see Soul Release. We were just talking about the viability of Soul Release earlier. So what he's probably going to do here is he's going to get rid of Link Rebo. That's another graveyard point in some of the level one monsters. Yeah, I think so. This is such a painful point. Like, a lot of people have shifted over to playing Summon Limit over Anti-Spell Fragrance. Mm -hmm. And this is one of the cards that can make a comeback thanks to, you know, you're not getting your spells stunned out and you can just cut out your opponent's graveyard entirely. This hurts a lot. It's interesting. It seems like he's leaving... Again, we caught this game in the middle of what it was happening, but it looked like there may have been a Kirin, and there was definitely a Link Rebo in his graveyard. But there was no Garunix. I think he has Garunix in hand. I did hear Ricardo, when he was describing the situation, okay. state that Garunix was in Brian's hand. So if the Garunix is in hand, this is, a, this is an interesting game state to be put in. Like, a lot of the follow-up and a lot of the danger is coming from the Promethean Princess, but now Soul Release kind of cutting away Four level one monsters, one of the Promethean Princess, the Flamber's Dragon essentially will not recur any value once it's sent to the graveyard. You just don't have enough options there. I'm curious, I would need to see the full graveyard again, whether or not it, he could have left a level one in the graveyard. He did leave one, I believe. Is there one in there? Because obviously, Flame Bridge needs two targets. Well, it doesn't target, two it needs two options. options. Yeah, two yeah, options, the best way of putting it. It needs two options. But he would also be able to play around Flame Bridge by leaving just one single level one in the graveyard. Mm -hmm. And then therefore be able to maybe take out the Link Rebo or the Kirin. But he did take away a lot of high value monsters, particularly all the Poplars. The Ponyx is also gone. I think the Ash is also gone as well. Yeah, it looked like he lost both of his Poplars. Now, of course, if he still has access to Oak, he can still recur those back into That's rotation. Right. Well then, the key interactions left here would be from the IP Masquerina. I think IP Masquerina at this point is only going to focus on getting perhaps SP Little Knight. And I guess they're having a yeah, little Link. consulting moment with your teammates. Yeah, that's part of the whole Team YC experience. Yeah, it's one of the advantages. Sometimes you don't mind getting a second opinion about a situation, and as long as it doesn't deter from our ability to play through the 45 minutes that we have, yeah. it's really a great opportunity to do that. But, you know, you still have to do it in a timely manner where you're not just talking to your teammate the entire time and ignoring your opponent. No, absolutely. Uh, this still gives you some time to think about. That's why you have to, you know, time management is also part of, uh, you know, being in that hot seat. But looking at the current field, one face down, limited interaction. That's a two material Appaloosa at 1,600 attack points. So that has about two negations under it. I'll activate Foolish. And we went for a Foolish Burial. Looks like he has a copy of Called by the Grave in his hand, too. Oh, that's going to feel really, really good if, when you, once you start putting mods, like, uh, interactions in the grave and you're just like, oh, Called by the Grave. Problem solved. So this foolish, 
this Foolish Burial is probably going to put something into the graveyard that's just negated by Apoloso. Yep. Unless he's going to maybe put something like Fallen of Albaz into the graveyard to combine with a Branded in red. Yeah, that would be a that would be a great way to kind of clear off the board. So, what do you think that he's actually trying to attempt to do here? What if we need to bait out additional cards through the Apollosa? Like you need to play through it. Maybe you have to throw additional monsters out there. Now, most of these cards are once per once per turn. Okay. I mean, you can put a Serenir in there. Let let it be negated. That's true, but. What's the point of putting Serenair in there if it's just going to get negated? That's what I'm trying to think. Tragedy, Tragedy is basically an automatic negation. Yep. Serenair. You could probably, probably just let Serenair. That. Would you just let it I go? Mean, no, you probably negate Serenair. Probably so you probably negate Serenair. Maybe Lubelion would be one that's a valuable one just to put into the graveyard for the sake of having it into the graveyard. And then obviously cards like Artasia can eventually be useful. Yeah. Maybe even the Shrouded Dragon. Obviously yeah. the Shrouded Dragon. Yeah, if you have a Shadow Dragon, there's a cost to put it back into the bottom of the deck, and then you would put an actual card that you really want into mm -hmm. the graveyard. If that, if the Shadow Dragon probably would be the way to bypass if we're playing into, say, like a Fusion Duplication. I'm not sure if that's a card that you keep in post side. It's risky, because it, it is yeah. a trap card, after all. Very risky to put that card in your main deck in games two or three if you have to go second, which, of course, that was the assumption here after winning the first game for Ricardo. Like, how many summons worth of uh, effect monsters can you use to kind of bait through the Appaloosa and play through an SP Little Knight? I mean, it only has two negations, and this strategy has a lot of different monsters that could attack over it. You know, I could see a universe where he does send something like a Serenair or a Tragedy gets negated, and then he summons maybe Blazing Cartesia and it tries to attack over it, which would then potentially bait out the IP. Mm -hmm. Then maybe in main phase two, he can start to use his Polymerization and some of the other things that he has going on to yep. maybe fight his way back. Yeah, I agree. Maybe that's probably the better line. I mean, you have so many cards in hand. This is the opening turn. And he's got extra card. cards in hand with Polymerization and Edgem Chain. There's one thing I do like about... Is he going for the Albion? Uh, there's one thing I like about having a Polymerization, though. Like, the random fusion that just occurs out of nowhere, they really, it really makes you think about what they have in their hand and what they're trying to synergize with the graveyard because of what they have in their hand. It's also kind of as Albion's. Uh, special Cartesia, since yeah. Albaz is engraved. Oh, here's a great interaction that he's able to special summon this Blazing Cartesia because Alibur, well, Albion the Shrouded Dragon's in the graveyard, and this will allow him to save his normal summon potentially for an Alibur later on. But we have the Cartesian uh, special summon negated, and now it is going into the normal summon of the Blazing Cartesia. I'll chain Cartesia. Cartesia effect. That's the second negation. The Appaloosa is down to zero now. And we're going to use the IP Mascarena. We're going to Link Summon into SB Little Knight. And we're going to banish the Cartesia. Now, you don't want to leave Cartesia in the graveyard since she's one of those monsters that will just recur herself. I mean, you banish five of my cards, I'll banish one of yours, and a little bit of trading there. Yeah. So now the Blazing Cartesia has been banished. The normal summon has been used. Negations are all burned. I think there's still, of course, the SP interaction of if you activate a card effect, you know, you can do a little bit of a double exchange or banish two of the monsters. But Ricardo's going to set one, set, set two, pass. and pass back. Okay, that was unfortunate there for Ricardo. Brian's going to be able to recover from this, but he's going to have to do it without most of the resources in the graveyard. That soul release may have had long-term impact, and whether or not that top deck is going to count for it, we'll see it right here. I think there was probably going to be enough in there with the Flame Bird Dragon, though, to establish some type of follow-up. Obviously, all the level 1s are gone. Like Without the level 1s, you, you just don't have as many resources, but if this normal summon is one of those... Oh, this is a normal summon of a Ghost Bell. Yeah. Which level one is left in the way? Which fire monster are we looking for the Promethean Princess to bring back here? Yep. Promethean Princess activates. It's going to probably be that Kirin that we saw earlier. It is the Kirin. Specifically, the Fire King High Avatar Kirin. We've heard some horror stories of players this weekend registering the wrong Kirin. The wrong Kirin. The uh, Fire, Fire King, King Avatar Kieran. We we're trying like, to play the High Avatar Kieran. Yeah, that's something that you have to be very careful of. And the thing is, some people are playing that regular Kieran for the send effect. Yeah, it's not a. It's not like it's a bad effect. It's not a bad effect. It's just sometimes if you are intending on playing one, you need to be wary about that. Yep. 
Okay, so in terms of damage on the field right now, there's 27, 24, and 3,000. That's enough damage. That's 8,000 8, damage, isn't it? No, I'm Nicholas. Yeah, that's uh, 81. I think they're slowly coming to that realization. Yeah, that's the type of game right there. I th Brian takes game two with a clean finish. That Kieran wasn't enough. The soul release, not enough to clear out the board, yeah. unfortunately. No, there's almost as if you needed two soul releases to really clear all the potential follow up there. Yeah, that's pretty unfortunate. But now we'll be going here into game three. We'll be able to see our branded player, Ricardo, go first. If Gimmick Puppet Nightmare was in his side deck for game two, we certainly know where it's going to be here in game number three. Same is also going to be true with Fusion Duplication. Mm -hmm. It's such an easy setup. Even if a branded Fusion on your own turn fails, and say they, of course, use an Ash Blossom, you finish off, or rather follow up with a Triple Tactics Thrust, add the Fusion Duplication. Now it's like get ready for round two of branded Fusion, and you're going to be still locked out <laughs> during your turn. Yeah, the existence of Blazing Cartesia and Fusion Duplication allowing you to conduct Fusion Summons on your opponent's turn, in addition to cards like Branded and Red, that which had already been released, allow this deck, even if it encounters that Ash Blossom and Joy Spring, which has previously been sort of the nightmare scenario yeah. for Branded Fusion, doesn't really mean all that much because you can still go into the Gimmick Puppet Lock as a result of having cards like Granganol in your extra deck as well. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's really rough, and once you get access to the Sanctifier Dragon, the monsters being summoned out, now you're in just the worst position possible. Luckily, this is not like a Cash Tira matchup, because we did get to see uh, the branded matchup against Cash Tira, and uh, I was actually very pleasantly surprised that the branded deck can survive the shifter play. Yeah, so that's actually something that this deck has always had an ability to do with cards like Tri Brigade Mercarier that activate when it's banished and Despian Tragedy. So there's actually a couple different ways that you can still mitigate the effects of Shifter and end up with a pretty solid opening turn. Yeah, and uh, that's that's what we're seeing with all these players. They understand that, hey, some of these big disruptions from hand that maybe alter the game state to the point where it's unfavorable, you can still play under it and play around it. I mean, we've also been able to witness big decks like the Fire King, or rather not the Fire King, but the Snake Eye players able to use Primal uh, Infernal Flame Banshee as a way to kind of circumvent the effect of Dimensional Shifter, make into a dark, take their monster, still make an Appaloosa, and still keep playing. And that's what I love about playing Yu-Gi-Oh here at the YCS. There's so many skill players just demonstrating their knowledge of the game. I think a lot of times when you register decks that inherently are weak against Dimensional Shifter, it's important to have these game plans mapped out ahead of time. I can remember situations where people would use things like the, like cat, like yep. mannequin cat, to yep. special summon it and then just totally circumvent the shifter effect by utilizing mannequin cat. Yeah. Man, that's a classic. Oh my god, I remember back in the sprite days. Yeah, bring the sprite the, days. Back in the sprite days. Uh, it's not even that old. I mean, no. it's only a couple of years back, but hey, the sprites. Nah, it's too bad. We didn't see any of this with them this weekend. I did see one or two in the top tables, but it's truly only a handful. Maybe that deck has kind of rotated out of favorability right now, but it's always going to inherently be a pretty strong strategy, especially if the Runic cards exist. There will yep. eventually be another time when Sprite and Runic can come together, oh, yeah. meet at the top tables again, because those cards just work so well inherently with one another. They're the best of friends. <laughs> well, here we have, we have Brian and Ricardo finishing up their side, they're shuffling up, getting ready for their next game. We don't have the team score updated just yet, but once we get that, we'll give that information to you very soon. One thing I do want to point out is DD Crow is a card that's been popular this weekend. I've seen it in a few main decks, I've seen it in some side decks. So trying to think about, you know, if you're registering a deck like Branded, what are some of the collateral damage that could be out there where people are playing DD Crow because they perceive it to be a decent card against Snake Eye Fire Kings? Well, DD Crow has historically been pretty good against Branded Despair strategies, especially those that are playing Gimmit Puppet. One thing that they don't have to worry as much about are the best deals, at least in people's main decks. We do see occasionally a few here or there in the side deck, but there have been times where people have tried to play Branded Despia strategies in formats where people had four or five, six Despia, four, five, six different yeah. fist deals between their main and side deck, and that's a very uphill battle. Definitely very, very, very difficult, but here we are. We're moving into now game number three at table A. And I can't see a reason why Ricardo would not choose to go first. Good luck. <laughs> You're going first with Gimme Puppet Nightmare. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully not in his hand. In his deck. Yeah, in the deck, preferably, for sure. But we're going to normal summon out the, I guess, favorite monster of theirs. It's going to be Aluber. Ooh, so it looks like Brian has a Droll and Lockbird, and then a couple copies of Bonfire. It looks like Avatar. I don't know if that's enough to actually stop Branded. I don't Typically. think historically... Drone and Lockbird has not been very good against that deck. Most of the stuff, sure, maybe on the first add, but if you add Branded Fusion, nothing really matters at that point. No, maybe when a, when Branded decks originally came out where you would use 
branded fusion to some Despian tragedy could be a little bit inconvenient if you started with Alibur, because obviously then you don't get the, the tragedy search. And then maybe if you started with, with Freightwork Patchwork, but in both of those situations, the, Thrill might you know, be pretty guy. solid. Alibur, though? No. Not nearly. No, no, now we're close. And I don't fault Brian for having Droll in his deck necessarily after seeing the Fright for a Patchwork pa package. It's really one of the main reasons not to play the Patchwork package is the existence of Droll and Lockbird, because there's nothing worse than having to decide between Patchwork and something like Alibur. Yeah, and uh, there's the Droll and Lockbird coming down after the addition of the at a loss or a brand of fusion. So getting a little bit of an update, it looks like table A, obviously it's 1-1, table B is also 1-1, and over on table C, it looks like the red team is up. So it looks like our cash tier play did in fact win that game that we started our broadcast with. Okay. So Branded Fusion coming down with a Branded Loss. Now these chainlinks are going to be a bit more dicey because Brian will not likely have any form of interaction against that since the Branded Loss is on the field. As long as the first action chainlink one is a Fusion Summon, any sort of follow-up, any sort of response will be basically denied. And we saw Brian's hand. There's nothing he could do even if he wanted to anyway, mm -hmm. regardless of Branded Lost. The question here is, can Ricardo kind of navigate his way into Gimmick Puppet, but also getting a lot of follow-up and value along the way as well, which is one of the things that the Bistia Lubellion will allow him to do. And we're going to summon out into the Albion, Albion effect. And uh, we're going to see the Albion uh, trying to resolve. They're having a little bit of a team discussion. So it looks like they're just trying to quicken things up here. There was 13 minutes left on the clock, which is a reasonable amount of time, but they were talking about the resolution of the Alibar effect. Yeah, there may have been a slow play issue mm -hmm. just now. With that being said, though, it looks like Albion is going to banish the Alibar from the field and the Fallen of Albaz in order to summon Lubelion. Yep. Now the Lubelion is going to allow him to discard. Looks like Edge Chain. Oh, well, you're not going to be able to get anything from that Edge Chain thanks to the Drone Lockbird. However, we're going to put back a couple of cards here. And again, once again, the score updates. Uh, table A, one game apiece. Table B, one game apiece. And table C, Adam is up one game. So we see here he decides to go into Mirror Jade. And now he's going to send the Albion to the graveyard in order to put the Bistia Lubelion onto the field. Unfortunately, with Branded and Lost, he's probably not going to have another target in his deck. Typically, decks are not electing to play Branded Beast. But it's still a nice monster to have on the field. And luckily, even though you're under Drone Lockbird, Albion in the end phase can still set the card directly onto the field. He also didn't use his Branded Lost effect with the Albion. Like to search. I can't. Oh, yeah, it's a true, true. We're under draw. We're under draw, yeah. Is he going to get that set? He's, we got Norris, I'm going to Arvada. I mean, right now, the only disruption that's truly live <laughs> is the Mirror Jade. Yeah. But the Mirror Jade now is being oppressed by <laughs> the Arvada. And now the Bonfire that gets to be activated. No, quite freely to get to the Poplar. Poplar effect summon onto the field. Poplar is going to attempt to add a card. I believe we were just searching the card right now, and that's going to be original. Original has been played time and time again. Such a strong card. And we are link summoning using the Poplar. Not good. Into Probably. Link yep. Karibo. Link Karibo. Yeah. Think on Rose. And the Poplar Effect now putting itself into the spawn trap zone. So now we'll probably see original coming down relatively yeah. soon. Okay. Ricardo's got to really be careful of when he chooses to use that mirror jade. Is there a very crucial time he can use it, or is the Arvada just there, just blocking everything? We have one face down card. That face down card can be the only saving grace under this situation. As long as that Arvada is going to live on the field, mirror jade is not going to be a threat. No, I mean he'll just be able to pay the cost, which will allow him to get some follow up, but. Follow up only matters if there's another turn. That's true. And also, the Arvada provides a destruction on one of the fire monsters. It could just set off a Garunix. It could just set off the wrong card. We're going Fire King Island. No disruptions here. Ricardo, hand over his mouth. Just has to think about it every step of the way. When is it the right time to use my cards? No 
Okay. We're going to so link. Away. Maybe Dark Charmer? Nope. Oh, Phoenix. Nightmare Phoenix. Okay. Maybe the back is too much of a threat. Scouting a Snake Eye Ash to hit the face down. Targeting the face down to destroy with Nightmare Phoenix. This will reveal everything for Brian. Yeah, this. Is it a branded in red? No, Brandon it's retribution. a retribution. Okay. Ricardo letting that go. It has been destroyed. Luckily, retribution does have an effect in the graveyard as well. You can just banish it. Yep. Again, it only matters if he has another turn. He's kind of shields down at this point. Yeah. <laughs> His mirror jade is kind of checkmated by the avatar. Yeah. A little bit stuck there for sure. And considering that Ricardo did not activate anything from his hand to disrupt any of these plays, I don't know if that Mirror Jade is going to hold on long enough. I mean, it's a very easy to clear that Mirror Jade. You just have to use a Flamber Dragon, push it to the back, and now you have nothing to worry about. Once it hits the graveyard, you don't have to worry about the, uh, the Regeki effect of that card because it's no longer a Fusion Summon monster. It's unfortunate that he wasn't able to leave some type of Fallen of Albaz card in his graveyard. Because then he could have searched Branded in red, and then at least through a Branded in red, he would have been able to trigger the Branded loss to search for Courier to have some point of interaction in mm -hmm. addition to what's already on the field. That's true. But because he wasn't able to leave a Fallen of Albaz in the graveyard during the previous turn, he really was left with Retribution, which is typically not that great of an interaction. And then Mirror Jade. Okay, we're going to see the Mirror Jade effect. We're going to banish. It does resolve. And now we get the Arvada. Oh, sorry, not Arvada. We got the, the Garunix live, and the Arvada is still live. Maybe there is an Ibiru, and then we can hold that back to just in case. But uh, in any case, we have a lot of fire monsters on the field. Garunix, we are going to destroy. Okay, we're going to destroy the Mirror Jade and allow the effect to go through. Maybe he's already mapped out enough damage to where that's just simply not going to matter. Yeah, I mean, that's the only reason why you would take that risk. Now, there is a Snake Eye Ash in the graveyard. You could typically just revive that with uh, the Promethean Princess. That will give you access to your Flamberge. Everything, I think, is available to, uh, typically here because you can also send away the Sanctuary for the cost for the Ash. I think we've... I think we have all of this more or less mapped out right here. These monsters, Link Summon. Is this going to be the Dark Charmer? Yeah. It is the Dark Charmer. We're going to go for three. We're going to take the Mirror Jade. That's 3,000 damage. This is mainly for the damage now. Promethean Princess. We don't even need to go, go that deep. No, at this point, he's got a lot of different ways of accomplishing the same thing. Promethean Princess. Princess effect. Uh, yeah. And because he didn't... Uh, he set the retribution, yeah. We're going to normal. We're gonna special summon out the Ash. Ash effect. Because he did use his normal summon for the Arvada. So basically cycling around uh, the graveyard to put the Ash onto the field through the effect of Promethean Princess. Likely that the Ash is going to activate. And yeah, there we go. Paying the cost with the Sanctuary. That's why Sanctuary is such, a, such an amazing card to go into Fire King Island. Rather than playing two Fire King Island, you go for the Sanctuary, of course, being able to pay cost. And now he's got a lot of different options. You can put the Lubelion into this Melon Trap card zone. That will clear off enough to deal 8,000 damage. Yeah, this, this right here is 8,000 damage. Don't need to commit any further. Brian takes it with the 8,000 damage on the one turn. Follow up. What a great play. So it looks like Fire King Snake Eye does take down Despia Branded. Unfortunately, maybe that Drill and Lockroyd was sufficient on that opening turn to cut off Ricardo from some of his more explosive plays. We mm -hmm. certainly didn't see Gimmick Puppet there at all. He still landed the Branded fusion, but didn't just have that set up for the Puppet. Yeah, I'm curious about that. Was, was there, like, an alternative way that we could still force the Gimmick Puppet land? Because if the Puppet landed, I'm pretty sure this game would have been completely, like, 180. So, we don't know what that single card in hand was. We know he had to discard the Edgem Chain and didn't get the effect. Maybe if he was able to get that Edgem Chain effect, he would have been able to find a way. And uh, we just got notes from the judge call, the judge ruling at table C where the triple tactics talent was illegally activated. The game state was repaired by returning tactics back to the hand and not forcing the player to activate it. And using a different effect, it would have been legal. Um, so the gameplay continued from that point with the tactics back in hand. So they were not forced to continue to activate that card. Which is exactly what you said, which would have been really unfortunate because then yeah. you would have taken a per lily. For no reason. And then giving it back. And then yeah. allowed him to go into an Exceed monster. <laughs> but uh, then again, 
the uh, the pearly player was still like so far behind that he was relying on getting an like an, like amazing top deck, like the the top deck of top decks, to get out of that situation. But clearly that was not the case. But even though our feature match here is complete. The round is not over here at the feature tables because this is a team event after all. You're gonna have to rely on your teammates to also pull their weight. And uh, last we check, uh, the game is not over. Are, are they about to sign the slip here? I think they're doing maybe a time extension. It looks like table B and C are very much in thought. So I yeah. can't imagine they have come to an end here. You can see over on table C, it looks like Chance with the pearly strategy is in the midst of a play. And then at table B, it looks like both fields are actually quite filled. So we have a rescue ace matchup in the middle table. Yes, we have Fire King, Snake Eyes versus Rescue Ace, which is a strategy we've yet to see, but another one of those fire strategies. I it's I think Rescue, I would like to see some Rescue Ace because Rescue Ace can also mix with the Sinful Spoil package. I mean, that was the previous format where Rescue Ace was the most dominant deck. Did they fall so far behind that they're just so like a lot less popular or did a lot of the Rescue player, Rescue Ace players just choose chose to just jump ship? So if you play Rescue Ace, you get to still play Poplar, you know, the newly released Poplar because you can search it, special summon it, Going to Link Rebo, going to the original Sinful Spoils, and then get into Hydrant that way. So it does help give you access to Hydrant. It's at that point, though, where the question is, what do you think better supports this wanted Sinful Spoil strategy? And I think most players are just elected to say, Ash. Yeah. Oak. Yeah. All of these cards are just too inherently powerful. And as a result, I think when players look at the potential of Rescue Ace versus the potential of the Snake Eye package, most players have elected to go with the Snake Eye package. But with that being said, we're going to jump into one of these two games. It looks like it is in game three. We're either going to go to table B or C, and it looks like we are going specifically here into table B. So, welcome back to this table. I think we are looking at the Rescue Ace table here. So it looks like we're in the midst of a game that's been going on for quite some time. Usually that's indicative of a banished anti-spell fragrance, I presume probably because of a cosmic cyclone. Okay. So let's try and recap here. We're in game three. It looks like here Yuhan has Garunix on field with both Sanctuary and Island. His graveyard has Link Rebo of note. He also has Ponix in there of note and Ash. So we've got an abundance of level one monsters, which is important whenever we're talking about strategies with the Snake Eyes. A set Spaller Trap, and it looks like Nicholas has just activated, it looks like Contain. Yeah, that could be Contain. I think these trap cards do have heavy impact, uh, especially when it comes to the matchup. Being able to turn off a monster entirely uh, from being used as material, that's pretty big. And if you land an Extinguish, say on a Flamber's Dragon while you have a Hydrant up, that's going to be huge since they can't use that effect for the rest of the turn. It seems like we have a, a special summon of the Garunix. I think the Garunix gets destroyed by the Promethean Princess. No. Yeah, so we see one of the interactions right now where Contain not only stops the effect, but also makes it such that the graveyard effect is shut off as well. Potentially one of the reasons why you might consider playing the Rescue Ace strategy this month. I love that Rescue Ace. I think, it, you know, Turbulence, we've had the saying of if, if the Turbulence sets eight cards during the game, it's over. I also... And being able to cycle your trap cards through the use of Emergency is also very, very crucial. So it looks maybe, like it maybe. was Yuhan's turn as we checking in here because he just activated a bonfire that was set, mm -hmm. as a matter of fact. But without the Hydrant here, th those uh, trap cards are definitely not going to be as powerful. I mean, essentially, you still have a card that's going to function much like uh, Infinite Impermanence. And maybe you also have Infinite Impermanence also in the back. But instead, you have an Effect Veiler, which does the same thing. We're just going to negate the uh, Snake Eye Oak. And that is true. There is no Hydrant on the field. Yeah, that's so like, our rescue ace cards are watered down yep. a little bit. So I, yep. I have a I, oh, I have a question. He shook so his I, hand. The draw work because they, they uh, uh, my team lost so and we drew. So, so oh, I, I, this situation is a little. It's a draw. Oh, it's a draw. Yes, look at that. The time is up, and these players are both actually at eight thousand. Ah, of no, course, time. I, okay, so I almost forgot I about that. Stupid there. I knew I, the second I did, I knew I was dumb. Well, I guess that ends this one. This is the first draw that we had on stream. Yeah, and they're discussing you know, what may have been able to happen there towards the end to have made it ah. to some light point changes occurred. Well, that's a tough situation to be in. I mean, it's high pressure. You got thousands of people watching you play Yu-Gi-Oh! Very difficult situation. Well, we were able to see a little bit of variety here. We saw 
Hurley for the first time, even, even if it was just briefly. We also saw a little bit there of Rescue Ace, even ago, just briefly. Yeah, just briefly. I think you don't write off the Rescue Ace strategy just yet. I think if you're able to have perfect trap control, it's a wonderful deck to play. It's still very strong. Turbulence set four still is turbulence set four. Okay, so the best our team can do is draw at this point. And we can actually okay. point out some fun interaction. Because monsters are being pushed to the spell and trap zone, like if we push a hydrant into the back, as long as you still have a rescue ace monster, you can still get those secondary effects, even yeah. though hydrant's like not, uh, that's a, it's not a monster. Yeah, <laughs> that's wild. And that also goes for like Mirror Jade. If a Mirror Jade gets pushed to the spell and trap zone, they are not able to summon any more Mirror Jades. You can only control oh, wow. one Mirror Jade. And it is face up. <laughs> it's another way to lock people out. So it looks like our table C, because of the ruling question there in game one, may actually still be in progress. So we don't know if this entire round is a draw. There's the possibility that one of these teams can end up winning. So the blue side already actually won at table one, drew at table two, or table B. So presumably here at table C, if the blue team is able to take that down, they would actually win the match. Mm -hmm. The best the red team can do is, is draw. Okay. So if Adam's Kashtira strategy can win here in game three, the match will end in a draw. If Chance ends up winning, then the blue side is actually going to take the match down with a victory. Yeah. We well, they are cutting, they are cutting, well. yeah, we can probably move to that table and maybe take a look, because they are shuffling up. I believe they're going to attempt to continue play. And that was one of the main reasons we were curious about this match as well, was to actually see Pearly in action. But that's what we're about to go do. We're going to go take a look here at Game 3, Table C, Round 9, Pearly versus Kashtira. Oh, I guess everything's on the line now, actually. And we got to see table to table to table for the first time. Insights into all three tables. Yeah, we get to see a variety of different decks as well. Between these six different strategies, we saw Rescue Ace, we saw Pearly, we saw Kashtira, we saw Brandon Brandy. Despria, and of course Snake Eyes. And here we go. The players are going to have to play a little bit more quickly now. They are on the clock, after all. This is from their time extension. Yeah, they have about a 12-minute time extension. This is amongst the most ideal opening plays here for Adam. Uh, Special summon out Unicorn. Unicorn effect. Uh, attempt to add. Or is it going to be met with an infinite impermanence? Yes, it, it is. is. So it looks like Adam has a copy of Pressured Planet in his hand, a copy of Ash Blossom. Is there a birth or a theosis to kind of follow up with this, or are we going to see another Baron play? Yeah. But one negate is never going to be enough for dealing with Pearly. Not on the opening turn. No, turns. I would actually prefer to go into the... Changri Era? No, I would prefer to go into the Heat Soul line. Heat Soul, Heat Soul line now? Because what you can do is if you search Rise Heart, you can actually normal summon Rise Heart, and it doesn't lock you into Exceed Monsters if That's you right. normal summon it. Then you do the effect to banish, turn it into a level 7, and then from there you can go into the Draco Sack line. Because having Ash Blossom in hand is an important interaction. Yep. The Ash Blossom in hand is basically the equivalent of a Barone Negation, yep. for all intents and purposes. Obviously a little bit more narrow, but by and large it's still one interaction. Yep. And then potentially with two draws off Heat Soul, you'll be able to draw into an additional point of interaction. So you might end up netting more interactions by doing that. Okay. Do you think Nibiru is an, a viable option against Kashtir in this point in time? Yes, because if the players are electing to go into that Heat Soul line, you're summoning way more than five. And then the alternative there is to instead end on something like Unicorn, Fenrir, Ogre, which isn't a bad thing. But it's still worth noting that that play is not quite as potent as the Heat Soul line. Mm -hmm. So most, most players are going to go for the two draws off Heat Soul because you're playing a strategy that has a lot of hand interactions in the first place. And you're not registering Kashtira to play around Nibiru. Yeah, it's right. just really not what you're here for because mm -hmm. even though that Ogre play, when you search the preparations, isn't that bad, it doesn't line up quite as well as maybe potentially that full That's combo Kashtira line that you would see. That's true. And normal summon Rise Heart, like you said. Using the effect to modulate its level and causing the top three cards of Chance's deck to be banished face down. For his sake, hopefully there's no copies of, or the single copy of Delicious Memory. Hey, That's one of his best ways of fighting through this. He was about to go for Birth, but uh, he changed his mind. So one of the reasons you would go for Birth is to make it so that following Rise Arts can banish Theosis and add that back to your hand. Here by banishing Fenrir, we could maybe assume that he has Birth in hand already, or he thinks simply believes that banishing Theosis and adding Fenrir to his hand would also be pretty valuable as well. So here we have the Mecha Phantom Beast Draco Sack activating to generate two tokens onto the field. Two normal tokens, specifically. That shouldn't be dice, but that's okay. 
they're not going to be there very long. No, they're going to be linked off fairly shortly. I believe they are about to get actual tokens. So earlier, when you activated your birth, your right to vanish, you had the birth out and it was already just... Oh, it seems like uh, the birth was placed down onto the table and maybe the Fenrir might not be an option now. Yeah, you got to be very careful when it comes to that, you know, touching your cards, playing them. When you don't make uh, an audible change or like you don't make uh, an auto call, audible call on your card, the one that you place down first is the option that you mm -hmm. go for. And uh, if you say you made the call, but you put down the wrong card, the one that you vocally made on the call is the one that you get to put down. Mm -hmm. So it looks like he has a copy of terraforming in his hand. I'm good. I actually think I would prefer to banish birth anyway, because terraforming can allow you to search Fenrir next turn if necessary through another copy of the Pressured Planet. Mm -hmm. And having Birth banish just means the just means Rysart is a much more useful draw, or search even, because then you can banish a copy of Theosis from your deck. So I don't even necessarily think this is worse for Adam. Because no. it doesn't look like he actually has Birth in his hand. Okay. But now we're going to see one of these tokens go into a copy of Link Spider. And then we get another Link Spider for the next one. If Chance has a copy of Nibiru, he should just continue going as he is here. Let them put more cards onto the field so there's less options later on. There is no th I, There's a card being revealed. It looks like a light monster. It looks like a giant rock. It is the giant rock. I mean, people have just been slinging rocks at each other all weekend. I would have waited for him to go into the crystal heart there. Yep. I guess I will say. Okay. You do occasionally see Kashtira players running Apollosa. Ah. So you always need to be wary of that. But by getting the G-Goal and Crystal Heart out of the extra deck, too, it'd make it so the Pot of Prosperity is less valuable going forward. Mm -hmm. Oh, it seems like uh, the penalty has been issued to the blue side B-table for language. Be careful of how you speak. Remember, you have to maintain good sportsmanship after all. We're all here to have fun, and uh, everyone's here to you know, maintain you know, good sportsmanship with each other. So this is unfortunate for Adam, as we commented on earlier. You're not playing cash tier right now and playing around Nibiru necessarily, unless you have a really ideal opening. You know, if you have a lot of hand interactions, I can understand not wanting to play into Nibiru. Mm -hmm. There actually is a way in this strategy to play around Nibiru a little bit, but as this deck has become more popular, it's becoming less likely that a player is actually going to let you go into the Heatzel, because sometimes when you are allowed to go into another Link monster, instead of going into IP, because ideally you pass with IP Heatzel to go into SP on your opponent's turn, but sometimes you actually go into SP on your turn, so if they do choose into beer, you can use SP to banish the decode. Yep. Heatzel and the SP itself so that you have follow up on the next turn. But that, you're not usually getting that far. If somebody has new beer, they're going to do exactly what you just thought there. So Chance is fully aware of what the Kestira deck is trying to do today. Mm -hmm. Maybe Kestira a few weeks ago when it was a little bit more under the radar and players weren't fully aware of what was going to happen would allow you to go that far, but certainly not anymore. And I believe the happiness was just negated through Ash Blossom. And now my friend Pearly has been activated. We're going to be paying 500 life points to reveal three cards, and one of them will be randomly added to hand. And this is a great follow-up. That token is actually not that large in defense mode. No, it had the two Link Spiders, which obviously provides zero. zero. Draco's Zag is not 3,000. No. So it's like he's going for a copy of Happy. This is really scary for Adam. I don't think he has any more interactions in his hand, and Pearly has so many different ways of dealing 8,000 damage. So that's, I think, two copies of Pretty. Yeah, they all look very similar. I think Happy is currently in the graveyard. Oh, yeah, Happy is in the graveyard. So there's there. two pretty, yeah. pretty memories. Yeah, it's the Pretty. You know, you actually want to kind of search Pretty memories through your combo. Mm -hmm. So leaving them in the deck is totally fine, because you already have one in the graveyard that can combine with a Pearl Lily. And the random card is going to be the middle card. And the other are going to be put back to the deck. Okay. So there's going to be follow-up. We're going to see some pearly monsters being summoned onto the field. Likely going to see the pretty memory, pretty memory. Discarding the drawn lockbird, that's going to generate a summon of a monster. Remember, you don't actually discard for cost or anything like that. You discard after it has successfully resolved and you chose to uh, summon the monster from the deck. That's going to be Perlily. Yeah, it's very important to understand how the Perlily quick plays work. There are actually situations when they have Noir on the field, the little Noir, mm -hmm. where you can use your own interactions and chain it to one of the quick plays and make it so that Noir cannot use its own effect to set a trap from the deck. So it's really important to understand how the quick plays in this particular deck function. Yes. Now, one thing to be aware of is actually that Cash Tier field spell. It is boosting that token as well. Oh, yes, that is it true. It could push it over. 
<laughs> the 3,000 mark can be generate attributes onto the field. What's he at? 9,000? I'm at 85. Looks like he's doing some of the math. Well, it's got at least two spells and two monsters in hand. If two spells can get, you know, pay the cost yeah. or you know, use the summon effect and, you know, yeah. discard some cards, we could generate enough for sure. Yeah, Getting hit by the Nibiru definitely just hurts so much. Oh. And Again, this entire strategy is predicated on the idea that if you're going to play the Heat Soul package, you just hope and pray Nibir is nowhere in sight. Yeah, that's unfortunate. Considering that Nibir has been in basically everybody's main deck. So here we see Happiness, which is arguably one of my favorite cards uh, in the Pearly strategy. It just gives it immense flexibility going second. No, Token's a light, right? Yes. Yeah, it's not enough. Oh, token okay. is light. Was, was it 20... No. What's the defense of the token? Perhaps not high enough. No, it would have been... Well, it's I think Drake of Sack off the top of my head is 2100 defense. 2100? That's not going to be That's off the top of my head. That is a shot in the dark. If it gets boosted by 200... Uh, no, this is, these are all light monsters. There is... Currently, yeah. Then, uh, yeah, I don't think that would be enough. 2200. I was off by 100. Yeah, not enough, not enough. See, I was a spellbook player back in the day, not a dragon ruler player. Goes mm. to show. <laughs> okay, we're activating Pot of Prosperity now. We've dealt maximum damage, and now we've activated Pot of Prosperity. This is great. The Prosperity in Main Phase 2 is always fantastic because, you know, in Main Phase 1, sometimes you're digging for engine pieces, sometimes you're digging for a card like Dark Ruler no more. When you get to do it in Main Phase 2, after all the dust is settled, you know exactly what you want. Presumably some type of counterplay. Drone Lockbird's not bad. Wow. Honestly. These are all great. <laughs> I would probably take the Cosmic Cyclone here. Okay. Because it cuts off a top deck pressured planet or one in hand, and it also stops birth. That's the one. That's the one that you definitely want to stop. But it stops yeah. both of them. Yep. Which is fantastic. Okay. Though life Chance knows what he's doing. I think he pointed to that Cosmic Cyclone just now. And he's ahead in life points by enough that even if he pays 1,000 life points with a Cosmic Cyclone, he will be ahead by 500. As we're cutting down pretty close to time here. draw four. Ooh, okay. All I had was, I'll draw four. Must mean that that <laughs> sleepy memory can combine with a quick play or a pearly. He needs to activate. Oh, there's the street that he's attempting. Stray pearly street has been activated. That is a really good card in the format. Mm, so and here's activating the, the spell and then chaining the monster to attach it. So he must have le Pearly Yeep set. Yeah. Oh, we're That's when he means draw four. Yeah. Kind of telegraphed to play a little bit, but here we are. With two minutes left in the round. You got to be very careful. Yeah, it's going to be really tough here because he's going to have a five material noir. The Pearl Lily, the Happy, the two Sleepies, uh, and then Happiness up? itself. Mm-hmm. Uh, standby. Standby phase, draw. And each individual copy is going to provide another draw. And if we maintain in the standby phase, and that's a trap card, Pearly Yeep. Yeah, it is Pearly Yeep. And targeting the, uh, the happiness, that's going to be an X Pearly Noir. That refreshes the effect of the spell cards that are attached. That's going to be another draw. And uh, we basically play two copies of Pot of Greed. And in a format where Book of Moon is sort of rotated out of favorability, oh, that's a pretty safe sense. play. There were times where that interaction there could be a little bit risky. But yep. right now, it's a safe thing to do. Absolutely. And uh, we are seeing, <laughs> OK, uh, a Raid Soth activated. Do we let it go? Because maintaining the immunity is very, very key here because that's the, that's the biggest threat. I think you're fine. I don't really. Like, you can't run this guy over. No. You can't target it. You can't interact with it. You're running low on time. Running low on time. <laughs> it's just a really bad position for Adam at the moment. Is he choosing to get rid of that Raid Soth? Ex Pearly Noir, a Towers esque monster. <laughs> this weekend, this late into the round, in round nine. And we are bottom decking the Raid Soth. Is now that enough? We have a legal activation of talents. Yeah. Yeah. talents to take? Ta oh, talents to take? It does not target, so are we going to minimize the damage here? Yeah, he's going to have to detach two. Well, luckily, there's no delicious memory. We can minimize the damage that is going to come through because I believe X Party Noir has pretty low attack without you know the attachment of Delicious. Yeah, he didn't have a Delicious at all, so he's in good shape. And the problem here is 
he just has Fenrir in here, and so the game is over. So we're going to go for the take, but you, you now that he's taking the monster, there's a monster on the field, and we got a Typhon. That is a great play. This opens up a chance for a counter play here, and is Adam going to be able to go into the battle phase now? That's the question. Ooh. Yeah. Oh, just the one. Yeah. Yeah, I was about to say, did he actually go five times last turn? Was there two? Was there two extra deck summons? Is Typhon legal? No. No. Yeah, I was like, Pearly going in there five times is a bit. Yeah, no, that would be so. <laughs> that'd be quite the pearly hand if that was a, a viable play. If there. only there was, because it, literally there was only one extra deck summon on this turn and one extra deck summon the turn prior to that. Yeah, yeah that's unfortunate. There is no typhoon. Nice try. So it's a very interesting no round. Very interesting round. We got, got to, to see, see a little bit of everything. <laughs> yeah, a lot of variety there. Well, I guess team. Uh, the blue team. The right? blue yeah, team. Yeah, the blue team is the able to take team. it down. And again, they, their only outcome here was to win. Yes. If they ended up having a draw there or a loss, then they would end with a draw naturally. So yeah, they were able to come out as victors, which means going here into round 10 coming up in just a little bit, they are still viable and alive for the tournament. Mm -hmm. One we're more chance. Gonna, yeah, one, one more chance. chance, one more round. But we are going to go to a short break. And when we come back from break, we are going to see the final round here. It's just round 10 at the YCS in Las Vegas 3v3 team tournament.
this format. I think most of the time the card I'm hoping to top deck is Triple Tactics Talon. It's uh, pretty strong. <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I think right now the card that I want to see the most is definitely Infinite Impermanence. Uh, it's the card that's going to answer most of the things that I'm going to see this weekend, and if I'm having to play into a board, it's going to help me do that the most, I think. Hey guys, this is Yuya, and Yuto, and Yuri, and Yugo. On behalf of all of us, I would love to wish a very happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game. Uh, so I have many great memories of Yu-Gi-Oh! throughout the years on the almost decade that I've been working on the show. And one thing that sticks out to me, one thing that I will never forget, are the episodes in Arc 5 where Yuya is dueling his counterparts, uh, Yuto, Yuri, Yugo, even Zark in the later seasons. Um, that was, as a voice actor, something I never thought I'd get to do. Uh, dueling myself, my many, the many versions of my characters, and uh, spending hours in the booth yelling at myself, essentially. Uh, but it was so much fun. It was really cool to watch and be a part of seeing that episode come together and, you know, uh, somewhat of a bucket list item for me. So one of the most iconic and most requested lines I have for any of my Yu-Gi-Oh! characters from the fans would have to be... Swing far, Pendulum! Carve the Ark of Victory! Yu-Gi-Oh! has done so much for my life and my career. Um... I would venture to say that some of my breakout roles were on Yu-Gi-Oh, uh, mainly Yuya. This was the first main protagonist role I've had on a series before, and to embody that character and to watch him grow and come to life and watch his arc, arc five, uh, it was really just an incredibly amazing experience, one that I'll never forget. And in addition to that, uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! has brought me so many friends and, and people who I consider close as family. Um, so it really is a gift that keeps on giving. So if I could be in any other Yu-Gi-Oh! series, uh, I would have to choose the original. It's just such an iconic show. And what spawned from that original cast the original series is we're still seeing it today so um that would just be an absolutely amazing experience i am so grateful now to be a part of the Yu-Gi-Oh family and thank you thank you to all of the fans who have watched and enjoyed and reached out and met through the years it's been truly an absolutely life-changing and incredible experience thank you
Welcome back to beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Again, we have had so many great rounds here, but the tournament isn't even out of its Swiss yet. We're gonna have one more round yet, and it is just so cool to be here again at the Team YCS because these competitors have just shown so much great Yu-Gi-Oh, right, Joe? We have just seen some incredible plays across the board. Yeah, now we're here at the final round of Swiss. You know, if you've made it this far into the tournament, sometimes you get asked the question, do you think these players would be nervous heading into the final round? Honestly, from my perspective, if you've made it this far into the tournament, your deck has been functioning well, your play has been on point. And for me, I think you should be going into this round with confidence. And the players that can go into this round with confidence can pilot their decks to their maximum capacity and probably will find their way into the top 16 with a victory here in round 10. No, I absolutely agree. It's kind of like in baseball, you know, you think about the being at the major World Series and all the bright lights and stuff. What are you supposed to do there where you're supposed to play baseball and just like that at the Team YCS, you're just supposed to play the card game you already know and love. So you can't let your nerves get to you. You can't let the bright lights affect you in any way. You just gotta play the cards like you have in practice. And right now we are going into round 10 of this tournament. But again, yeah, it's just crazy that these duelists have had such longevity too, because speaking of sports, this is kind of a marathon when you think about it. It's a two day event, it's just not one Yu-Gi-Oh tournament, it's a tournament that goes over two days. So hopefully these players have rested, hopefully that's gonna keep them alive as we go through the games, because that's where you start to see maybe those nerves compound where they don't have to, because they're thinking about something other than the game that they love. There's a lot of mental stamina that's involved in a tournament that is this long, and especially considering it's a 3v3, think about how much you have to focus on your game, but also keep an eye on what's happening for tables B and C. And as a result, not only have you focused on your game, your mind is on so many other games at the same time. You're jumbling what you're considering. Your friend asks you a question. Maybe the C player asks you a question. A lot of mental strain going into an event like this. It certainly is. Those duelists are going to have their work cut out for them. But let's go ahead and meet our duelists for this next round. Thank you, casters. And this is going to be Swiss Round 10 feature match with the blue team. We have the Zero Mortal Plans. In position A, we have Jared. Position B, we have Chancellor. Position C, we have Tyler. And they are playing on behalf of their friend. And so everything's on the line here. They're playing for a chance to make it to the top cut. This is gonna be very, very, very difficult. Everything's online. You've been playing so much Yu-Gi-Oh already, and uh, you're just one game away from making it that top cut. And introducing our red team, we have in position A, Minsu, position B, Matthew, and position C, Cole. They are the Amano Iwato. Just such a stacked card. I mean, what a great spirit monster. I don't know if we're going to see that at the top tables here, but definitely something to be afraid of. But again, just really great to be here. And again, I'm looking forward to seeing, especially since we have the deck list in front of us, this is going to be a real treat on the eyes. Yeah, there's a variety of different decks across. We see Rescue Ace, Fluunderies. We see Voiceless Voice. We see, of course, Snake Eye, Fire King. And then we see a Pearly deck spread out across these six players. So there's a variety of different strategies that have made it this far into the event. No, it shows you that if you're trying to gun for those trophies, you don't necessarily have to play the deck that's as popular or as poplar as everyone else is playing. You can really stick to your guns. And man, Amazing Defenders was just such an amazing set. We've seen such longevity at the top tables from last year all the way into this year. Yeah, both Rescue Ace and Pearly strategies still lingering around. We saw Pearly last round. We actually saw a little bit of Rescue Ace last round. And Rescue Ace is one of the strategies that actually does get to incorporate Poplar, because by summoning Poplar, you can, of course, search out the original Sinful Spoils, go into a Link Rebo, and then you get access to your Hydrant, which, of course, that deck involves. Hydrant is just such an incredible card, too, because really what Rescue Ace adds to the equation that Snake Eye itself doesn't have alone and Fire King doesn't really add either is those very powerful trap cards that Rescue Ace Turbulence is able to bring up, especially when you're able to get out the Rescue Ace Hydrant as well. Being able to get the secondary effects of Extinguish and Contain, not only locking out those effects, but even chasing them down to the graveyard or making sure they can't be used as materials are really important when you know your opponent is going to be trying to make these huge, powerful monsters like Promethean Princess, the Bestower of Flame, or a rival monster like Appaloosa Bow with a Goddess to try to stop your plays. Yeah, the interaction there with Promethean Princess I think is one of the most important interactions when we're able to buff up those trap cards and is potentially one of the reasons why Rescue A strategies, although a little bit under the radar, might actually be a good counterplay to the other fire strategies that we see around the event hall today. Well, leave it to the fire department to know how to deal with fire, huh? That is a great point, yeah, would, would you look at that? The bonfires certainly are going to be put out, but we'll have to see what's going on here. Duel is just getting ready. Obviously, it's great that Zero Mortals Plan is playing on behalf of their friend as well. And I know there's a lot of Team YCSs. You know, you, you try to just do what you can for the team, but you right earlier that point that you made, that being in that B spot in between, it really is going to be difficult. But we're going right into game one here, round 10, the final round of Swiss at our Team YCS. 
And it looks like we're going to start with table B between Matthew and Chancellor. So we're going to see that rescue a snake eye strategy versus the Fire King Snake Eye strategy. Looking at some of the numbers heading into today, it seems like the Fire King variations of Snake Eye were more popular than the pure Snake Eye builds. That was one of the lingering questions going into this weekend, which is, do players think the Fire King engine is worthwhile, or should they focus exclusively on just the Snake Eyes? And I think the answer so far has been, we're going to play both together. And both the decks really are great. I mean, pure Snake Eye has so much extension. There's so many different monsters that it has access to. Fire King obviously gives you bigger options and certainly a, a whopping punch in the form of Fire King High Avatar Garunix and Fire King High Avatar Kirin. But looks like we're going to get right into this duel here, so let's see who ends up going first. I also think, and as an extension of last week, when we saw the popularity of Effect Veil and Infinite Impermanence, the Fire King cards generally line up pretty well when you have copies of Kirin in your deck that can sort of circumvent those targeting negative effect. Same is true with Ghost Mourner, which we saw with a more degree of popularity here this weekend. But we see Chancellor opening one of the more ideal cards, which is a copy of one for one, as long as it's not met with, and unfortunately it was, an Ash Blossom. And Commentator's Joyce. curse. <laughs> the one for one, still a great card, is. obviously, just not going to happen this time. Looks like we're going to our next play, though. This is useful. We haven't seen this a lot, but Matthew immediately informs his teammates that he's playing against Rescue Ace. Now, it's no guarantee that the sure. other players, and in this case, it's actually incorrect, but it's no guarantee that the other players would be playing Rescue Ace. But if some of his teammates were going first, the knowledge that they might potentially be playing against Rescue Ace is quite valuable. No, it certainly is. We have seen some of these uniform teams where they all show up with the same strategy. They just agree, this is the best deck, but there is definitely some variety across the board amongst these two teams. Speaking of variety, we're going to go ahead and see Rescue Ace Hydra take the field and grab Airlifter, which is going to go ahead and grab a new spell card. It's going to be Alert. Looks like Chancellor has made sure that his deck has Collector's Rares and the new Quarter Century Rares. It's an absolutely beautiful array of cards thus far. And it looks like he searched out a copy of Turbulence. Looks like we're going to link off these two Rescue Ace Monsters of the Graver, which means Turbulence is already online. Yes. So it's going to be the classic SP Turbulence opening thus far. Not wasting any cards there, just going straight into the SP level. It makes sense. There's not really a reason to try to banish anything. Leaving the Ash Blossom in the graveyard is actually beneficial because it allows him to use Hida on his own turn emergency. later on down the line. Climb. Looks like we're grabbing Emergency. Looks like it's going to be Emergency Alert. Contain, or rescue, contain, and extinguish. Rescue, there I was. I was trying to figure out which of the two it was because alert didn't seem like the right call, but definitely made the right one there. Turbulence and defense mode. It's a huge field. I mean, it sets up very fast. It's something that doesn't really need a lot of backup support here. And now we're going to go into, yeah. might be that Hida you were channeling. So the Promethean Princess can just bring back the Hydrant here. So that will you know, amplify his trap card effects. Again, Rescue Ace Hydrant really is what makes this deck so great. Each of those cards can be activated as long as you have that face-up Rescue Ace monster. But you get that extra special sauce if you have Rescue Ace Hydrant as well. It looks like now he's special summoning Preventer from his hand by banishing a copy of Hydrant. And just great resource management here because now that the Preventer is special summoning the Rescue Ace Hydrant that was sent to the graveyard, it's also going to let Preventer go back to the hand. Now he's link climbing through Link Karibo. Getting the whole master class as if we were in the brains here. And there's Deco Talker Heat Soul. Pay a thousand light points. Pay a thousand? That's awesome. Gonna go ahead and draw. So we see here Chancellor is valuing putting Hydrant on the field, which is obviously one of the end goals for Rescue Ace to amplify the effects of those trap cards. We commented on how the ability to follow some of these Fire King monsters into the graveyard and negate their effects beyond just on the field is a huge advantage of playing the Rescue Ace strategy. We've only really had two sets drop since Rescue Ace was in its all-time high in the uh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series. I'd say Indianapolis was really where it showed out. But the deck's still good and really just takes advantage of all the great cards that the Fire strategy has been really employing um, lately. Yeah, the limitation of Airlifter is obviously inconvenient. You certainly play more than one copy if you were allowed to do so. But the original Sinful Spoils package and now the new release of Snake Eyes Poplar has increased its viability and its consistency on those opening turns to a point where it probably mimics where it was at in Indianapolis. Definitely feels like there's a Rescue Ace Hydrant on every block. <laughs> Certainly. Contain, extinguish. I think you do. Because he's three in hand, he just drew two. Yeah, okay. Let's do the next team. 
scoops it up there, doesn't need to see anything else, isn't ready to fight all those different cards. And it is true that it's very difficult to beat back that much spell and trap Everybody support. Doing. Obviously, players obviously use all these different monster negates, but that's not going to help you and with those four face green, downs. Yeah, typically in game one, you're not going to see cards <laughs> like Lightning Storm or Harpy's Feather Duster unless a deck is dedicating to actually just naturally going second, even if they win the die roll. And as a result, whenever you're able to resolve Turbulence, and set four from the deck, especially going first like that in game one. It's an amazing feeling. Now, going forward, he's going to have to worry about cards like evenly matched, Lightning Storm, like I just commented on. So the Turbulence effect isn't necessarily as game-ending as it might be in game one. But when you win the Dyro like that, that was a really ideal opening turn where you're able to put Hydrant on the field, resolve your Turbulence, have three cards in hand, a couple extra draws there. Really good ideal opening hand there. No, I think it was play. Tom said earlier in the broadcast that you only have to resolve Turbulence twice to win the duel. But here we see that just winning it once, that's all you need. It looks like our players at table A and C are still underway, so we only seemingly have one result here. And it's the blue side taking down game one on table B. Certainly not a bad situation to be in, and obviously giving up a little bit of matchup knowledge too. It might be there's a rescue ace expert on the team that says, hey, you need to go for this, you need to stop that. So it makes the team format so great. You know, you don't just have to be up there by yourself, not only in terms of your wins, but also just in terms of your game knowledge, your support, and even just your spirit. Absolutely. At table A, we know that there's actually a Pearly versus Flow Under Ease matchup going on. So two strategies that we've seen separately, but not necessarily against one another. So that's an interesting match there at table A. And then table C, we see there's a Voiceless Voice against a Fire King Snake Eye strategy. So again, a lot of variety here at our final round of Swiss. Now, it still shows you there's a lot of decks left in the tournament. So if you're trying to choose your strategy at home for future regional championships or maybe your official tournament championship, there's lots of great picks that you can make. One of the, oh, go ahead. No, you I was going to say, if you just got that little bit of information as the Rescue Ace player, right? You didn't really see your opponent play any cards. What do you think you're going into your side deck there? That's a good question. So one of the things that I would first check is what are my opponents playing at tables A and C? Because if there was a similarity, in which in case there isn't, but if there was a similarity, you might be able to actually conclude that the entire team registered the same strategy. And unfortunately here, you're going to look over at table A and see a pearly deck, look over at table C and see a Fire King strategy. And as a result, you're not going to be able to make that assumption. So as a result of that, you're just going to have to kind of decide a lot of generic cards, cards that I think are good against a variety of different situations. Things that I certainly would not be putting into my deck. He has some of the Vistules in his side deck. Those cards are quite narrow. Powerful in the matchups in which they're good against, but quite narrow otherwise. So I certainly wouldn't be signing those in. Cards like Cosmic Cyclone, though, I think are good against a variety of different strategies. Now, certainly if your opponent here is playing Branded, you might not be pleased, but it's good against Kestira strategies. It's good against Pearly strategies because you can banish the My Friend Pearly. It's certainly good, obviously, against Fire King strategies. So as a result, I think Cosmic Cyclone is one of the most likely cards that goes into his deck because it covers a wide range of strategies when you have to go second. Now, it's been a really powerful card throughout the tournament, obviously, and we're going to see what happens here in our game two of round 10, the final Swiss round of this Team YCS. Matthew, of course, will be able to go first here. It's taking just a little bit of time here to shuffle things out, make sure everything is fair and on I the up and up. have inner sleeves on regular sleeves. I was just curious. Just thoroughly making sure that this deck is randomized again, Matthew. Not going to leave anything to chance here, and that's completely fair, right? I mean, this is a tournament. It is a competition, so we do have rules here. But again, while we're waiting for this to kind of wrap up, again, it is just going to be interesting to see Matthew get into the game. Again, he didn't show anything before, and so this may be his opponent's first chance to be like, oh, maybe there's a lot more fire here than I expected. Yeah, I mean, the fire... Kings are going to be all over the place. And again, one of the things about players that have, have had similar records is sometimes even if you don't necessarily play against them earlier in the tournament, that's certainly you wouldn't do until the top cut again, you can still sometimes just look over casually while shuffling and notice, oh, the person beside me is playing a unique strategy. And that usually stands out. Sometimes I remember in between games one and two or two and three, I might shuffle up and look over to my right or left and notice a strategy that's quite unpopular and say, wow, that's really standing out to me. It's just a moment that you would acknowledge and remember. Whereas if you look over to your left and right in the middle of a round and notice, okay, a Fire King strategy, I don't really think much of it. So sometimes you can figure out what your opponent's playing just because you happen to have sit max them earlier. Well, speaking of not thinking much of it, little Poplar is going to take the field and try to activate his effect to add something to the hand. Chancellor mm. thinking to himself if he wants to do anything about that, but lets it pass. So he's choosing to hold back the infinite impermanence. This will be a valuable thing to watch. So ordering your hand interruptions is very important, obviously, in a format where people are playing 12, 15, and yesterday Xu Ping had nearly 20 in his deck. 
knowing when to sequence your hand interruptions is very vital to making it this far into the Swiss rounds and then eventually into the top cut. No, you don't want to spend all your points of interaction in one place, and ordering them properly is how you dodge cards like Triple Tactics, Talent, etc. But looks like we're going to use the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye, place something in the Spell and Trap Zone from the deck here. So Chancellor mu must be valuing cutting off an effect later on in the turn something like an Ash effect summoning from the deck or ser searching or potentially even summoning from the deck. We have seen players do less immediate activations of those negating effects, right? They just Does save it for the one card that's actually going to do something against them. Now, waiting too long could backfire on you, but it seems like player philosophies are developing further and further as we go tournament by tournament. Yeah, the more people have the opportunity to play against Snake Eye strategies, the more confident that you'll be with some of the interactions and points of contention, you'll understand, you know, is it worth negating a poplar effect if Infinite Impermanence is my only card in hand? And that Divine Temple of the Snake Eye really has changed things up. I mean, the fact that the Fire King strategy is also including a copy of this card is really vital because you do get that additional special summon whenever they got, kind of get into the game. Yeah, it's a card that's, I wouldn't necessarily taken me by surprise, but it was a card that when you read it, it doesn't necessarily line up with the power of some of the modern day field spells that you see. You know, you read a card like some of the Pressured Planets or Primeval Planet, clearly you're going to play the card because it instantly replaces itself. It's a little bit more convoluted. Typically cards that require your opponent to do something for you to get the value, which is the case with Divine Temple, usually get left off to the side, but this card's ability to just sort of fill out that spell and trap card zone, allowing you to build up resources for the following turns, and then also give you counterplay to Nibiru, has actually made it a viable, not only main deck option, side deck option. We've seen it all over the place this weekend. Well, speaking of decks, we're going into the extra deck now, combining Snake Eye Oak and our Link Karibo to make an SP Little Knight. Uh, no. Not going to banish that impermanence. So it looks like Chancellor valued negating the Oak as opposed to the Poplar, and it might actually be sufficient here because uh, Matthew is going to set three cards of the Spell and Trap card zone, and he's going to end the turn with just SP Little uh, Knight. SP Little Knight's a powerful defensive card, but it may not be able to hold down on the Onslaught of Rescue Ace cards, right? The Rescue Ace, they really just need to resolve that turbulence once, and there's a lot of steps in between that SP Little Knight might get a little gun shy or trigger happy and decide to jump in. Ooh, but that's going to change things up. The anti-spell, for oh, maybe not. Chain and Cosmic Cyclone to make sure that those spells are going to be activated oh, freely. So it looks like the Anti-Spell Fragrance is in fact going to be banished. Anything else in the standby boss? It's like a beautiful original oh. copy from the very original PC game it came out in. Yeah, those are beautiful, as well as the collector's jerseys. They both are quite beautiful. Oh yeah, showing up in style. You got to when it's the Team YCS, you got to represent your team. We're going to go ahead and put that in the banishment over there. And Airlifter's going to see what it can do. Waiting to see if we have any response here from Matthew. Um, it doesn't matter if it's limited to one, if you naturally draw it. <laughs> Just Perfect. hit that good, right? Chaining two. Target, target. Pulling it off the field is definitely a good idea. Obviously, that would be one less Rescue Ace monster on the field, one less Rescue Ace monster hitting the graveyard. Oh, he's, he's going to go and tribute it. it. Smart, smart. Someone won from his hand. The problem here is, is this is going to activate the Divine Temple, which is going to yes. allow the Ash to hit the field so that Matthew gets some follow-up. Definitely allows him to replenish his resources quite quickly. Emergency's good, but this may be an emergency for Chancellor instead. Yes. So we see one of the valuable parts here is, you know, sometimes you're not going for that full field, sometimes through those hand interactions. The Divine Temple is that critical piece because you can set up the Ash for your opponent's turn because inevitably they're going to Special Summon. You know, that's just the era that we live in. And as a result, the Ash now can search follow-up. It can actually search another copy of itself, which is an interesting component of Ash. Typically, cards that allow you to search your deck like this limit you to cards not named itself. That's not the case with Ash. So an Ash could search Ash, or here he's going to search Ponix, which now reveals that he is, in fact, playing the Fire Kings. And you actually saw Chancellor... No. Shuffle his, or sh shake his head to acknowledge, okay, I am playing against not only Snake Eyes, but the Fire King strategy as well. It is a little different to see the Divine Temple there, and that Divine Temple may pay dividends later if Lambert Dragon hits the field. That's what makes it so powerful, is that, yes, it has an initial activation effect, but later on in the duel, maybe you're going to see monsters jump out of the spell and trap zone again. And we're able to search out a copy of Turbulence, and now he's going to be able to use his Hydrant effect as well. Definitely feeling a little bit safer there. Obviously, could use Link Karibo to put the Hydrant into the graveyard to go ahead and get Turbulence the old-fashioned way, just banishing those two. Be nicer to use, you know, the Emergency to maybe get a Preventer here, so let's see what we got. He's considering it, but not sure of himself. Link Karibo is here after all. Yep. Now we're going to go ahead and just banish two and going straight into Turbulence, doing this the old-fashioned way. Now, Turbulence Effect is going to activate. Matthew thinking Resolves. about what he wants to do. Oh, and it resolves. We are going to go ahead and set four, so let's see what we grab. Looks like Extinguish. 
Contain is in there somewhere. Yeah, there's Contain. I also see Rescue and sure. Alert. Full complement there. Now, Reinforce um, is certainly a good card, too, but just uh, hasn't seen a lot of popularity in this format, yeah. so well, probably not going to be seeing it here. No, occasionally you saw it pop up a little bit as a counterplay to Evenly Matched, but it's not a card that we're seeing a lot this weekend. Evenly match certainly a good pick, but with I every see, player ready for a follow-up, it just doesn't do the level of, of damage that it used to. Yeah, Reinforce's graveyard effect was typically perceived as better than its actual on-field effect. It's a shame, but hey, the card's still good. Now, speaking of good cards, looks like we're going to go ahead and send those two for Hita, the Fire Channeler. So let's grab a Snake Eye Monster from the graveyard, perhaps. And uh, what we'll be able to see is Chancellor going to show off the fact that his deck actually has Snake Eyes in it. Or this is another option as well. Of course, he can just bring the Hydrant back that was banished. Very convenient, right? Thanks for bringing me a Snake Eye Oak so I can get my Snake Eye Hydrant back. <laughs> yeah, that's an important interaction because Chancellor's not actually playing Oak himself, but the wariness to know that Oak can use its effect to bring the Hydrant that's banished back onto the field or into your hand is a really valuable interaction point because, again, he's not playing the card himself, but he knows the card's full potential. No, definitely if you've gotten this far in the tournament, you have been stealing some Snake Eye Oaks Close. across the board, and Rescue Ace Hydrant is just such an incredible card. You want to be able to bring yep. it, and Rescue Ace Turbulence is just doing so much. We haven't seen a lot of Rescue Ace Turbulence's final effect come into play, right? It's little revenge where you can target a card on the field and destroy it if they do something sure. to you. But that might come into play, but Turbulence is already off the field, and now we're just kind of cycling through the Link Monsters. Into Zelantis. Oh, so now we see a Zelantis not uh, only not well. in the Fire King Snake Eye strategy, sure. uh, but yeah. here we'll in a Rescue Ace strategy. Uh, yeah, sure. Yeah, I guess the Fire Department does need a little bit of water on its side. I'm so curious what his end result here is going to be. Is it also going to be one sure. with Raging Phoenix? Looking over his deck list, he does in fact play that. So the Raging Phoenix did hit the graveyard as we were Link climbing. Okay, perfect. And uh, those are some big numbers on the board. And he gains zero, yeah. Okay. Enter battle. Yes. Kind of a difficult situation for Matthew if those two cards are not what we need. Remember, uh, those co-linked monsters card. are enabling the Zelantis to get some destruction yeah, effects zero. off. Um, Matthew, double co-linked. Thinking here. It's pretty difficult. The pressure's definitely on. And if Chancellor locks this Results. down, we'll be going to one of our other players. Just trying to see, I assume. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Cosmic Cyclone. I think those are Triple Tactics Talent, which obviously being set. So it wasn't too much. Valuable. Certainly you could think about activating the Cosmic Cyclone, but with so much attack points on the board, you may not want to reduce your life points by 1,000. So I think Chancellor's just checking the math to see oh, yeah. if he does, in fact, have enough. Um, sure, I'm at 19. So, so looking at our records here? Yeah. 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 Looks like it's not over till it's over. This would be our first victory of Chancellor 1. Obviously, Jared took one for the blue team, and Cole down at the bottom in the C spot took one for the red team. But they haven't finished their duels. A couple things to note here. One, the life points. Unlikely to be reduced to zero there because the Divine Temple was increasing the Ashes attack. And then we actually knew that he had Ponix in hand, which can be special summon because the Fire Monster was destroyed. So now we have sort of a second layer of barrier here for our life points. So although this particular play was great because it cleared two Spell or Trap cards, which is definitely valuable for Chancellor, it doesn't necessarily reduce Matthew's life points down fully to zero. So it's not over until the last card is played. Chancellor just cutting the deck. Obviously, we have the Sanctuary off the Ponix effect there. May be exactly what we need because the Divine Temple not doing a whole lot here without anything in the Spell and Trap Zone that's a monster card. Emergency from hand? So now we're going to activate Emergency from hand. The fact that these are quick uh, plays allow you to use um, them in the battle phase. Yeah, resolves. I was getting two going in, so I think I got it. Yeah. So let's see who we grab here. It's going to be in defense mode, Hydrant. But with Hydrant here now, we can activate some of those other cards. Yeah, he's going to send uh, the preventer. preventer from his sure. hand that's now going to allow him to summon the Airlifter from his banished pile. Yeah. And now this is going to also yeah, allow him to, to attack for more damage. Very heads up play, using those quick play spells during the battle phase to just make sure you can get it. And a little bit of a long way around. Obviously, Emergency is only putting the monsters in defense mode, but getting rid of the prevention from the hand, let it use its effect to go ahead and get Airlifter back out. So just resource management at its all-time high. Yeah, that was a perfect discard off of the Emergency because now he has Hydrant on the field, so all of his trap cards have been amplified in their effectiveness. Yes. Plus, he was able to recur that monster from the Banish pile through the effect of Preventer. So it's really great sequencing. Yes, and speaking of recurring and sequencing, looks like we're yes. going to go and use Link Karibo. Go ahead and put that the zone that Salaman Great Sunlight Wolf is pointed to. So now we can go ahead and access the graveyard and grab another fire card. Just great resource management here across the board. I'll add the lift to Sure. So he adds Airlifter back, which technically would mean he has the opportunity to summon it for a third time next turn. So even okay, though it is limited to one, this deck's ability to recur it and also search it whenever it is necessary 
kind of circumvents the fact that it's been limited to one on the Forbidden and Limited list. Deco Tucker, Heat Soul, just doing a great job of continuing that resource management. It seems like the only damage that's been done to Chancellor is what he's done himself by paying a thousand life points. I think that's the case in the last game as well. Winnable, winnable. Just undefeated in terms of, well, keeping his team's life points healthy. And you hear Matthew saying, oh, this is winnable. I think he has just the Sanctuary in his hand, so he's going to need quite the top deck to circumvent the field the Chancellor's about to finish making here. Yeah. Well, it's getting more and more difficult as we see SP Little Knight rifling through the graveyard here. It did include that. Oh, and the Link Karibo going is going to be so difficult. Now, when there's an effect negation, that's just going to be it. Looks like we have some updates on our table scores. Now, Minsu's taking a game, so they're 1-1 each on table A. Of course, you're watching us here on Chancellor and table B with the first game. And then, of course, on C, Cole is still holding it down with that 1-0 score against Tyler. Resolves. So what we're going to see here is an alert to put the Hydrant back on the field. And this is critical that he got rid of the Link Rebo on the past turn because now cards like Contain and Extinguish that have targeting effects can target freely and not have to worry about Link Rebo coming out of the graveyard to kind of circumvent that effect. And with Hydrant on the field, all of those trap cards have amplified effects. And Hydrant a little vulnerable here. Obviously, there's no other well. rescue aces there, but they're not particularly hard to get on the field. So if it needs to be protected, it can. SP Little Knight's got his back too as well. Looks like the Sanctuary is going to be activated. Is that a yeah. Nibiru, I see? And a Ghost Bell. Oh, no. This is going to be a very uphill battle for Matthew, then. He just set two past. Yeah. You're game three or game two? two. You won game one? OK. OK. Uh, what about you, Minsu? Uh, we're going to Matthew giving us the All updates right. from the table. On you guys. We'll see. And Matthew definitely taking in note of how his uh, fellow I'm teammates focused. are doing, because the situation that he's in here is not the greatest. Yeah, you think you're burning up your opponent's deck, unless they're willing to just borrow your fire monsters and keep burning with you. So he there Chilling destroyed the Ponix, which he added back to his hand from the standby phase. And now he's nice. able to special summon Grunix from his hand. Now this is probably going to get met with Contain. Targets in the game. contain. Sure. And it can't be just material since I just on the board. Um, and the, it can attack. attack. Yeah, it can? Cannot. It cannot, yes, 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 okay. Yeah, so it cannot attack, and it cannot be used to go back into the extra deck um, in any way. It is practically a blank card at this point. Ooh, that's a card he drew. Oh, that's oh. it. Okay, the wanted was stopped by the Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion, and that's oh. all Matthew needed to see to go ahead and extend the fist bump. Uh, I think this really showcases it. the power of the rescue ace strategy, right? We were go talking and going There's into no this way. weekend about what's the best line. package with Snake Eyes. Is it Pure Snake Eyes? Is it Fire King Snake Eyes? Oh, well, I mean, Chancellor just showed us it might actually be considered a viability to play Rescue Ace. Yeah, I'm going to go home and get out my Rescue Ace cards. I had pecked them away thinking that it was going to be all Fire Kings from here on out, but I think I was wrong. Jared, how are you feeling? So it sounds like the A and C tables are still ongoing. So it'll be curious to see if we can jump into one of those and watch the conclusion of this map. That was a pretty quick game there on our B table. It looks like table A is just about to start, and it looks like table C is kind of in the midst of play. Chancellor, a true competitor there. You know, he won his match, but didn't even show a, a moment of celebration there. Still concerned about his fellow players there. Seeing how they're doing, checking in on them, and being a supportive teammate. Looks like Jared here on the left at table A is going to open up with a pot of extravagance. I was about to say prosperity, but he's shuffling the extra deck, so we can presume that's going to be a pot of extravagance. He is the player on the flow under E strategy. So you don't really need your extra deck there, mostly just normal summon and normal summon services. And then Minsu's on Pearly, and it kind of looks like they're setting us up to transition over to table A, which would be fantastic. Right? Oh, I'm excited if we game. get to see that. Yeah, we've seen flow under E's in the feature match arena. We've seen Pearly. We actually saw that last round. You've yet to see them play against one another, so it's a classic matchup. Both decks have incredible longevity and kind of get on each other's nerves in the sense that, you know, the big pearly monsters are unaffected by those card effects, but all those little birds, they do not care about the graveyard and they can go ahead and snatch them away as they go along. Obviously, Dimension Shifter is a card you can main deck and we've seen that very commonly in these matchups. Obviously, since duels have kind of progressed, I'm sure that our players know what's going on. So the graveyard, it may not be safe, but his opponent may be well aware of that. Yeah, it's going to be a matchup where we're going to see some interactions that we've yet to see this weekend, so it'll be fantastic for that. It's also one where we'll be able to potentially see the power of Unexplored Winds. It's kind of one of the cards in the Flawanda Reese strategy that gives them some counterplay against the Pearly strategy. Yeah, I mean, Flawanda Reese is gotten recent support right with Swallows Calvary and Phantom Nightmare, but not every player is choosing to run that. It shows you that it's just a good deck. Like, you could just take a deck list that was fairly similar to recent versions or older versions of the Fluanda Reese deck and just kind of keep piloting it with so many great cards and so many different wing beasts from throughout the pantheon of Yu-Gi-Oh that you can tap into. It, it's had a lot of longevity. I think some, almost to the annoyance of some players, right? They're ready for the flock to go away. But here we go in game three. Again, round 10, our final round of Swiss here, coming into our table A matchup that's already in progress.
And it looks like we are in the process of still kind of awaiting the players. Yeah, I think they're just looking through the side deck here. Okay, just make it sure and get a full preview there. Any chain after extravagance? No. Thank okay, God, so you're right about the extravagance. We were <laughs> shuffling up the extra deck there. Oh, I think our camera might be off. I think it's still actually Resolution. looking here down at Chancellor. Uh, You're not actually allowed to look that. at your side deck in the middle of a duel. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. So it looks like we are looking at that because those cards don't kind of line up. Now, we did hear, though, that he said the draw two is fine. So you were absolutely right about the pot of extravagance. It looks like we just hopped over that table now. Ooh, and he got met with Troll and Lockbird. Ooh, that is not going to be good. That's the one bird that they do not want to save. No. So the unfortunate reality here for Jared is without a called by the grave or across a designated like effect, it's going to be very difficult for him to establish sort of fully what he'd like to do. But here he reveals the Eaglin with his magnificent map. Going on a little bit of an adventure here. He's going to banish Robina. This is where the real fun begins, obviously. Now we're going to start triggering some of these great banish effects of them. Fortunately, that's the only thing he's going to be able to activate, though. He cannot search his deck. And because he cannot search his deck, he's not going to be able to be granted additional normal summons through these Flawunderies effects due to the effect of Draw and Lockbird. And we did see a monster effect activate, so we're going to go Triple Tactics Thrust, apparently, to set the card. Looks like we just had a Harpy's Featherstorm. Great way to get around the restriction of Draw and Lockbird. Huh? Yeah. Yeah, you know four right. cards in yeah, so typically, yeah, four. with this strategy, the thrust is so critical because you're going to have Featherstorm. And it looks like Jared has elected only to side the copies of Harpy's Featherstorm. So it seems like he's gone into this event with a strategy of inside the games. If he is unfortunately met with Ash Blossom or Draw and Lockbright, he can just use the thrust to set the Featherstorm from his deck. But only in the side of games. We saw yesterday our Flawunderies player main deck a single copy of Featherstorm to make it so that the play was viable in game one. The question here from Insu is how much can he navigate with his Pearly strategy without monster effects? And he's going to start here with a copy of My Friend Pearly. Nice to see my friend Pearly. Honestly, that's just a really viable deck still that its graveyard dependence does make it difficult to play, but it's still a powerful set of cards, even with some of the hits that it had on the Forbidden the Limited list. Yeah, you have to be a real master of Pearly to make it this far into an event. You can play around Dimension Shifter, you can still win games with happiness, but it's a little bit more difficult and convoluted than some of the games in which Dimension Shifter is not active. As a matter of fact, there are some Pearly decks that actually just incorporate Shifter itself. Here he revealed three copies of pretty memory, guaranteeing that he adds one to his hand. Freeze play. We're hearing the freeze play in the background. Of course, that is for the rest of the tournament. We got our own clock here. Speaking of our own clock, it's time for my friend Pearly. Jared's here going to be able to activate his magnificent map. To go in tribute, possibly. Or say, oh, but there's the cosmic cyclone. Let's blow that map right away. Now here he's definitely going to chain the Featherstorm here as chain link three. So you have Pearly chain link one. Actually, it's chain link four. So Pearly chain link one. Map is chain link two. Cy Cyclone is chain link three, and then Storm is chain link four. The dust is going to settle. The map is going to get banished, and the Pearly effect will not resolve because the Featherstorm is now active. Does help to get it out of the way for sure, though. You don't have to worry about the Harpy's Featherstorm later. A very powerful card. And right now, the board looks a little even, but unless there's something really good in Minsu's either board or hand, he's not going to be able to stop the onslaught of Flawn Ray's monsters. Yeah, we know Jared has a Robina in his hand, because although Drone Lockbreak will stop him from searching one out, he was able to add Robina back to his hand okay. with the effect last turn after the summon of Eaglin. And here we see a Harpy's Feather Duster. Okay. Birds of a feather flock together, right? Harpy's Feather Storm is one good card. How about a Harpy Feather Duster? But getting rid of those face down cards, Mitsu thinking maybe chain this. It's interesting that that's in his deck here going first in game three. Well, considering it's game three, he might know just how many great cards his opponent has, but it looks like we're going to go ahead and get some pearly on. Yeah, that's important. It's. In Definitely want to use that special yeah, summon. It's, it's optional to special summon. He, he did discard for it, so it is important that we see that fully play out. But the Pearl Lily is going to allow us to search for a My Friend Pearly. I haven't seen the Stray Pearly Street just yet. I don't know if it's sitting in his hand or it's just obviously the My Friend Pearly is really important. He lost it just now to the Harpy's Feather Duster, but hopefully he's able to get in the game here, right? The cats are cute, but they are a little better when they have their Xyz monster versions on the he field. Has known in hand. Absolutely. And with the Featherstorm last turn, that was just not likely going to be plausible. 
Now, this game is game deciding. Cole did take two against Tyler. Chancellor, we did see, get two against Matthew. So this literally is their last chance of the tournament here. Cole meaning that a Fire King Snake Eye deck has 2 owed a Voiceless Voice deck over there at table C. Oh, have to send out a little Novox's prayer for the Voiceless Voice. Fortunately, it's been a little bit of a theme for that deck in the future match area. I promise they're out there and winning. It's just seemingly in the future match area. We haven't had a lot of luck with them. Well, the good news is when they hit the top tables, we'll get to see them. But speaking of the top tables, let's slam down some cards with Pot of Prosperity. Looks like Dimension, Dimensional Barrier, as well as Dimensional Fissure, as well as Pot of Prosperity. A couple other cards here, too. Pot of Duality, maybe reaching deeper in the deck. But I think he grabbed the last card yeah, there. It's going to be Thrust, because he's going to be able to Thrust for another Feather Storm, because he used the Pearl Lily effect this turn. There's certainly a great way to keep things up, but the Droll Lockbird's going to say no, but that's okay because that's okay. you're going to set it anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, disgusting. <laughs> Maybe wasn't expecting him to run multiple copies, but it's a great card. There's almost no reason not to. Yeah, so the, the reason you play one is because you regularly plan on ser searching out the deck with thrusting game one. But in game two or three, if you have to go second and you know that you have the opportunity to go first, if you have to go first, rather, in games two and three, knowing that you have the opportunity to draw it naturally, you obviously yeah, yeah, want to have access to all three copies. The very strong card. Wing Beasts have never been eating better. Now, of course, Judge is making sure the life point calculations are correct. There were some life point gains, obviously, from the Wandering cards. So Stree is actually a really important one because it plays around the effect of Drone Lockbird in the sense that you can banish and actually still conduct another summon. It doesn't add. Yeah, they're talking about Stree. Stree and Toucan are the two cards that can get around Drone Lockbird. Uh, Definitely helps when the birds know how to play against line. other birds. But we're going to go ahead and attack uh, Pearly. This must be the weakest battle phase with attack strain defense I've seen in a long time. I a have to say, the entire tournament, the only thing we saw that was like this was when Low attacked into a Ubel monster, right? That was 50 versus zero. Oh, like, look at all these level one monsters just battling it out here in the arena. Hey, people wanted to see a simplified game state. Here it is. So I take nothing from that. Yep. Stree and Eaglin versus Pearly and Pearl Lily. The birds have taken this one. <laughs> All right, so we're going to draw for a turn. If you're a friend of Cats, let's cheer for Minsu. We it's know he has his my friend Pearly, so. He but has the something. problem is, we know that Harpy's Featherstorm is Fet face down, so you just kind of have to figure out a way around that. Maybe just naturally draw into some spell and trap removal, but it's going to be difficult to get through it. Yeah, he's going to need to just buy himself another turn somehow. The problem is, we know Jared has Rubina, so the question here is, does Minsu have a way of stopping the Rubina effect? I don't know that he does. We haven't seen all the cards in his hand, but I think it's kind of telling that he wanted bodies, bodies, bodies here, right? So, I'm gonna randomize this, see if it's going to be Perlili or Perli. Yeah, this is a way of guaranteeing that one of these monster effects will go to him, because if you have to use a spell and then discard only for it to be hit by Featherstorm, you're losing out on a card in your hand. This is sort of the one-for-one -one trade into the Featherstorm. He's got to do it. There's the Feather Storm negating the effect of Pearly, so we're not going to see any cards. And that's the pass. All right. So we're going to probably start with Rubina. And then the question will be put to Minsu of, do we have an interaction in the hand to stop the Rubina effect? So we're going to the main phase here without any interruptions. Doesn't even seem like Minsu may have any cards in his hand. He has Rubina known in hand. That's fine. So here's part of duality. Players using the team advantage here, right? He has Rubina known in hand. You might have heard there. That's totally legal coaching here because it's what the team YCS is all about. Going to go ahead and put those two cards back after the pot of duality. They look like he added an advent. It was quite difficult to see those, but it looked like it was potentially an advent. Or maybe it was a terraforming. Terraforming certainly get the magnificent map. Not sure what we're... Wait, Nod, perhaps Minsu does have a card in hand that we just can't see. I do see a little bit of an edge of a sleep at the very bottom of the camera. He really needs another Drill and Lockbird here. I mean, could he have another? He's been very, very confident in discarding them, but that hasn't necessarily advanced the game state in a way that Minsu can kind of get a foothold here. It's at least sort of traded with the Featherstorm turns. You know, one Drill and Lockbird, one Featherstorm, back and forth, back and forth, without either player really advancing their game. Makes it so that you're okay with that trade for the most part. It at least gets you this far into the duel. 
Uh, the question here, though, is Jared sort of has the first opportunity to take advantage of the situation post Ooh, the yeah. Featherstorm Drone Lock Retreats, but he's going to like to use the Ash Blossom and Joy Spring on the terraforming. It's a very well-timed Ash Blossom and Joy Spring. Some duels would have waited to use it against the Pot of Duality itself, but instead waited to see what cards were drawn and just use the Ash Blossom against something that's actually going to do something against you. Okay, oh, so it was an advent that he did add. So he must have had terraforming in his hand the previous turn, and of course, after Drone Lock Bird, not only was he unable to summon the Rabina and use the effect from hand, which is why it remained in hand, terraforming is another card he was unable to activate because of the draw and lock bread. So he did, oh, in fact, the draw the Pot of Duality this turn. Or, I mean, honestly, Pot of Duality is another card that could have been in his hand. So yeah, it, yeah. presumably he's been holding a bunch of cards that have been stopped by draw and lock bread, whether it's terraforming, yeah. whether it's Pot of Duality, the Rabina in his hand. The draw and lock bread has put in a lot of work here buying Minsu at least a couple turns. True, but as Minsu has bought those turns, Jared really has been stacking those resources he couldn't play. So anytime he hasn't had draw and lock bread, just like now, he's basically feeling the pain of that backed yeah, up log card. of cards that add things from the deck to the hand. Yeah, I was making that comment earlier that Jared's going to have the first opportunity to take advantage of this post Harpy Featherstorm, post Roll and Lockbird situation. Because, you know, if this reversed situation occurred where Minsu was able to activate Monster Effect first, he would be the one establishing his field here. But unfortunately for him, it's Jared that's doing that. Well, we're not down to the wire yet, but Flawandry's in the Advent Adventure is going to be a relevant card because it did allow the gaining of 500 additional life points on top of the fact that it's adding. So, certainly powerful, but again, with 12 minutes left on the board, we're probably going to be fine here. I think this duel will be decided one way or the other. So here, here we see Toucan hitting the field, allowing him to add the Empen back, or the Eaglin back to his hand, which will allow him to then search a copy of Empen or Ryza to his hand, or Mist Valley Avion. And it would be cool to see Ryza the Mega Monarch, but Mist Valley Apex Avion is just such a notoriously powerful card. Having the ability to negate activated effects by returning those wind monsters, those Mist Valley monsters back to the hand is incredible. And now there's the Emperor Penguin itself, Empen. And he's going to go chain link three, adding back the Toucan and the Robina. Three known. I think we've seen every bird except Snell today. Yeah, that's unfortunately for Snell typically the case. I know, but it's such a beautiful card, if only. But it is true that it just isn't popular in most of the competitive builds here. But there are other fine Wing Beast monsters. We might be seeing those now because it looks like we're in for a Tribute Summon. Oh, maybe not. No, he made the Tribute Summon of Empen, and now it looks like he has Rubina. He did search the Unexplored Winds, which and does create a situation where maybe he is going to tribute? Yeah, exactly. There's the tribute. Oh, and get in front of the My Friend Pearly, so it just doesn't happen. And putting out another M Pen on the field. So M Pen is not limited to once per turn, so now he's going to be able to search out a copy of Dreaming Town, which is going to make it so that on Minshew's turn, he has the Magnificent Map effect to summon again, and also think, the Dreaming Town. Yeah. 14. Starting to calculate the damage. The numbers are a lot bigger than they were last turn. Minus 100, that's game. And that is wow. going to take game. There's Look the handshake. So that guarantees we have a Flawandere strategy in our top 16. Which is just absolutely incredible. I don't think anybody expected for Flawandere to make it this far in the tournament. Certainly some players are hoping Flawandere doesn't make it that far in the tournament, but what a great play by Jared, really saving his team there, because again, that was the deciding factor, his win. As a matter of fact, their team across the board, although yes, Chancellor is incorporating Poplar into their strategy, it's a strategy that has or a table of players here that has zero Fire Kings within their deck. Table A, Flow Under Ease. Table B, Rescue Ace. Table C, Voiceless Voice. So we have at least one team that has thought going into this weekend, you know what, I am not sleeving up any Fire Kings, and the only Snake Eye cards I'm going to sleeve up is that single copy of Poplar. And sometimes that really is where the tournament is decided, right? Obviously, play is incredibly important, but the decisions you make when you're in the lab, right, sitting there staring at a table full of cards along with your friends and deciding, guys, I have a strange idea. Trust me, we don't run what everyone else is running. And I think we saw with Chancellor, his strategy lines up really well against the Fire Kings. The ability to search out those trap cards with Hydrant on the field allows you to really counterplay a lot of what the Fire Kings are trying to accomplish. Absolutely. I mean, the Fire Department is the Fire Department for a reason, but with Contain, Extinguish, there's just so many great cards you can use to really lock things down. Now, it's true that the deck doesn't have a lot of in-engine spell and trap removal, but the Cosmic Cyclones are everywhere, so he was able to do a really good job of just getting those in and using them exactly when he needs them. That's definitely one of the most popular side deck cards. I think it was really indicative last week that Cosmic Cyclone is probably the spell and trap card destruction of effect that you would choose going into this weekend. The ability, of course, to hit the island, the ability to hit my friend Pearly, the ability of lines are actually really well against Kashtir. It's probably been the most popular spell and trap card destruction effect that we've seen all weekend. No, it'll be cool to actually hear from our players pretty soon what it is that they thought, you know, what, how they came up with the idea that these are the cards that we're going to play. But before we get to that interview, we're going to go to a break.
Welcome back to YCS, Team YCS Las Vegas. And we have just concluded the Swiss Round 10. I am here with the winners of the feature match, Team Zero Immortals. So, how does it feel to play on the feature match on, you know, this last round here? Uh, very nerve-wracking, very nerve-wracking. Never want to do it again, but it was fun with my friends. You're going to have to do it again at some point if you want to win that trophy. Yeah. Now, for your matches, what stood out to you the most? During that match? During that match. Um, my opponent not having a response to turbulence wasn't really... Uh, was that crucial? It was a good time, yeah. All I right. tried to play around as much as possible and it worked out. Okay. No, turbulence is still a wonderful card. Set for feels crazy. amazing. Now, is there any deck type that you are looking forward to facing. All of them. We'll, we're, we're not here to lose. We came here for this man right here, Baby Darren. We're winning. Doesn't matter what they bring. Snake Eyes, Plunder, Canadian, anything. We'll take it. All right, all right. Now, now that you've secured your top cut after Swiss Round 10, what are your chances of taking it all the way home? 100%. 100%. 100%? All right. Congratulations to our winners of Swiss Round 10. This concludes the Swiss rounds, and we are going to be moving into Top Cut fairly soon. 100%, by the way. I love the attitude there. They don't care what deck is coming their way. And that really is the right attitude, because you can't show up to a YCS where there's thousands of other competitors and be like, I, I don't want to duel this duel. I don't want to duel that duel. I'm just hoping for strength of schedule. I mean, I can understand a few matchups where you really hope, oh, I hope I don't play this matchup. I don't have enough spots in my side deck. It, do it definitely does happen, especially in more diverse formats in the sense where you think there's maybe 15 or 20 different viable decks out there. This event, there's probably maybe seven to 10 different decks that you can anticipate playing, but there are always going to be blind sides in your side deck. So there are going to be a couple decks you typically hope not to play. Like maybe, for example, you don't have anything in your side deck for an Exodia combo deck like we saw not too long ago, right? So one more piece, right? One more piece. One more piece. Gosh, speaking of one more piece, there's just so much great stuff out there too from our public events. And let's take a look at some of the great prizes you can win at home for our daily digital duelist. Check out this amazing Master Duel Remote Duel event series mat that we have that features Zeus. Just an incredibly important card from throughout the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise since it released. Love the extended artwork. Too. Oh, it's so gorgeous because that's a full-size mat too. It's not the same size as the play mats. So definitely keep an eye out for that one. And of course, you can also win this brand new mat in the Winna mats here at our, our, our side events, the Pot Collection. The Pot Collection, a recently released collection of actual tangible items that you can have. I have a Pot Collection displayed on my desk. You also get actual copies of the Pot Cards. So to celebrate that, we have this beautiful Winna mat that celebrates Pot of Greed right there in the middle and a variety of different Pot Cards. Billy yesterday pointed out we have the two-faced ones on the right, Cards like Pot of Dichotomy, Pot of Duality, and then the one face ones on the left. I don't think I would have noticed that unless he pointed it out. It debuted last weekend at the Team YCS in San Jose. Do you have a favorite one of the pot collection? I think I like Pot of Avarice, and it's incorporated in so many different strategies, and you have to kind of earn the two cards. It's not just that Pot of Greed where you just always activate it. With Pot of Avarice, you're trying to maximize its vi viability by incorporating cards like Reborn Tengu back in the day, and maybe some cards like Lone Fire Blossom that fuel your graveyard, and then therefore, when you use Pot of Avarice, you get value not only by drawing two, but recycling cards back into your deck. A lot of history throughout those cards, too, and a lot of history that's going to be made here right today, because again, Swiss is over, so pretty soon we're going to find out who our top 16 teams are, which means from here on out, this tournament is single elimination, Losers, unfortunately, will not be able to advance in the tournament, but they've done so much. So what we're going to do now is we're going to send it off to break so we can find out who our top 16 is right after this.
All right, welcome back to Las Vegas, Nevada. Again, we are at the Expo at World Market Center and the Swiss rounds are finally over. We have been through 10 of them. We did two today and eight yesterday. So what does that really, really mean? Tom, do you want to talk to us about what it means to finally go from Swiss to single elimination? Well, you've played through all those rounds to make it to the top cut for a chance to win at the entire event. Of course, now moving away from Swiss, that's going to be single elimination, where mm -hmm. if you lose now, everything's over. You do have to go home. It also means that the rules, if for some reason any of these duels go to time, they're going to operate a little bit differently, but we don't worry. We do have our judges there specifically for that purpose. But the top 16 teams are going to be announced. Well, actually, let's take a look first. Day two, again, is going to be two Swiss rounds of 45 minutes each. We did those. The top 16 will also be 45 minutes. The top eight and top four will each be 55 minutes. And the final will be an unprecedented 65 minutes. Again, these are still best two out of three, two out of three. So it'll be the same rules you've been seeing, just a little bit more time on the board. That's right. And from 571 teams down to the remaining 16. But I believe the judges are ready to announce the top 16 for this event. All right. Team YCS Las Vegas competitors. After 10 rounds of Swiss, we have our top 16 teams. In first place, with 28 points, Team Supreme Pro. In second place, with 27 points, Team Storm of Ragnarok. In third place, with 27 points, Team D-Boys. In fourth place, with 27 points, Team Zero Mortals Plan. In fifth place, with 25 points, Team True Roof. In team, or in sixth place, with 25 points, Team Fala Galera and the Disciples. In seventh place, with 25 points, Team Ragnarok. In eighth place, with 25 points, Team This Is Too Long. In ninth place, with 24 points, Team Amano Iwato. In 10th place, with 24 points, Team Squiddy. In 11th place, with 24 points, Team Good at Yu-Gi-Oh! In 12th place, with 24 points, Team Two Dudes. In 13th place, with 24 points, Team Casino After? In 14th place, with 24 points, Team Sebastian Wesley Todd. In 15th place, with 24 points, Team The Jahari Brothers. And our final team in the top 16, in 16th place, with 24 points. Team Gavin's Mercenaries. Top 16 duelists. At this time, you will have five minutes before standings are finalized, and good luck. Just some incredible energy there. I know I'd be excited too if our team managed to make it, but we're going to be locked down to the desk to cast those 16 amazing teams. Yeah, you know what? Lots of high profile players there, lots of new ones, but uh, well, some of them met the expectations, some of them just 
managed to get that last spot. You know, that, like the last one right there, you can just really feel it. You can feel it. The 16th it. spot is always the most exciting. Well, because you don't know you made it in. You're praying you got the same record as everybody else, and hopefully they'll be able to do it. But before we get to our top 16, we're going to go ahead and take a break. Don't worry, we'll be back. of the world, hear me. You are cordially invited to prove your dueling might with Speed Duel, Streets of Battle City. Can you master these eight new decks and 20 new skill cards? <laughs> I doubt it, but I look forward to seeing you try. <laughs> 200 cards per box, each box sold separately. It's time to do, 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 do. Get your game on. Let's rub it up. Cause I'm feeling the flow. What do you say we swing into action? It's time to link into the brains. <laughs> Yu-Gi-Oh! Age of Overlord. Swing into action. Seek the secrets of the Snake Eye. Discover the tomb of an ancient king. Your path to the top begins here. Age of Overlord, available now. Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately. Yu-Gi-Oh! Phantom Nightmare. Have you ever met my pal Yuvel? You will soon, and you'll meet all kinds of far-out new monsters, too. There are goblin bikers, heroes of a doomed city, and even a dragon queen. Score sweet new cards for your favorite deck in Phantom Nightmare. Nine cards per pack, each pack sold separately. What is this place? It's Duel Links. It's a digital world. I see. It's a digital world. Like a smartphone? Are they related? <laughs> Not quite. Never mind that. Let's rush Duel in this world. <laughs> Bring it! I won't lose no matter where I am! That's the spirit. Let's, Let's go! go. Rush, rush Duel! Here I go! 
up! I summoned three monsters! What? Three monsters? You're allowed to do that in Rush Duel. I set two cards and end my turn. Ha, interesting. Then I will do this. <laughs> I summon two monsters, and then I tribute them to Tribute Summon. Let's go, Multi-Strike Dragon Dragius! I summon another two monsters and activate Dragius's effect. Double Doom! I attack with three monsters! Concussive Electrostatic Shock Ball! And there's more! Dragius can attack twice! Dragius can attack twice! Inferno of Infinite Destruction! Ah! You're doing great, Luke! You know it! You so know it! That ends my turn! Now what are you gonna do, Yuga? Isn't it against school rules to be this powerful? Come on! Do something! I'm not giving up yet! It's my turn! I draw! What? You can draw five cards at once? <laughs> you can draw cards until you have five in your hand in Rush Duel. You can always turn the tables. I summon Strange Cat and Mystic Dealer. I tribute two monsters to Tribute Summon. A wall, a mountain, not even a planet can block my way. Nothing will stop my road to victory. Seven's Road Magician. I send the top card of my deck to the graveyard to activate Seven's Road's effect. Elemental Road! Seven's Road gains 300 attack points for every different attribute in my graveyard. Seven's Road Magician attacks Dragius! I'm loading the road to freedom! This is Rush Duel! Rush Duel has been added to Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links! Duel in a new way! This guy's using math max? Oh man, they're sweating. If he's playing the coin flip deck or whatever, like that's gonna be the best. I would have never done this had I known I had a team to let down. I'm no math mech myself, but I've run the calculations in my head and from my uh, understanding, a coin flip is 50-50. I don't know about math anymore. I'm going back to Yu-Gi-Oh. Dice jar? Oh my. I'd once again like to apologize to my teammates. I, I didn't know this was <laughs> Access um, code talker, there it Mom, is. Mom, come pick me up, I'm scared. Well, Martha would be the best draw here, I think. Just built different, don't have to tell you. And then we'll uh, go for overkill. Wait, he's gonna use it on his own monster? I mean, he's BMing! Did, did you read the brief? Uh, surely, yeah, uh, of it course I like... read the brief. Yep. <laughs> Ogre 2! Bro, relax, he has a kid! Wait, can't he grave. negate it? Oh my. Second Veiler. But he, he negated his negate. negates negate. Yeah, negate what negate? on earth is? I get to ask for a pity turn and you have to give it to me. <laughs> Agree now. I activate! Rageki! Rageki! Rainbow Neos is protected by Neos Fusion. I hate it. By sending one monster to the graveyard, I shuffle everything back into your deck. You're actually sick of. Oh my god, I can win. Okay, okay, I Leslie, win. I'm gonna give you a mercy turn and make it look like an accident. Really? And then I'll finish oh, you, you off by to... attacking. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh my god. I... Did he misclick? No. I'm gonna face bomb. It didn't even matter. Rainbow Neos, attack directly. No! I'm going in. Wait, he's got so many cards in his hand. There's nothing he can play. Oh my, it's over. Oh. Whoa. Maybe I should have tried harder. Huh? This is a Zeus play. So I don't know. What on earth is he? Are you watching what I'm watching? What, what is I'm this? I'm watching, but I got no clue. I think he's now realizing I can't Zeus. We did it, boys. We did it. Master Duel is insane. <laughs> download it right now on Steam. It's free to download. Well, thank you again so much, everyone at home, for watching. We will see you all next time. Goodbye, everyone. Happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game! What's up, everybody? I'm Jake Paik. You might know me as Dumon from Yu-Gi-Oh! Zexel. 
Yusaku and Playmaker from Yu-Gi-Oh! Brains, and of course Kaizo from Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s. My favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! memory over the years is a tough question, but uh, it could be exploring the complex character of Yusaku in Brains, could be having to duel my best friend as uh, Playmaker in Brains, or it could be the extended time I spent as a green bicycle seat when I was playing Kaizo in Yu-Gi-Oh! 7s. I guess a couple of my most iconic or requested lines are usually Playmaker from Brains, uh, something along the lines of, uh, I LINK SUMMON! LINK THREE! DECODE TALKER! Or for the Firewall Dragon fans out there, I'm just a pure FIREWALL DRAGON! To get to share the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe with uh, other duelists, I mean, it's, it's truly inspiring. Um, some of the things that stick with me the most are getting to have conversations with people at events about either the show or the game or how the game has brought people together. You know, lots of things in the world try to pull us apart or divide us, and uh, I love that Yu-Gi-Oh! is something that, uh, Yu -Gi -Oh! is something that definitely brings us together. Whether it's to play the game or to watch the series or talk about the series, um, it's a unifier and there's a lot of positivity and joy there, so I love that. Oh boy, if I could be on any other Yu-Gi-Oh! series, that's tough. Um, selfishly, I, I love working with my voice actor colleagues, I love working with our director, Darren. I love working with all those teams, so selfishly, I'd love to, I'd love to play in all of those playgrounds. Um, you know, if it's uh, working with Dan Green and Eric Stewart, or, you know, Darren, or, um, you know, my colleagues Billy Bob Thompson and folks like that, uh, I'd love to play in any of those, you know, and I've, I've dabbled in both protagonists and villains, and villains are, uh, are fun to explore as well, so, you know, I know it's a bit of a, a cheat, but um, I, I, anywhere they'll have me. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. To those that donated, thank you for donating, and thanks for having us as part of the Yu-Gi-Oh! universe. One last time, happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game.
And welcome back to Team YCS Las Vegas, Nevada here at the Expo at World Market Center. This is a great time to be playing Yu-Gi-Oh! We are entering the top cut right now. And did you guys feel the energy after the, the top cut teams have been announced? Well, they're gonna have to redirect that energy into what matters most, winning the next few games. That's right, in one magic cylinder and out the other. This, again, is going to be single elimination moving on because we are in our top 16. And the top 16 is incredibly intense. Many of our competitors have been featured on our stage before, but some of them haven't. So that means there's a little bit of an advantage. You know, if you had those stage fright, that little bit of jitters being under the hot lights, some of your opponents may have already dueled in this format underneath those lights, and they're gonna be fine, where if you decline to feature match or if you didn't get a chance to be up there, you don't have that experience yet. But that doesn't usually matter because, again, it's the cards that are going to do the talking here. I'm really excited to see the teams that we have going, especially because it is a stacked bracket. Yeah, a lot of these well-recognized players and into our top 16. I mean, it just is going to be so wild to see all the stuff that we've got here because you know, it, it's one thing to just show up and happen to win and happen to make it to this far, but most of these duelists not only have been up at the top tables before, but we've got some ultimate duelist series championship, like people who went just from the quarter century celebration we had, and they just came right. over to Vegas. Yeah, and I guess, what better way to spend your weekend? Playing more Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, yeah, yeah, you'd think that they got practice. enough of it. <laughs> that was practice for this event. Kind of weird calling the Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series as a practice, but that's what it is. Every previous tournament is just practice for the next one. That is true. You got to get that experience in. Even if a duel doesn't go your way, you're you're just learning for next time, right? You're learning true. maybe a different side deck pattern that you want to use. You're learning maybe a different combo you want to employ. We've seen some really cool heads up plays, but we're going to go take a look at the bracket now so we can see which teams are going against each other. So uh, in the top bracket, we have Supreme Pro versus Gavin's Mercenary. In the next lineup, we have This Is Too Long versus Amano Iwato. Casino After versus Zero Mortals Plan. Two dudes versus True Roof. These are the teams. For, and then in group two, we have the Jawari brothers versus Storm of Ragnarok. And then Squiddy versus another Ragnarok, Team Ragnarok. D-Boys versus Sebastian Wesley Todd. And Good at Yu-Gi-Oh! versus Fala Guerrera and the Disciples. It's quite some team names. You gotta wonder how they came up with half of those. But again, the most important part here is that we're gonna be going in and having a feature match too. Features, it's hard to pick any one of those, but we're gonna go to our stage right now to see which team we're going to be introducing. Thanks. We are just moments away from introducing the two teams that will be battling it out here in the top 16 of YCS Las Vegas 3v3. We have the blue side walking on stage right now. They'll probably recognize some of these duelists. We saw them last week and we've seen them in the feature match area before. Representing the blue side, we have Maximilian, Jeffrey, and Vladis. Good at Yu-Gi-Oh! We saw Jeffrey last week at the UUDS Championship, and his team is actually going to be battling against another player that we saw last week at the UUDS. For the red side, we have Paulo, Gabriel, and Michelle representing Fala Galera and the Disciples. And with that, we're going to send it back to the booth so we can get coverage of this top 16 feature match. Now again, for those of you at home wondering what the UUDS is, hey, don't worry, we still have the Quarter Century Celebration VOD that you can go ahead and watch on the official YouTube and Twitch channels for Yu-Gi-Oh! Again, the UUDS was the undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series, and so those duelists not only have had amazing tournament success before, but now they're going to be dueling it out right here for us, which is kind of a treat, gotta say. Now, looking to this upcoming matchup, guys, get out your scorecards. It's going to be Snake Eyes versus Snake High Fire King. Well, that's always been the question the entire time, during this entire event, which one's better? So let the results do the talking. Get your scorecards. I think Fire King's up a little bit, but we could see Snake Eyes pull all the way through because we know that one of the undefeated teams only Snake Eyes. Only Snake Eyes. Only and it's interesting, eyes. too, because on the Fire King build that we saw before, we also saw it using the Divine Temple, so the line between Fire King and Snake Eye build is kind of starting to blur. It's not so much that it's pure one or the other. It's like leaning a little heavier on one side and maybe leaning more on one side. But still, it's just really neat to see, again, Paolo here with his team. Just going to be a really good game. And hey, you know when your opponent is Maximilian? Man, that's a good name for Yu-Gi-Oh! Maximilian Pegasus? Just maybe. <laughs> Just that maybe. looks like an R. That's no P, but at the same time, man, it's going to be some good times. And they certainly are good at Yu-Gi-Oh! to make it this far. Now, what do you think is going through their head right now? Obviously, they've been here at these top tables, so it's not nerves. I think they just want to remain calm. I can see Jeff just keeping it all together. 
don't want the nerves get to you because if that happens, you could throw everything away. Everything that you work so hard for, not just for you, but also for your team. Now, don't worry, that's not an appeal up there. We do have our assistant head judges up there just for ease of access, just some great experience play up there. But again, it's it's gonna be wild to see how this match goes because again, this is the single elimination part. You could be a fan of each one of these players, but there can be only one team that walks out of this. There are no more draws anymore. Now, if you're fans of any of these players, keep your eyes glued to the screen and watch it through all the way through. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and certainly there are people at home who are just like, you're, you're totally wrong. The Fire King is the best deck. And the other people in the chat are like, no, it's the Snake Eyes. And other people are like, oh, no, I've got something that beats Fire. We'd love to see you at a future YCS. But right now, we are going to have to find out, you know, is it more about the Snake Eye advantage, all these tiny little monsters just swarming the board, or Fire Kings that are just bidding bigger monsters faster? Or is it the player? That's true, player. Because Player controls the entire deck, and uh, whoever that's more well-versed in their deck is likely to be the one that's going to come out on top. And I think that's probably one of the key things here. I think both of these decks, they're equally powerful. That's why we can see representation all across the board for both of these decks. No, you're right that I've never seen in my entire life of Yu-Gi-Oh! a deck win a tournament. Usually it is a duelist that wins a that's tournament, right. right? So you do have to have somebody behind the wheel there, and it probably is going to come down to that. And speaking of coming down to that, we've got game one of our first top 16 match. This match will be featuring Maximilian versus Paolo. Now in terms of their team record, eight wins, two losses, zero draws. And the other team, which is Paolo's team, the Disciples, we have eight wins, one loss, and one draw. Both players managed to squeak by, but it does mean technically Paolo's team has the numerical yeah. advantage there, nice. right? They would have had a little bit more points than Maximilian's there, but great sportsmanship being shown. Let's go, go ahead and draw up. Yeah. It is time to duel. Yeah, those points no longer matter at this stage in the game. That was how you got here, but how you move forward is okay. up to you. So 45 minute counter. Main phase. Main yep. phase. All right. Looks like we're going to start with Bonfire. Ooh, not the best start, because that's a very dangerous, you could run into a drone lockbird, could just end your turn. And this is a very big part of it. It could telegraph a lot about your hand. Certainly does. Obviously, you would maybe go straight into the Snake Eye Ash without risking this, because you would want to see the Snake Eye Poplar. But showing that you need to use the Bonfire to get Snake Eye Ash, uh, maybe you don't have anything else. And it even looks like we're going to summon the very same Ash without actually shuffling it into the hand. Well, lucky for Paolo there, I guess. And remember, this is the format I would like to call Interaction Awareness Month. Oh, I like that. Interaction Awareness yeah. Month. Is that because you really can't just like use the cards that activate from the hand just willy-nilly? You really need to concentrate? No. You have to focus on every interaction point that you can think. And there's just so many things. It's like going through a fog of war. You have to kind of feel your way through it, and hopefully you're not going to run into the, the big things that stop you. So we go into yep. the Ash. Ash into the Poplar. Poplar has now added the Field Spell, and we're going to continue, and we're going to put a... Snake Eye Monster into the Spell and Trap Zone. I've seen a mostly Flamberge be the target here, but perhaps we got a different combo in mind. It's possibly Oak. Oaking provide follow-up, and it's going to be Ash oh, instead. Ash to Ash, just there's to a, the follow-up, right, for next turn? There's a possibility that we're going to see both of those in the back row be sent away, yep. because Poplar has not been put into the grave, but that's going to re-send or put back another Fire Monster into the Spell and Trap Zone, probably used to pay another cost. Well, there's the Flamberge Dragon. I'll be right. Paolo just taking a moment to consider his moves. Maximilian doesn't have any responses so far. Perhaps he's holding on to a Nibiru. So when someone doesn't do anything, I think they just are holding back. They have to hold back because key timing is very important. You don't want to use your interactions too soon, and it requires uh, some level of yep. patience to just not go trigger happy on those cards. Oh, absolutely. We saw incredible patience last weekend, you know, holding on to an infinite permanence okay. for as long as Jesse yep. Cotton did. Really set a great example for this entire format. You can't just activate a card just because its conditions have been met. You need to wait to stop a card that actually is going to do something against you. And it's still possible that maybe there's a Nibiru right now. But now the Flamberge has been yep. used and we're going to continue moving on. We have the IP Mask right now being Link Summon and the Flamber Summoning back to two. And we go to Link Rebo, for continuing on with the Link Summoning. And that's going to be Promethean Princess. The Star of Flames is definitely the monster of the hour. I've been saying it all yep. day, but it's true. It's just an incredible fire position. card here. Um, and looks like we're thinking for just a moment about what we're going to do next. Is this the point of interaction? Pass. We're going to special yep. summon back our Flamberge. And that's going to put the IP Mask Runner into the Spell and Trap Zone, ready for next turn to be resummoned out. 
Certainly a powerful option, letting you reuse the IP Mask Arena. Again, special summoning it from the Spell and Trap Zone because Flamberge is just that good. And speaking of that good, it's time for Wanted, Seeker of Sinful Spoils. Let's put up that poster and grab the Dia Bell Star from the deck. Very interesting timing. I think that was pretty smart. Just in case he did run into a Drone Lockbird, he could chain this card to add the card into hand. Just, just in the nick of time. Luckily, it seems like nothing's going against Paolo here, so if you're cheering for him, this is nothing but sunshine coming his way. But looks like we're going to go ahead and link off and Bestower of Flames and the Stake Eye Ash of the Graveyard. It has to be a Fire Link monster, probably an Amblo Whale. That has been or the we're going Swarm Ship. Or we're going down. So there's always going to be that two direction, and we're going to attempt to retrieve a couple of cards here. Are we, are we going to retrieve this turn, or is it going to be the next turn? Well, I mean, either way, you're definitely going to get that effect, whether Flamberge is bringing out the IP Masquerade into the same zone, or if you decide you're going to get another level one on the field and maybe tribute it off for Link Karibo. Uh, it was going sure. to be a Diabell Star. Diabell Star effect, and that's going to put another Wanted. Now, that's Secret interesting. Is that telegraph that the original Simple Spoils might be in the hand then? Do we choose to play it now? That's the question. We are it going to play like it we now. Are. We're going to send it away. Yep. Now this has got to be where you put the fire monster behind Sunlight Wolf in order to get its powerful effect to add something. Mm -hmm. Absolutely doing so with Snake um, Eye Birch. Okay, so chain link one, chain link two. There's two chain links here. One, two, three. And the three. Sure. You do the chain link three of the Link Karibo. You gotta do it. Special. Make sure that that monster is and safe. Sort of block out any enemy okay. interference. No. Okay, so Interesting right question, here. by the way. It doesn't target. Mm -hmm. I wonder if that spoke about Ghost Spell and Haunted Mansion, although I feel like I would have seen that by now from Maximilian Doesn't if he was going to discard it. Mm -hmm. yep. And now we're going to activate the, the wanted uh, Secret Sinful Spoil to put back so a drawing, spell card so to draw wanted. an additional so. card. This is just so much draw yeah, power. I mean, it really so is. So much surge power, draw power, everything does something out of the deck. It feels like all these spell cards, all they are, are monster replacements. They kind of are. I mean, it does give you a basic a proxy for an additional monster card there. And speaking of additional That's monster cards, we're going to get Decode Talker Heat Soul to pay 1,000 yeah. life points and draw an additional card. All right. So that's going to be another card likely on the draw phase of Maximilian as well. It's such a good card. It's a pot of greed monster, but we're going to put that away into the graveyard. I think now might be the point where we, the Amble Whale would come out. Instead, they're going to go away the Appaloosa. Two, right? Seems like yeah. the play have shifted now. Just a little bit. That's going to be a two material Appaloosa. Not necessarily the strongest it could be, but gives you two ample anti-monster negation effects. And you're still going to be able to see the IP Mask Arena brought up by the Flamberge so Dragon, the which means once that Appaloosa is done using its effects, it can be used as a link material to kind of keep the game going. I mean, I think all of these players that made it to the top, they are, they are respecting against Super Poly. You don't want to play into the Super Poly. It's very dangerous if you leave two fire monsters on the field. But here we have Maximilian playing with the Fire King Snake Eye. Fire King's certainly going to have a different combos of play to get in the game. Uh, looking at the current field, we have the field spell. We have uh, also the Flamberge, and there's also the two negates that can come from the 1600 attack Appaloosa. There's a lot. <laughs> there's a lot on the field, but not to mention there's also stuff in the graveyard. Don't forget the Promethean Princess is also in the graveyard. And we're going to start off with Bonfire as well. Does Paolo have the out to counter this? Or are they going to wait? Okay. Well, it can't leave the okay. Apollo Usa, Boa the Gata. She is great, but she does not stop spell and trap effects. So you're right, those bonfires being used to get monster cards, and that's not something she can stop. Paolo wringing his hands, trying to figure out what he wants to do. But looks like we're going to go ahead and just let that resolve and add a new card. Now, Paolo, I think all of the players at the top cut, they do not express emotion in-game. They just like to keep their cool. No. Certainly do have to. Again, your teammates no, are there to keep you up, but your opponent can see they if you need support. So if everybody's trying to cheer you on, it just tells your opponent, hey, he might be a little nervous. This is still like a really good position for Paolo. I mean, there was no real disruption. You have to play into it, and you need a significant amount of engine to push through any of the fireboards. Absolutely. The bonfire is a great start, but we need to see something next. Again, uh, it's going to be two monster negates. Oh, interesting. <laughs> And that's going to hit by a crossout. I love crossout. Cross oh, it's so good. Crossout designator is certainly a controversial card, but with so much of the format running these powerful staple cards, just like Nibiru the Primal Being or Triple Tactics Talent, stuff that you expect to see in a lot of different duels, you can go ahead and employ that yourself and banish it to negate it. And speaking about employing things, Gabriel is doing a great job representing his team, getting that first victory in the two out of three set that he's playing against Jeff Jones. A very, very tough position. 
And now we're going to be activating one, a very mirror-esque play on Maximilian's side. Well, they certainly both know it's good. They wouldn't have gotten here otherwise. But we are going to go ahead and get into the deck there again. If you're noticing a certain commonality here, Dia Bellstar is going to be coming to the field just like she did for the opposite side on Paolo's board. But what are we going to be shedding here in order to get rid of Dia Bellstar? Obviously, with no cards in the field, you'd be have to send something from the hand. Well, it's still dangerous. Now, we're going to send a Poplar. This is a wonderful play because you can go Chain Link 1 and do a Chain Link 2 to block away the Appaloosa from negating the Dia Bellstar. Free hand, right? So essentially, you're just losing the ability to pay costs so with that Poplar, if anything. Right. If you negate yeah. it, but it's still worth it because there's a lot of things that do require face-up cards. Card management is key. It really is. Now, speaking of Interaction Awareness Month, Paolo considering what he's going to do, counting that Maximilian has three cards in hand. So it looks like the Chain Link 3 is going to be the Divine Temple of the Snake Eye advancing the IP Masquerina. And we're going to go ahead and discard Ghost Mortar and Moonlit Chill. Oh, so right now only the Diviner has been used, and the crazy part is that that Flambear Dragon can take your opponent's Spell and Trap Monster and summon it back to their own field and just take it away. Certainly would be wild to go ahead and grab that. It used to be our turn, now it's our monsters. I think this is really, really well played by Paolo. Paolo being able to stop the Dia Bell start, not being able to retrieve another card, setting it onto field, blocking access to the original Sinful Spoil Snake Eye. That puts Maximilian really, really behind. And you can't even get the additional draw with the Wanted because you don't have another Sinful Spoil Spell, tra spell Trap card in the graveyard. Fortunately, it did not get there because Ghost, Mourner, and Moonlit Chill was able to stop the Dia Bell Star. A nice way to creatively get around that without the chain block being any relevant. We're going to activate the IP Mask Arena, performing the Link Summon during the opponent's turn, this main phase. And luckily, we're looking at SP Little Knight, of course. Does one let of the us get that Banish. One, the Banish, two, the additional three. interaction, really just clearing out whatever Maxillion has. Locating the Banishment correctly there. Uh, but this is great. Oh, and since Slam Flamberge left the field, uh, yeah. Slamberge, right? He does feel like Slamberge since he's dropped yeah, him down the tables there. But we are going to see two <laughs> level one monsters be special. Something's going to be Poplar uh, and Ash. That's so many faults. That's the most dangerous part. You extinguish the big flame, and then two little embers come out onto the field. And that's going to be the Ash and the Poplar. Ghost Mortar and Moonlit the Chill is Mortar. such a cool card. Again, uh, yeah. all these different, you know, great zombie tuners of a certain, you know, zero attack, 1800 defense have revolutionized the game. But the fact that this one also does effect damage is incredible. It's a very good card to be using yes. right now. And uh, the monster did get removed from the field, so that's going to be about 2,500 damage. That's a lot. That really is. And it shows you that, like, there's just so many different types of cards you can use. You don't have to just rely on your favorites. You explore some yep. new stuff, too, and get some great results. I would. <laughs> How many cards left in Maximilian's hands at the moment? I don't think there's that many. Oh, I don't well, think all so. All the cards were unable to retrieve additional cards, and now we have Fire King Fire Island. King, thinking Are we going to destroy a card to search a Fire King monster? I mean, yeah, desperation the, does happen sometimes. That's the that's only option left if we're pushing it. Oh, it seems like Michelle has one at table C. One, was it, one point up at the moment. So it means the pressure's on. Paolo, his disciples are doing very well. Paolo's still yet to close out one of these duels, but again, Gabriel and Michelle both closing out one each. Now, again, that's still two out of three, so the blue team still has a chance there on both of those sets. But if it's anything like this table, oh, their nays may be numbered. I mean, if Paolo takes this one, the entire team will be one game up. That's a significant advantage. Certainly is. It means that either of Paolo's disciples would just need to close one more out, and that would be it. So now we're going to get the destruction of the Kirin. I believe that's from the Fire King Island. So who is two, sorry? This is two. Okay. Taking a second just to make sure that the Kirin is chain link two. Okay, so I will. Abuza. And I guess that's it. Yes, that's it. I think that's the in all the interactions so far. And we're going to see the special summon of the Sacred Fire King Garunix. Sacred Fire King Garunix effect. Certainly a powerful set of cards, right? Destroy and then summon, summon and then destroy. I wonder if that SP Little Knight is going to take action here and just remove the monster. Just in case there is perhaps a rank 8 Xyz monster in there that could potentially just wipe the entire field. I don't think we've seen any that. Xyz summons from Fire Kings the whole weekend. Yeah. But it looks like we won't. SP Little Knight's going to go ahead yeah, and dash. I, I that's all Maximilian that needed to say. 
crossed out. <laughs> it is very dangerous. That cross out being probably yeah, the saying. key factor yeah, that secured the game. Getting hit by a triple tactics talent against the opponent, you know that you're more or less in the Snake Eye mirror-esque match. We have Fire King Snake Eye, regular Snake Eye. You share a lot of cards that can start up the opponent, and with just such dangerous cards like Heat of the Fire Charmer, Ablaze, being able to take your cards, or even Dark the Dark Charmer, Gloomy, taking perhaps your Bla uh, Black Witch, that just sets everything up for you, and you have to keep them. At Those are additional things that you have to shut out just in case, even if you use, say, a Nibiru, these are still the dangers that still loom. Now, we've seen that really the only safe attributes in the graveyard right now, it seems like, are Earth, Wind, and Light. But at the same time, we even saw Alina the Light Charmer this tournament, too, because the Voiceless Voice yes. strategy taking advantage of those effect failures. So your graveyard has never been more in peril. It seems like maybe Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion might be a little bit more of a premium card than people are putting a rating on it. Yeah, I think Ghost Bell is a wonderful card, being able to turn off like just so many different things. You can stop the Voiceless Voice matchup from the low, coming back, if you can secure the correct chain link. But I think mainly you can use this to stop uh, like the major plays of like Flamber Dragon, Summoning 2. Summoning 2 is just like, so significant. It's, it's too insane. many monsters. It's a great card that gets even better with the embers on the field, as you said. Once that flame is extinguished, well, it's not over. But yes, Crossout Designator really being the deciding card. Even Maximilian took a moment to just say, oh man, that Crossout Designator. Yeah. Anybody who doesn't think that's a good card, just try it. Just see how it feels, and you will understand its power quite quickly. Yeah, especially in a format where so many cards overlap, we're talking about not just about disruptions from the hand being negated here. Oh, we play the same ones. We're talking about main deck cards getting hit. Oh, yeah. Triple Tactics Talent, a very popular choice throughout the weekend. We've seen how just game deciding it can be, but it didn't decide any games because Crossout Designator just said, uh uh, we don't do that here. Yeah, we've seen the Crossout also being used for the Fun Bears Dragon when it attempts to summon out two. And this is mainly for the pure Snake Eye variant, which plays multiple Fun Bears Dragon and uh, being able to banish one without suffering the consequence of not having another copy, you know, that's one of the advantages that they have. So it's always that debate, like, how do I play additional Snake Eye and just get rid of the Fire King so I can have options like these? Because these are not options available at the moment, unless you want to really amp up the number of cards in your deck and play pretty muddy. <laughs> oh, absolutely. And it's one of those things, too. Notice how quickly they are ready to jump into their next game. They barely spend any time side decking there. At this point in the tournament, you've seen it all. You know what's going on. In fact, you might have even played some of these players, although with a loss record on either side of only about two or one here in there. They may not have run into each other exactly, right? These are the tournament results that have been the best. But speaking of tournament results, we're going into game two of our top 16 featured match between these two teams. Now, for the entire team score, so what we know oh, okay. so far, uh, Paulo's team has one game each. Right. Well, Paulo's disciples are definitely proving their point. They have been trained quite well. Very, very strong player. Dealing with any problems, so I always try to. And they are about to begin. I believe Maximilian has no reason not to go first. I would imagine you want to get set up before any of that Snake Eye shenanigans happens. That's probably one of the safest positions against a Snake Eye deck is to just get there before they do. And we're going to normal summon out Snake Eye's Poplar. I wonder why this one has Snake Eyes rather than just Snake Eye. Well, I mean, it does just have the one eye. <laughs> yeah, that's the that's a slight name difference. And names are really key here. You gotta be very careful, especially when it comes to Fire King monsters. Oh, absolutely. We have heard, like I heard from Joe talking earlier, those horror stories of people running Fire King Avatar Garudix. Yeah, that's a uh, that's not the that's high not the one they want. That is the uh, baby chicken. <laughs> no, no, you need heaven on high, not just the regular stuff. But you, you need the sacred one, really. Speaking <laughs> to of be sacred, honest. we're gonna go ahead and activate the original Simple Spoil Snake Eye. But oh, even if the Poplar hits the graveyard, Ash Blossom and Joyous Spring joins it. And cross out <laughs> designator counter playing that Ash Blossom. You know, you can hit me once, but I'm gonna hit back with the same card. Look at the smile on Paolo's face. He understands. He cross out designated. Some but he knows how good the card is. You can never count your opponent out. They are just as good as you did. They did just as much homework, and they know cross the designator works too. Here's an interesting thing right now on Paulo's side. He activated two cards, both of which failed to resolve. That is significant. With three cards left in the hand, 
Maximilian just needs to build his field. He absolutely wait, wait, does. Hold on, that is a regular Kirin. It is. It's the one you don't want to see. And that's so funny. I mean, Fire King Avatar Kirin, a great card, sending the extra fire monster to the graveyard. But again, just be very careful when you fail at your deck list. We don't want to have any errors on that. But if you do put this card into your deck, just be very careful. Make, take, oh no. This is the Branded okay. Chimera Classic. Both the uh, crossout designator and then also get hit by triple tactics. You tried to do it to me, and I'm doing it back. So, oh. we're going to go ahead and use the Forceful Sentry style effect that is looking at your opponent's hand and returning one card from the hand back to the deck. Now, looking at what Paolo has, Paolo has a Bonfire and Ash and the Flambeur Dragon. The Flambeur Dragon likely staying in hand because it's really hard to get rid of if you don't have the proper setup. But looking at the Bonfire and the Snake Eye Ash, Paolo has options. But you can get rid of one of them, and that's going to be the Snake Eye's Ash. Certainly helps set things back, means you have to use the Bonfire to get the Ash, and there's a possible interruption that you could use there, whether you have another copy of Ash Blossom in your hand or not. But, but that knowledge is crucial. Yeah. If Maximilian can't maintain one disruption from hand or just something on the field that can turn off whatever that bonfire is going to bring out, the game is going to be secured. There's no, there's no options left. Certainly so. And you know you're safe from Nibiru. Now, speaking of being safe, of course, we have Maximilian and Paolo are fighting it out with Paolo having one point. But again, Jeffrey and Gabriel are now tied one duel apiece. And Lattice is still hanging in there against Michelle's first victory in their two out of three set. So we're going to continue with the Fire King lineup. We have the Sanctuary, we have the Island, we have the legendary Fire King Ponyx, we have the Sacred Grunix. This is just an all Fire King action here. Arvada has me not destroyed, it's in the graveyard as well. Arvada is such a game-defining card, right? We saw last week how Arvada really caused people to enter the battle phase really early, but looks like we're not at the battle phase just yet. We're going to go ahead and link summon here. We're going to go to the Hita. Hita is going to take the Ash. That's why Ash is a liability sometimes. What do you mean I'm a fire monster? I know, I know. Ash Blossom <laughs> and Joy Spring being fire just recommends those other attributes. Why don't you try a Ghost Bell and Haunted Mansion? And a welcome back, uh, Fire King Avatar Arvada. That's going to be able to negate whatever that the bonfire is going to add into hand. And now there's the Amblo Whale as well. That's a lot of follow-up for two cards remaining. That's going to be very difficult. Well, especially when will. we know the Flambridge in hand. That Flambridge is not going to be able to do anything. Now, the bonfire may not be able to stop by the Fire King Avatar Arvata, but again, it can destroy a fire monster in order to negate an activated monster effect. Paolo oh. activating that bonfire. That proves that, hey, maybe that other card he just got into hand might not be so great. We need to search out the option here. That's going to be the Arvata. Arvata searching into Ash. So with the Snake Eye Ash, though, the problem is if you summon... Oh, oh he there did we go. get there. So we happen to just draw the infinite impermanence, made it a lot easier. No longer have to worry about Arvada, which has, again, changed the way people play. And so here's Snake Eye Ash, uninterrupted. That's a normal summon, so the Promethean Princess will not be activating at this particular point. But there's still a lot of disruption. Let's not count Maximilian out just yet. Sure, the line, the first wall is down, but we're going to add a Poplar. Poplar is going to activate the summon itself. That's a special summon. Are we going to see the follow-up from the Promethean Princess, destroy cards, and just just really set things up here. Again, the Fire King Arvada is just so incredible. It was a card that was extremely powerful in Duel Links. This is the first time I got onto my radar, but still is showing how much longevity a lot of these cards have. That's why the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game so great. A card may be great now, but even better later. Okay, so we're going to special summon back the uh, Promethean Princess. We're going to destroy the Snake Eye Ash with the effect. Poplar is still resolving. I believe we got the original Sinful Spoil. And Bestower of Flames, that Promethean Princess, so important because, again, the first special summon you see, you're going to see a destroyed fire monster and a card on your opponent's side of the field. And then, hello, she's back. And here's why the Fire King line is so strong. So many monsters coming out. The Arvada was destroyed, so that summons back the Kirin. The Garunix activated. We're going to destroy the Kirin. We're putting everything back onto the field. And th remember, that Arvada has not used the effect yet. It will come back online. It absolutely will. So when it's special summon, it actually still can attempt to negate and destroy and so, cards. Yeah, and Paolo realizes that there's no other option but to concede this one. Save some time. We're going to move on to game three with Maximilian taking game number two. I, that's it shows you how strong the Fire Kings are because they are basically what carried the duel. There wasn't really a lot of Snake Eyes on Maximilian's That's side. Right. He could have just been playing a pure set of Fire King structure decks and probably had the same result. And it's so cool to see how well those cards work. But it's just so dangerous to 
get hit by all of those cards. I call it the Branded Chimera Special because Branded Chimera is known to rip apart people's hands, look at their hand, get rid of cards, and using the cross-out designated the triple tactics. Like, the, when you resolve both of those cards, you more or less have knowledge of what's gonna come up, what you need to take out, what you need to prepare, and that's just such a, a very difficult position to come out, even with the infinite impermanence. Oh, that's a great card to top deck to negate one of the negates. Definitely that's a hard not the card. enough. <laughs> that's not, not enough. enough. Definitely a harder the cards moment for Palo to have gotten that infinite impermanence off the top of the deck, but you're absolutely right about cross that designator. It's also great for thinning your deck down too and has some great synergy in certain strategies, like you said, Brandon Chimera being able to banish those cards that you can get easy access back to. So the card that more or less defeated Paolo, unfortunately, was the Ash Blossom. It functioned as an enabler for the triple tactics. It functioned as an additional monster for the heat that to summon back. Everything stemmed from that one wrong fire monster being at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, with, with words like that, it makes you almost envision a future where fire duelists don't play Ash Blossom and Joy of Spring. It's almost more of a liability than it helps. A lot of players from what I've talked to, from who I talked to, a lot of them take it out during game two and three. It's too much of a liability. They rather play different types of disruption, rather go into the Ghost Mourner. Being able to use effect failure esque effects such as the negations that are just on the monster that stays on the monster is crucial and it's better and you don't provide your opponent with additional cards to play with in your graveyard. No, it's incredible. You would almost think that those people who are running Soul Release, which has also been a popular strategy, you might almost Soul Release off your own Ash Blossom just to be safe, right? I want to take I would do it. I 100% cards. would do it. Just right, I just like, you know what? I didn't play this card. I'm just going to banish it and hide it under the carpet. Nobody saw that. There's no fire. Yeah, scene. there is no such card. What are you talking about? And I think the Soul Release is such an interesting point because People put in anti-spell fragments to counter the soul release, to counter the triple tie. But again, we've moved forward into, oh, we're gonna play summon limit instead. Oh, I guess I'll put soul release back into the deck then. It's so good. It is wild how all these duelists are chasing each other with all these great ideas, and, and any one of those cards are so powerful on their own. But complementing a deck like this, you know, it was one thing when we saw Voiceless Voice using Summon Limit, right? It's able to just get the two bodies on the board and then protect itself, but it also kind of tripped over its own feet. You don't necessarily see that as much when those cards are being used by the Fire King strategy because they can pivot on both turns. Now, it looks like one of the tables there are done. Yeah, they're just staring it down. You're absolutely right. So that is going to be Michelle's table. I think we're gonna have a score update shortly. But right now, let's focus on to game number three at table A. Oh, good sportsmanship. They know that things are kind of getting down to it because again, with one duel ending, that does mean that if this is decided the wrong way, that could be the end of their tournament journey. But still, it's no easy feat making it to the top 16 tables. No, so you absolutely should be proud of yourself for making it this far. Now, certain duelists won't take that on the chin. They're going to want to go all the way. But again, making it to the top 16 out of 571 teams is incredible. And speaking Ooh. of teams, looks like you were absolutely right. Michelle That's did take 2-0 against Vladis. So now it's just to a set of 1-1 matchups. And we could have a walk-off home run victory if Jeffrey or Gabriel finishes their duel. Now, Michelle, I believe, was playing voiceless voice. So that was quite, quite the surprise here. You're right, you're right. We did get to see some of the voiceless voice activity earlier on the broadcast, but right now it is all fire and fire services as we get Poplar, Ash on the field, and then activate that Divine Temple of Snake Eye. That field spell is so good. Even if you lose your copy of Flying Bear Dragon and you still have a monster in the spell and trap zone, you can still push it to the front row, and that's important. Fact. Yep. Thinking about it, we're going to go ahead and just send Snake Eye Ash and the oak into the graveyard. Poplar still can be used as cost later on, so that's okay. Likely going to go into the Flambear's Dragon at this particular point, and there yeah. it is. Snake Eyes, Flambear's Dragon. Flamber Dragon, kind of an underestimated card once it first came out, but I'm so glad that Duelist have found out the power of this awesome monster. Now we're going to go ahead and possibly link summon into an IP Mask Arena, and then probably see Poplar and then Flamber. Yep. I'm surprised that people did not pick up, like, this card is going to be amazing right from the get-go. What? This card can push monsters away, summon their monster, and give me two monsters, and can be summoned for free? We're, we're, sign me up. <laughs> it also just has great numbers, too. We've seen where that 3,000 attack has really come into play, just edging out the battle damage against your opponent, whether the clock is running out or not. 
So we have pushed the Snake Eye Oak back into the Spell and Trap Zone. We have not really used the effect there, so that's the wonderful part. Even if we do get hit by a Nibiru, we do get the follow-up, we can push through, we can generate three monsters, and Promethean Princess will still occur. And with the IP Masquerina here, likely it's going to be put back into the Spell and Trap Zone later on after we link this one off. And we have the rock. Everyone's just throwing rocks at each other this weekend. Snake Eyes Flamebird Dragon may be strong, but it's not strong enough to stop the coming of Nibiru the Primal Being. So those monsters will be tributed to the graveyard. We'll go ahead and get a token out here. Token has been special summoned into column number two in defense position. However, that is a special summon on your opponent's side, and that's going to allow the nice. Divine Temple of the Snake Eyes to special summon back the nice. Snake Eyes Oak. And the Oak has not used the effect, so we're going to get back a level one fire monster from the graveyard this time. Oh. Never mind. Oh. Counterplayed by the Ghost Bell. As you mentioned, the Ghost Bell is really, really good. The it's been so strong, and it's not a liability because its attribute is not fire, it's, it's not dark. You don't even have to worry about those light of live of the Light Charmers. Now, Apollo has to stop and think for a second here. This is why Nibiru is strong. Nibiru alone, this could have been an easy out for Apollo. However, combined with the Ghost Bell now, now we're short a couple of monsters. It does remind you that no single card has been stopping the pace of these duels, but two put in combination together really has. The Ghost Bell's been great, but it seems like there's no interaction here. This bonfire is going to go ahead and resolve, grabbing another Snake Eye Birch. Birch is going to be the follow here. Perfect time. This is why the pure Snake Eye is so strong, because you can just keep on summoning more. Special. Now you have enough monsters once again. Now you play through both of them now. Birch's effect is going to activate there. And take a look at the extra deck just for a moment to see. I think we're just calculating how we're just going to end up bringing back uh, some of the Flambeur's Dragon in the graveyard. And not just that, we're going to go into Phoenix. Yep. How interesting, just to Remember, go ahead and get that, get rid of it, okay. We need to get rid of that token, because that token is not an effect monster. For Promethean Princess, you need effect monsters, so you gotta kinda cycle your way through to the correct recipe here. We're gonna bring back the Oak. Effect. And you're using Oak's effect. We're gonna summon back another monster. I believe there could be a second copy of Flambridge onto the field. Most of the cards have already activated, so I don't see the value of just reducing your monsters. So second Flambridge is coming down onto the field. Flamebird is definitely going to help right now, pushing Nibiru into the back row, but also giving a fire monster to be on the field to destroy, yeah. since you have the Promethean Princess Pastora Flames in the graveyard. That's what makes it so lethal, but it doesn't look like we're going to push back the Nibiru. 3,000 is nothing to worry about, right? The Rock has already come down, so we're going to go ahead and put the IP Masquerina for a follow-up play by placing it in the Spell and Trap Zone. Apollo in a little bit of a tight position. He needs maybe some of the side deck cards to maybe buy the turn back or proceed to set one, maybe even set two. We're going to actually deck, deck lockdown. lockdown. <laughs> oh, they that. both smile. It's like they can hear us react to that. But it's incredible to see deck lockdown. I don't think I've seen that in quite some time. So we're not going to be able to add cards from the deck to them, nor special summon the cards from the deck to the field. That is deck lockdown. That is the Paolo special, I would like to call it. And then, like oh. I said, <laughs> oh. even if he was able to cosmic cyclone, nothing was going to happen. It looks like Maximilian maybe could see the duel with a handshake. Pop summon, and you have to. Oh this. no, I that actually secures it. Draw, the draw, yes. the cards yes. have been revealed. Yeah. Paolo takes well, game number three. That's that. so incredible. That. Deck like, lockdown. No, but that does kind of put yeah. on the radar for future opponents. The deck lockdown could be something that he slots into. Well, a lot of people are on Cosmic Cyclone. Unfortunately, that was not enough for Maxima. He did have the Cosmic Cyclone. It was not the out for this particular case. Congratulations to our match winner at Table A, Paulo. And we still do have some duels in progress. Probably going to go down to the middle table. But hold on. Oh, no. That would that be the actual would be two or three. It. You're right. That yeah. is the score. We remember. We're there. Everybody's Shout packing the their cards. Oh, yeah. This is it. The team carried through. I mean, they had such a significant advantage when every single teammate on Paolo's side took the first game. Significant advantage aside, deck lockdown. Just an incredible card. And it shows you that, again, we talked about this even earlier in this match. So many cards, like Soul Release, like Deck Lockdown, like Summon Limit, Anti-Spell Fragrance, they do get to come back. And again, that's what makes this game so great, because you can just like look at the entirety of the Yu-Gi-Oh! database and decide, Oh my goodness, no one has looked at this card in years. This is the tech. This is the secret stuff. I was quite surprised. I did see a little bit of deck lockdown during the Rescue Ace format where people 
blocked out the summon from the emergency, ah, stuff like that. Yeah. We have seen some of that, but definitely not in the Snake Eye format just yet. Just incredible, absolutely. And again, it, it's so cool to see those cards show up on the table. It, it's not something that just us casters are doing like fake hype before. You saw those duelists, they were excited about it too. And so it's neat to see that there's just so many great cards. But we will have an interview coming up. I would love to hear from those duelists because I want to know what they thought when they got to see it too.
Welcome back to YCS Las Vegas. We're here after our top 16 feature match in the 3v3 YCS. I'm with the winners of our feature match, Team Fala, Galera, and the Disciples. Paulo, did dueling another decorated duelist like Maximilian change the way that you play? Um, not really. Uh, I feel like sometimes people get super nervous on stream, which is normal. But like, I'm used to it, he's used to it. So I feel like that didn't change much this time. I feel like sometimes it does, but not this time. Awesome. Gabriel, what stood out in your match against Jeffrey? We weren't able to tune into that one. Uh, yeah, it was a very interesting match. Because, like, just a hand trap war, kind of how the this far mirror matches go. A lot of, uh, everyone that went first won, so I was fortunate to have won the die roll and drop a good hand. So, yeah. Awesome. And, Michelle, we see that you brought a voiceless voice strategy this weekend, a little bit different than some of these fire decks. Are there any decks that you hope to play against now that you're going into the top eight? I prefer to play against fire decks, to be honest, like no crazy decks. Yeah, making it this far with Voiceless Voice, you must really look forward to yeah. those fire matchups. And finally, Paulo, what do you feel like your chances are now that you've made it all the way into the top eight this weekend? I feel like I'm pretty good. Uh, we are, like, really focused. Um, and I feel like we're feeling pretty well. Pretty good. All right, fantastic. Congratulations with the top 16 victory. Good luck in the top eight. And we'll send it back to the booth. Thank you. Cheers, thank you. Just incredible, man. Yeah, absolutely. And going to top eight, you're going to have a little bit of extra time, 10 extra minutes for those rounds. Makes it a whole lot of difference. Definitely does. Still have to keep up a reasonable pace of play, but it just means that if the duel drags out longer, you're not necessarily worried about the guillotine that is that clock. But again, just some incredible play. Notice they didn't hype up the deck lockdown. They're hoping that nobody watched the broadcast and saw that. That was insane, though, dude. Yeah, I think it's just a... Uh, Call back from the past. You know, deck Lockdown is one of the scary cards. It is functioning much like a floodgate, locking people out from getting access. And right now we're looking at the Snake Eye cards, just directly searching out cards, summoning straight from the deck, locking it out, just turns everything off. It's not even about summon limit anymore. You just don't even have access to the deck. A lot of great ways to get into the game. Just incredible to see how many people are doing so many different things. And speaking of the different things you can do, our public events brackets here are ongoing, and they really hold these at all our different YCSs. Again, 2024 regional qualifier events are also happening. 16 duelist flights, one person gets their invite. We also have Yu-Gi-Oh! Day tournaments. We have Yu-Gi-Oh! Duel Links tournaments, Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel tournaments. That's right, you can play the digital versions of the trading card game here to win fa fabulous physical real-life prizes, as well as rivalry of Warlord tournaments where you don't even have to bring a deck. We will provide one for you, but make sure you give it back to us. Now, don't go away just yet. We still have to crown the winning team for the Team YCS Las Vegas. So we have top eight coming up very soon, so don't go away.
There's a lot more on the line than you line than usual. New themes, new strategy. There are so many awesome decks and duelists who made it. One more piece. The crowd is chanting. One more piece. That's it. That's it. That's, that's it. the handshake. That's right, it's 2023, and we're here with our first live stream Hello in North America. Hello, and welcome everyone to Las Vegas Club Convention Center. Indianapolis, Indiana. He's tearing him apart, unless he has... Ooh. Ah, the trap card. Oh, he has a starter, too. I mean, he has Nibiru. He has Nibiru. Oh, it's that not over was what yet. he needed. It's not over yet. Wow. So we're going to show up for the next round, and we're just going to do what we did again. Wow. Crowd goes insane. Another red. Another copy of red. Now that you don't see everything. That day. deck was one of the most difficult things I think I've ever done in Yu-Gi-Oh! history. This is clean. This is very clean. We got the other arm. And all five pieces have been assembled. Legs. Sorry. Sorry. The head. Legs. Legs. So the upside down. Legs. 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 Undefeated boost in the end for the public information. Was that the imprint call? I think it might have been. Well, yeah, wow. okay. We matched the one thing that Kevin did not have. This is going to open up the field a lot. You'll hear something like, it's so exciting to meet you. Fans may not understand that it's a big thrill for us to meet the fans. Oh, a Luber for Brad. If you're good, but Couch has Ash Lost of a joyous team. Look at what we have just seen today. A moment in Yu-Gi-Oh! history that will live on forever.
LJ Edwards, and I am the voice actor of Varys from Yu-Gi-Oh! Vrains. Oh, which, by the way, happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! trading card game. My, oh my, what a consolation prize. Now, why don't we celebrate or get digitized to dust? Or we could answer some questions. I, I think I'll do that instead. My favorite Yu-Gi-Oh! memory over the years would probably have to be... Yeah, when uh, Varys fought Gore in Season 1, um, I got to go in like four times and just kind of do sessions where I talk to myself. And it was great by dueling myself. Just me in a booth. Just me and my voices. And Darren and Joe. Um, the most iconic, most requested lines from the series that fans ask your character to say? Uh, probably this one. The fuel of the cosmos mixes with the boundaries of speed to transcend the beyond! I synchro summon Borolode Savage Dragon! How does it feel to have positively impacted and brought happiness to so many duelists around the world? I mean, it feels great! I think it feels amazing! I'm, I'm really grateful that that is the result of my voice acting in Yu-Gi-Oh! Uh, cheers! How has Yu-Gi-Oh! influenced your life and career? Well, I mean, my first ever voice acting session was with Yu-Gi-Oh! So I think I grew exponentially since that first day because they gave me a chance. So I'm very, very grateful and they shaped my career upwards. If you could be on any other of the Yu-Gi-Oh! series, which one would it be and why? I mean, I wish I could be in that that old one. What do you call it? The uh, OG, the, uh, the DM? Yeah, I wish I were in that, and uh, if I could choose a character, it would probably have to be Kaiba. I mean, who wouldn't want to be Kaiba? Everybody wants to be Kaiba. Everybody wants to yell, Blue Eyes, White Dragon! You know what I mean? It's... <laughs> Uh, and would you want to be the lead protagonist? Yeah, forget Kaiba. You don't need Kaiba. I want to be Yugi. Yes, I would want to be Yugi in DM. Even though I, I think Dan Green did such a good job, I would, I would just ruin it. But I would still want it. Life's short, you know what I mean? <laughs> Give me any protagonist. I would be grateful for anything. But uh, yeah, I hope, uh, I hope that was fun for everybody, and I'm so grateful to have been invited to this thing, and I hope you all have a wonderful stream, and uh, happy anniversary, Yu-Gi-Oh! TCG. I love you guys, and bye bye
welcome back everyone to yeah. Las Vegas for the Team YCS here in Atlanta. I'm back. The champ is here. <laughs> welcome back, in case Joe. you missed me, I'm really excited to be back here with Joe and we're already here at the top eight. So yeah, we've had a lot of fun and exciting matches thus far today. Heading into the top eight, we have a very fascinating matchup. Not necessarily because the decks aren't ones that we've seen before, but we're actually going to see the members of the team that won in Costa Rica last week divided up across the table competing against one another. Yeah, which is amazing, right? Not only did they win the last Team YCS just last weekend with very similar decks. I mean, there's some changes from a week to week because you kind of learn th some things throughout the tournament, but they've won a Team YCS before together too. They're not one-time champs, they're two-time champs, but now, Pack is on a different team, but they still have two members on the other team, Ruben and Kamal. We're gonna find out, is Pack the difference maker? Is he the one that was keeping the team together? Or is Kamal gonna show him like, man, you should have been on our team yet again. We could have been three time champs together. Let's There's a see. theme about these 3v3s, about teams trying to repeat back to back. We saw that with the team incorporating Dominic Ouch and Steven Silverman, of course, with different players each time. Now, instead of trying to repeat as a three of, we have packs divided up over two teams. It's really quite fascinating. Yeah, fun, funny they mentioned uh, Steven Silverman. So yeah, he was on that team that won the past two Team YCSs in Las Vegas with Couch. But this weekend, he didn't play in the main event. He just decided to play with some of his friends in the uh, Ultimate Time Wizard team tournament that we had going on. We played three different formats, and he's actually in the finals. But let's go ahead and take a look at the top 16 teams in the bracket we have here. So in the top eight, we have Supreme Pro going up against This Is Too Long. And then we also have Zero Mortals playing up against Two Dudes. And on the other side of the bracket, we have the Jahari Brothers versus Team Ragnarok. And then Sebastian Weasley Todd against Fala, Galera, and the Disciples. That's the team that we saw last round in the Future Match Arena. That is quite the stacked lineup we have here at Top 8, and only one of these teams is going to walk away with three Team YCS trophies and the copy of the Ultra Rare, another versus Glutonia. I really can't wait to see which team is going to win. Uh, one thing's not for certain certain yet. I think there's still a couple other decks floating around, but more than likely it's going to be a fire strategy. Surprise! Somewhere on a team there will be a fire strategy. The question is how exactly how many there will be and whether or not they'll be incorporating Fire Kings, Rescue Ace, or just Snake Eyes. And we're gonna have to find out, but I think Steven's there to introduce our teams for our top eight feature match. Take it away, darling. Thank you, and welcome back, Billy. But let's take a look at these incredible teams that we're about to have. They almost need no introduction again. Here comes Team Supreme Pro taking the stage. Holding up the A spot for Supreme Pro, it's Hansel. Then in the B, again, needing no introduction, it's Pakawat, known by his fans as Pac. And finally, it's Itapod, but you'll know him better as Sam in the C spot. Now again, just an incredible set of players here. And again, you're right, they are split between two different teams. So let's go ahead and take a look at their competitors as they take the stage. It's team, this is too long. Getting cheers from the crowd in the A spot, it's Ruben. Holding it down in the B spot, it is Kamal. And finally, their C anchor, it is Jose. Jose is taking that spot that Pac had last week, and now he's just moments away from being a Team YCS champion with two guys that have done it before. But on the other side, you know, Team Sam, a huge favorite from a lot of people out there. Pac is also incredible, and their third member, I just escaped me. Oh, of, of course, it's Hanze. If you're not familiar with Hanze, that's a two-time, well, he won the championship and an NAWCQ like 10 years ago, but you have to be familiar with that name. That is a good pickup. Hanze's an incredible last member to have on your team. I know he's someone that I've been friends with for over a decade. An incredible duelist, has won throughout the many uh, eras of Yu-Gi-Oh, showing you it's not about the decks that he's been playing, it's, it's the player sometimes. I actually spoke to Jose earlier. You commented on how instead of Pack, there's Jose on their team, and I spoke to Jose yesterday, and he commented, on how he's kind of feeling like he's in a bit of a lose-lose situation because if they struggle this weekend, who are they going to blame? <laughs> <laughs> that is a lose-lose situation. But we're going to find out who's going to win-win here in Top 8 at the Team YCS in Las Vegas. The first table we are going to feature is going to be two former teammates. It's going to be Pack against Kamal. These are incredible duelists who are no strangers to the tournament circuit scene here. They've competed in many YCSs, they've won multiple, and now only one of them is going to be able to advance on to the top four with their other teammates. So do you think there's a little bit of bad blood here between Pack and Kamal? Or do you think they're just going to be happy for, you know, a friend advancing? It looks like it's all seriousness on the faces of these players. 
I think PAC was planning to play with Sam because they played together the first time the PAC played in a YCS, a 3v3 YCS in Las Vegas. So they wanted to kind of repeat that history, which is why they committed to making themselves a team before knowing that they would actually be able to win or PAC with Kamal and Ruben win last week. So I think these decisions were just already made about the team divisions. And as a result, un unable to back to back with with Kamal and Ruben. Uh, yeah, so since the events were so close together, they probably yeah, did plan their teams out in advance. I wonder if Pac was like, oh man, maybe I should have swapped. But no, it's all about playing with your friends. It's, I mean, the end result is you want to win, but you also want to play with the people that are, you know, your best buds, the ones that you're going to be able to spend all day with and enjoy the tournament, whether you win or lose. Always a lot more fun to win, though. So we're going to have to see what is going to happen here. The die roll looks like all the players are rolling the, the decisive die roll to see who's going to go first. And now we're about to jump into the game to see the die roll. And it's going to be game number one here, top eight. There's some cards in Pax deck that I think are really unique, ones that we have yet to see this weekend. I'm not going to spoil them because they're so unique. But needless to say, he was well prepared for these fire-based strategies. Yeah, I can't wait to see some of these tech options that he's included that we haven't seen before. But it looks like we have a snake eye mirror match. Yeah, I think their whole team was playing the pure snake eye last weekend when they won the Team ICS in Costa Rica. All right, drawing the opening hands. Have those beautiful sleeves that all the teams had to change into. I do like those snake eye flame verge sleeves there on the extra deck from Kamal from one of the YCS Jays. Yeah, those are beautiful. Yeah, they also have a game mat that looks awesome. And Kamal starting off with snake eye ash, immediately met by Ash Blossom from Pack, Not even having to think about it. And it's going to stop him for the turn. Wow, Ash Blossom is not necessarily the best hand interaction against the Snake Eye strategy. But here it is sufficient enough to stop his turn. All right, Diabellstar is going to send Pop out of the graveyard and try to activate the effect. It's very shiny cards here from Pack. Everything, oh my oh, eyes, God. so many QC secret rares. How many in a row can he play? So far he's at three. All right, it's going to be met by infinite impermanence on the Diabellstar. That's what you want to hit so he doesn't have original. Uh, going your head. But Pack has Oak targeting the Poplar, met by another infinite impermanence here from Kamal. These players are just trading back and forth in their pace of play. I mean, Something to really marvel at. They've probably played against each other a million times. They know how they play. This is just another uh, practice round for them, essentially. And now it looks like Original is going to send Ash Blossom to summon Ash. And that's met by Effect Valor. But now Pac has oh, three monsters yes. on the field, so he's going to be able to still advance his strategy despite all the effect negation here. Well, Kamal opening Effect Veiler and two copies of Infinite Impermanence plus a Nash. If he was able to actually resolve his Ash uninterrupted, he would have been really pleased with the backup defensive cards you had at his disposal. That is very true. And it always feels bad when you uh, negate the Diabell Star effect, and then they just have the original as well. I yeah, things Ash not lining up Ash. really well. I said two paths, and you went Witch. I I imprinted. Enter Battle Freeze. Sure. Like Witch Attack. <laughs> Kamal was giving Probably them a quick rundown on everything that happened in his game so far. Oh, you at... Uh, 63. I'll attack with Oak and I'll attack with uh, Snake Eye Ash. That'll be another 17. So 34. That'll be 34 in total. That'll put you at 46. 46. Yep. Come on. This is great. Uh, main phase 2. Okay. The way these players are talking about the math, already, the only thing it's critical. There's going to be no mistakes if you're very decisive to make sure the life points are correct. Oh, yeah. Every time there's a change in life points, you want to be clear and have each other on the uh, same page. He's going to make IP Mask Arena that can go into an SP Little Knight here in yep. Kamal's turn. Yep. Kamal drawing two cards in hand, I believe. Bonfire's a good one. Sure. Bonfire's going to let him add a level one pyro from the deck to the hand. It's out of Maze of Millennia. Presumably that's the card that he drew for the turn? Uh, I think so. I think so. Because, yeah, otherwise he would have definitely used that with the uh, Ash to grab Poplar or yeah. something like that. But he's going to go and grab Poplar. Snake Eye Oak. No one's holding Snake Eye Oak effect. Target Ash. Thank you. If Pack doesn't have another... Oh, he does have an effect negation in hand, and it's a cool one. Sure. I thought about using that card before because of right, Effect Veiler, Imperm, there's another it's monster that can morning. negate effects, and it's Ghost Mortar and Moonlit Chill. Starlight Rare, of course. Nice of course. <laughs> Every card in his field is so shiny. And now he's going to go into SP to banish one of these two. That way it shuts off Kamal from being able to use his extra deck to go into a Link Monster. Effect of SP Little Knight, I'm going to be targeting your Oak to banish it. Yeah, this is an important one to banish, because if you banish the Ash, it can actually just be brought back to the hand or field with the Oak later on in the game. So by banishing the Oak, you kind of shut off access to it. Definitely. That's something very heads up. 
Every decision matters. It's very key to know all the interactions and what to go after to stop this very strong and powerful deck. I mean, as strong as the deck is, we're basically seeing like Standby. little monsters Game. battle each other. Effect of original, and I will target. But the pace of play is incredible. Okay. You can tell these players are practice at length the intricacies of the mirror match. And see, Pack, it didn't seem like he had a lot, but having the original Simple Spoils in the graveyard means that he can put back the Poplar and search his deck out for level one, which is just enough follow-up here. I have to be drawn on Lockbird on Resolution. All right, Kamal Thank does you. have a draw on Lockbird. Looks like a Collector's Rare. Resolves. All right, no one's going to be adding from the deck to the hand the rest of the turn. Kamal just sitting on a Snake Eye Ash, not where he wants to be. It looks like Kamal is checking out his teammates to see how their games are going. Interestingly enough, almost Kamal's up. graveyard doesn't actually have a fire or dark monster <laughs> currently. You know, you <laughs> almost always six. assume by this point of the game the Charmers would be yes. live, but in this case they're actually not. Indeed the case, so he's going to normal summon the Snake Eye Ash. No effect, thinks to draw Lockbird, yeah. links into Promethean Princess, Bestower the Flames, yeah. bring back Oak. Um, snake Eye Ash. Yeah. Oak's going to summon Snake Eye Ash. Effect of Oak, Sack and Salt, and Sack and Snake Eye Ash. And now it looks like he's going to go for Flame Bird. Sure, yep, there it is. Snake Eye Flame Bird's Dragon. And yep, Kamal has seen enough. I got game one. <laughs> they both make an announcement to their, each of their respective teams that Kamal lost game one, Pac wins game one, after a quick, quick pace of play there. Interesting. Would you like to know quite that abruptly the status of the other games when you're in the middle of playing? Like, maybe you were thinking through a difficult decision. Yeah. And one of your teammates is like, just lost. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm losing this game too. It could be a little bit of a, a damper on your game. I could see that, yeah. I mean, it just, I, that's something you probably want to establish with your team beforehand. Like, should we, like, give shout-outs during the game, or should we just, like, check in when we, when we need to know? <laughs> and I wouldn't mind knowing, oh, they're main decking Ghost Morning. That would be valuable information to share. But I don't know if I want to hear that my friend is lost. <laughs> Definitely not. But down one game, not quite out of yet. We're going to be going into a game number two. I do like that their team name is This Is Too Long, but their pace of play is not not too long. They're playing very quickly. They know the matchups well. I mean, they played with each other last week and probably play test a ton for that event because like that was their first event in this format, right? It was last week. Phantom Nightmare is legal. Maze of Millennia is legal. So they probably practiced a lot for that tournament. So they're very used to playing against each other. And you can really tell based upon how quickly that game number one went. But you can kind of see here on the first table, it looks like Hanze is comboing off. Ruben with his hand face down. And I see it looks like a link summon for Appaloosa, maybe, Bow yeah. of the Goddess. Seems to be Appaloosa. It also looks like all the way on the C table that Sam is comboing up too. You can see Jose kind of there sitting there with his arms crossed. Yeah, definitely. So lots of play here from that side of the table, but it doesn't mean the other side's not out. Looks like Ruben is looking at his hand to try and go back. I mean, that doesn't look like it's the biggest of boards there on Hanze's side, but these are the guys we are featuring right now. It's Kamal and Pac, two of the best to ever do it. I mean, they've won multiple events and they're still on this hot streak of continuing to top tournaments and be contenders. And if you want to guess who's going to win a tournament at the start, Kamal or Pac, not a bad pick at the beginning. Peck seems to be the master of these unique types of YCS events. He has a remote dual YCS championship and two 3v3 YCS championships, going for a fourth this weekend. Kamal, on the other hand, very similar. He has had a personal single YCS, your kind of standard YCS victory, a remote YCS victory, 3v3 YCS victory, and now he's going for another, which I believe would actually give him five. Oh, wow, that would be incredible. Someone here is going to finish the story this weekend, or just, this could just be the beginning of their story, right? It sounds like their accomplishments are so enormous. They have so many things that they've won already, but this could just be the cusp where they're gonna win, they could be 10 time champions. I always used to make that joke when people were like, oh, what's it like to win four? I'm like, well, I think I should have won 10. Everyone could, you never know. Don't ever limit yourself on based on what everyone else is doing. You could be the next pack. <laughs> like, Pac was, Pac was uh, he's like a newer kind of player, right? He really only got into the competitive scene during like the COVID era, during the remote duels. As you mentioned, he won a remote duel YCS, and he's just been on fire ever since. I know he was first well, well known for his use of the Altergeist strategy, which is not too, too far back. Relatively recent in the grand scheme of things with Altergeist. They have actually seen some new, new support as well. Mm, yeah, definitely. Altergeist is a strategy that's always around. I know DZ, for all those fans out there, that's one of his favorite decks to use. All right, looks like our players are shuffled up and ready to jump into game number two here. Now, Kamala will be going first again. 
It didn't yep. work out for him quite in that first game, but we'll see how things work out here. Okay, good. Good luck. Good luck. All right. Friends now turned rivals going into game at number two. Yep. Let's see if Kamal can get off to a better start. He's going to yep. normal some Poplar. Not a bad start. Not Snake Eye Ash, but definitely can still get your engine going. Grabs original, so that would lead me to believe he doesn't have something like Diabell Star, because Poplar is able to add Snake Eye Speller Trap, so you can get original yeah. or Divine Temple of the Snake Eye. But the Diabell Star can only grab original. It looks like there's no draw on Lockbird, which is good too for Kamal. So, so far this is way better than what we saw in that opening game. Yeah. Yep, gonna link away into Link Karibo, pop out of this Felon Trap card zone. Thing on cost. Might want to send Link Karibo here, interesting. Good. Sending yeah. Link Karibo gives him protection for level one effects later on in the turn. Mm. Impact was holding an effect bailer, a Ghost Mourner, or an Infinite Impermanence. Smart stuff, but does end up sending the Poplar to get more bodies on the field. And there is that Ghost Mourner. Don't take any of his baits. You kill him anyways. There's nothing. The Kapak's able to play two games at once. And it's like... <laughs> One thing about Ghost Mourner, too, is it's an attribute that doesn't line up against the Charmers. <laughs> The ones they're using, yeah, that is pretty nice. It fits in pretty well. I do like Ghost Mourner a lot. Now it looks like a Link summon here with Snake Eye Ash and Link Karibo. You'll go through 7200. For SP yeah. Little Knight, that's yeah. not good. Yeah, that, I mean, it's, it's something, but this is not where Kamal wants to be down a game, that's for sure. Taking a little bit of damage, too, from Ghost Mourner. And we're only 10 minutes into this round, right? I just want to, I love the pace of play here. And he banished an Ash, so he's doing that so the players at home are aware. There's a couple reasons he does that. Number one, it shuts off access to Hida from Pack, and it also gives him a card to recycle through if he has Oak. Smart stuff, things to take note of, and then the Snake Eye Ash is going to be met by Infinite Impermanence. You don't want to leave it in the graveyard to necessarily let Flame Bird actually take it out of the graveyard and put it in a Spell and Trap card zone, too. So having it banished uh, is the safest yeah. place for you to actually put your Ash. It's like Populous is special. Uh, effective SP Alright, so Bonfire's gonna add Poplar, and now Kamal's gonna chain SP Little Knight to banish Snake Eye Ash Fact. and itself. Now there's a Ghost Mourner here from Kamal. I wonder if these guys play together. <laughs> Both on Ghost yeah, Mourner and Moonlit Chill to negate Poplar. That's fine. Okay. That was a trend that I think we really established early on in day one that players, after they've maxed out their effect bailers and infinite impermanences, one. would be going towards Ghost Mourner as an additional hand interruption for De monster effects. Definitely a good one. Now one for one, discarding the Biru, the primal being. Oak effect targets Snake Eye Ash. That's fine. And you just mentioned that Oak can summon from the Banish, and it's going to here. It's going to summon Snake Eye Ash to the field. This is in the middle column. Yeah. Okay. I just have to play around everything. The pack just said, I have to play around everything. <laughs> Seems like an evergreen statement. <laughs> Definitely. Now it looks like a Link summon uh, for Link Rebo. Poplar effect going to scale itself. Well, yeah, it did put it in the pendulum zone, yeah, so it is kind of like a skeleton, uh, but places itself in the spell and trap card zone. I was the name Crystal. I was actually going to say that crystallized because it reminds you of Crystal Beast. Uh, itself and yep. I'm just glad that when I accidentally said scale there, he actually put it in the pendulum zone. So, but it's not scaling; it is placing no, no. in the spell and trap card zone. We don't have any snake eye pendulum monsters yet. Yet. <laughs> Unless. <laughs> then you link away the Snake Eye Slaver's Dragon and another Snake Eye Monster for Nightmare Phoenix, which has risen in popularity in a lot of extra decks here for Snake Eyes. Thank you. Ooh, Ghost Bell. All these defensive options. Is it going to be enough to slow down Pack? Yeah, one in hand? Yeah. Sure. Thank you. Yeah. Unfortunately, Pack wasn't able to build a chain link with Flame Bird. He had to use it now simply as chain link one. So Ghost Spell shuts that off. So he can still go into Promethean um, Princess and then Amblo Whale at least. Fine. So that's the Bell Resolve. Promethean Princess? Yeah. Effect. He was definitely going to, yeah. for a combo, he was going to be able to do 7,000 damage 
don't think he's going to be able to get there now, so he's going to be focusing on what kind of disruption well, he can have uh, with Kamal, only uh, sitting on one card in hand. I was about to say, there's two options there. You can either go for Poplar or go for Link Kariba. We've seen a lot of players take Link Kariba out of the graveyard so that their oh, infinite um, permanence and effect failures can be used without resistance. Mm. Like 57 on my that would be kind of smart. Five. But it looks oh, like he's going to get in there for 5,700, leaving Kamal with 1,500 life points. This way, instead, he can poke it out of the Spell and Trap card for his own follow-up. But there's been some you know, differing plays in terms of what you're going to utilize with Flame Birch. Certainly, and what Pack has to keep in mind is that SP Little Knight is coming back to the field. So yes. Kamal not starting with an empty board. Important turn here considering his options. So he is fire locked because of the Promethean Princess. There's no HEDA access. What I should Hold on. So I have to commit to an action. Check. All right, so he's going to link summon away the princess and for summon great raging phoenix. Yeah, just get raging phoenix into you. rotation. Yep. And now. Oh uh, my oak got. Oh, yeah, you brought it yeah. back. SP Little Knight comes back. The Oak has already yep. been summoned back, and now it's gone. It's, yeah, it's in the graveyard yep. now, so it can't be returned yep. to the field. Very important interaction to understand with SP Little Knight. Does Pack not use the Emblow Whale? <laughs> or is it... I don't think so. <laughs> I was like, there's no, no way. way. <laughs> there's no way you go into Raging Phoenix over Emblow Whale. <laughs> Interesting. Well, that's something new. Oh, we got an update on the games. It looks like... Everyone on the blue side on the team was Pack, Hanze, and Sam won game one. Doesn't look like the Kamal's playing the the whale either. Interesting. There, it is hard to fit everything into the extra deck. You gotta make some concessions. It's interesting to see Nightmare Phoenix in the extra deck though. And not Amblo Whale. But it's got a lot of uses. Absolutely. But watching last week, it seemed like Amblo was an integral part of what this deck was trying to accomplish. I, I also agree, tend to agree with that. Next up, Divine Temple of the Snake Eye is going to place a Snake Eye monster from the deck or hand into the Spell and Trap card zone. There's only one player here, actually, in this particular matchup that's playing the Amblo Whale, and it's Jose. Shout out to you, Jose. You're the real one. He has, like, he has one for one draw. One yeah, they need to play Amblo. How else am I be like, ah, she blows. <laughs> it's one of my favorite extra deck monsters. <laughs> but if they've established like a turn one play that they're going for and it doesn't include Amblo well, I can see them cutting it from the list. So they just found a different board. If they're always going to want to leave Flame Bridge up on the field or something like that. Like, they're, all the, they're all playing pure Snake Eyes as well. Jose's the only one that's actually playing Fire Kings in his strategy. So they probably determined that it's an unnecessary piece to their puzzle based on the use of only the Snake Eye monsters and not the Fire Kings. Because they have access to cards like Borolode Savage Dragon, which differentiates their deck because they have access to Jet Synchron. Um, makes sense, makes sense. And now this... Is it Kamal considering some options? You can tell they're in like... An, that's, this is when the play you have to actually start really thinking because it's like you're doing your opening gambit and it's always like, you know these plays in and out, you can play them really quickly. But when you get into these interesting situations, that's where you have to take a moment to consider your options. But we see that beautiful heat of the Fire Charmer coming down. The pack of Watts Graveyard is going to be filled with differing targets. Plenty to choose from. Raging Phoenix doesn't have an on-field effect that will present any sort of disruption. I will declare Promethean Princess targeting Raging Phoenix and Hita. All right, so he's going to try and use Princess to destroy nice both of these monsters. Yeah. I'm thinking on where I want to put Yeah, obviously destroy both. I'm just thinking where I want to put I think I want it in the middle. Now, Hita's going to be able to resolve. Uh, chain Link 1, Chain Link 2, targeting O. Chain Link 3, targeting Divine Temple. Ooh, cross Ooh, out wow. Designator. Works really good to stop your opponent from preventing your turns, but in these mirror matches, it can be key to negate Important cards like Divine Temple the Snake Eye. That's interesting. I wonder if he yeah. had Ghost Bell in his own deck. He has it in the side deck, but not having it in the main deck would mean that the last turn he wasn't able to use Cross Out on <laughs> the Ghost Bell. So it's interesting to see that Kamal is elected to put that card into his deck against Snake Eyes, but Pac may not have made that decision himself. 
or he felt that it was just unnecessary to do so and he was comfortable enough utilizing it as a defensive guard, which we see here really comes into effect. So it looks like he searched in Ash with his Hida. When Hida's destroyed, you do get to have a search your deck for a fire monster. With a low enough defense. Yeah, of course. <laughs> and with all yeah. the Stake Eye monsters besides well, Flame Burst. Yeah. I got it. All right. Pack so just go goes straight to battle phase, right. takes uh, out Kamal's uh, last 1,500 points uh, of life points he had uh, remaining, and Pack is the winner. They are now up a game and only need to win one more game since both his teammates won a game. If they win one more game, they're moving on to top four. Mm. So it's up to Hanze and Sam now, or Jose and Ruben. They're gonna, Jose and Ruben have a lot of pressure. They're going to have to win games two and three, both of them, to keep their team alive. But it looks like Ruben is in the middle of comboing off here against Hanze after losing that game one. Can't really Hanze took down the hood. That means it's serious. He usually plays with the hood on. Yeah, interesting. I, I think I always seen with the hood up. I think it's, you know, one of those things where you really can tunnel vision into what's going on. You don't want to necessarily notice that there's a big crowd around you in the corner of your eyes when you play. I can definitely understand that, and it's brought him a lot of success in his career. Looks like there's a die on the field, so... Means, usually that means it's Apollosa. It's kind of a unique spot for Apollosa to be in. Or it could be Boral Lord Savage Dragon, maybe. Oh, yeah, probably a Savage. Well, yeah. There's nothing in the Spell and Trap card zone, I think, but it could be a Savage. It could be, because you can just send that away with original. Yep, exactly. I really love that use of Boral Lord Savage Dragon as well. Just finding other key ways to capitalize on monster effects that otherwise you wouldn't be able to. Yeah, it doesn't lose the ability to negate even if the monster that it brought back from the graveyard leaves the Spell and Trap card zone. Yep, just loses that attack boost. Not a big deal. Yes, we assume that die just represents the number of negations. Oh, the hood's back on. Things just got serious. Things just got real for Hanze. He's like, okay, wait, your board's actually pretty tough. Gotta throw the hood back on. Uh, does it look like they're going to game three there down on the end? I see them doing life points. No, the game is still going on. It doesn't look like Jose has anything on his field, though, just his full graveyard. He is drawing, so he is a, whatever is going on down there in table C, he is going to have an opportunity to respond to. Unfortunately, he is shaking his head here. And if Sam wins that game down there, what happens on player A, or with table A, is moot. Yeah, this team cannot lose another game. But now Hanze is up. It looks like he's actually being wanted. That's going to prompt Ruben to negate with Borolo, as we can only guess. And oh, <laughs> that's enough. The Wanted not resolves. It looks like Ruben is going to even out the series there at the first table. So Ruben only one game away from evening out the whole team uh, matchups. So it's really on Jose down there on table C to find a way to fight back here against Sam, even up their match one to one, and then take it down in game three. Oh, it looks like they're finalizing over there. Are they done? No, I mean, they might have just finished the game. It might be, these last two games might be going into game number three, unless the match is over. Nope, the match looks like it's over. They're riding on the match slip. Trying to, no, is he side, if he's side decking, then it's not over. Maybe it's a time extension. Maybe he's riding on the back of the slip. Because Hanze still looks like he's side decking, right? And they definitely wouldn't be doing that had they concluded the match. Yeah, it's, it's hard to gauge. <laughs> but we're here. We're having fun. It's the Team YCS Vegas. Thanks for watching all weekend with us at home. It's really exciting. I know you guys want to see who's going to win just as badly as we do. But it's been a lot of fun. These Team YCSs have a different kind of energy in the air. I mean, everyone wants to win a YCS. But when you're with your friends, it can be a little, a little more fun, a little more relaxed, I would say. But once you get to this point, it's all serious. Like, I thought maybe these two teams would be bantering back and forth. Nope. Just focused about their game. They're enemies this weekend. But yeah, it is one-to-one -one on table AC. Just, 
Yeah, this is also finished one to one. So yeah, we're going to game three in these last two matches as we thought. That's fantastic. I was, I was worried that the, this entire match across the board had already finished. And this is a matchup really of some of the titans of the game right now. So I was hoping to watch a little bit more of the gameplay. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to jump to table A or C, or presumably once one of them gets going, we'll be able to watch a little bit more of the action. I've really enjoyed watching the high level Snake Eye players navigate through. You learn something new every time you watch some of these players navigate some of these complicated decks. So being able to watch whether it's Ruben or Jose, Jose, or, or Sam, we'll be able to see a little bit more of that. Yeah, definitely. When they're learning those little interactions, like, yeah, it is easy to like learn your combos. Like, okay, I memorize what I do with Snake Eye Ash, but when the interruptions start coming, when they stop stopping you in certain spots or catching your opponent off guard where they think, oh, if he had this impermanence, he would have used it here. So I don't have to worry about it later on in my turn, but actually they're still holding the infinite permanence to get you. Like those little things can really add up. When we saw that last week at the uh, Undisputed Ultimate Duelist Series uh, Championship, like Jesse Cotton in one of his matches had a, had a face down spell or trap card. His opponent activates original in that same zone. No change. You would think if it's infinite permanence, he would change it to mm -hmm. negate the original, but he doesn't. Holds it later on to the turn of the very end and catches him off guard because it was infinite impermanence. Sometimes patience is key. Yeah, I remember watching that at home trying to think, was he trying to bait the infinite impermanence early by activating a card to make it so tempting? And I think that was also the other case. Yeah, on the other side, that was uh, there's so many outplays on both players' side. It's so cool. That's why Yu-Gi-Oh! is so amazing. But we are jumping into game three of one of these matches. Which one's it going to be? Hey. Hey, it's Hanze and Ruben. This is an important match. If Ruben wins, their team still has a chance. If Hanze wins, it's over, and they're moving on to top four. So we have a two-time North American World Championship qualifier victor versus a two-time 3v3 YCS victor. I think Ruben's from Florida, if I'm not mistaken, and Hanze from New York, two iconic Yu-Gi-Oh states. They've been rivals for years and years and years. Yeah, going back you know, 20, of year, 20 years, there's always been rivalries. Thinking about players like John Jensen from Florida. Oh. I mean, it's players. That's some YGO history oh, so right there. Like Anthony Alvarado, for example. Sure. Who's here this Who's weekend? actually here this weekend. He was competing in the 3v3 Ultimate Time Wizard Tournament. It was awesome to see some of the older players coming back to check out the Time Wizard events we have going on. All right. Now it looks like they're waiting on presumably us, but we're good to go. <laughs> You're eager, too. <laughs> there we go. Fist bumps. Let's start game three. Ruben doing the quick check of the hand to see what he has in terms of defensive options since Hanze is going to be starting. Ruben, Kamal and Pac both want to see their hands. What are we working with, guys? This is really going to be a battle of brain power because it's really Hanze with Pac viewing versus Ruben with Kamal viewing. Ooh, Hanse, he's got the We're nice QCRs as well. We'll shuffle when the deck needs to be randomized. Yeah, yeah. And before I draw yeah, yeah. anything. Before it needs to be randomized. So, I, I, like, I like that play, yeah. I like over, that. over. No, no, no. Oh, oh, yeah, no, yeah, I see, yeah, I see, yeah. I see, I see. Yeah, easy. Yeah. All right, so Wanted, and then what's next? Is it going to be Poplar? It looks like Snake Eyes Poplar. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. What's else? Now, this is, this is a little dangerous, because if you get the Divine Temple of the Snake Eyes with Poplar, it makes the effect negation on the Diabell Star much stronger because you can cut them off from getting to original. But in the Pure Snake Eye deck, not as strong, but against the Fire King Snake Eye deck, if they're playing Divine Temple and go that way, it can be a key choke point on uh, their strategy. As someone who's played that way multiple <laughs> times and gotten stopped on the Diabell Star. Because by doing the Poplar first, you're able to put it in the Spell and Trap Card Zone and then send it for the Diabell Star. But he's gonna send Jet Synchron from his hand instead. So Jet Synchron is a card that's basically always used in the pure Snake Eye strategies. We haven't seen it in the feature match arena all that often, but it is a card that pops up quite frequently in these strategies because you're able to combine the fact that it's a level one tuner with Diabell Star and go into Borlode Savage Dragon. Yeah. All right, here comes Divine Do I Temple. Need to keep this in deck? No, right? Sorry, not. Gets to place a Snake Eye card from his hand 
or a deck to the spell and trap card zone, and then if his yeah, opponent normal or special summons a monster, he can special summon one of those uh, monsters from the spell and trap card zone. Because it's such a weird line because of my hand. Because I don't want to, I don't want to like... Yeah, yeah, I see what you're saying. Um, it's interesting to hear them discuss this. Uh, no, you can level one. I think it's Ash. Okay, easy. I think it's Ash or O. Those are two good options, yeah. The big thing you can do with the temple by putting uh, one of the snake eyes in the spell and trap card zone is that you're setting it up to bring it back with flame bridge dragon later on in the turn. Why don't you use it from the spell and trap card zone, of yep. course. Don't uh, link away from the Karibu. Oh, good. I don't think I necessarily need to activate it here. Yeah, but see, this is where instead uh, of discarding the Jet yeah, Synchron, if you linked into the Link Kribo first okay. and then use Poplar effect, you can send the Poplar and you get to keep the Jet Synchron in your hand. But he might have wanted to get that Jet Synchron into the graveyard to get it in rotation I think we, for the turn. I think, do, I think you do that. You sack the Kribo, I believe, and something else. Yeah. And you try to bring back the Jet. Oh, so instead of using Jet's effect, they're yeah, actually talking about maybe yeah, going into and Oak. And, yeah, and if he does, if he does have it, I have. Yeah, what they're, they're trying to navigate to play around any sort of interaction that Ruben might, from, might have from hand. And he's been holding, if he has any interaction, he's been holding it dearly. Yeah, which either would mean he just has like one interaction where you have to save it for either your turn or for... to be able to stop something, maybe like an Imperm on the Borolid Savage. So if he has Nibiru, this would presumably be the point where he uses it on the effect of Borlet's okay. average before yeah. the Link Rebo. Uh, and that would be heads up why they put the Snake Eye Ash in the spell and trap card zone, because if he gets hit with an Nibiru, the Divine Temple is going to summon the Snake Eye Ash, and he's going to be able to get two more fire monsters onto the field, which is all you need with the Nibiru token to still make a pretty established board. You know, we've seen, maybe not as much in the feature match area this weekend, but watching these decks in general, the interactions between That's Oak and Jet Synchron, where Jet Synchron is banished, but here we can see Oak just special summoning from the graveyard, so you can actually still keep the Jet Synchron effect for later on. Kind of cool, but we see an interesting yeah. card here, unexpected, Beastial Magnemut. So the Magnemut's gonna actually banish that Link Karibo. That's huge! It oh, is. He can chain the Link Karibo to yeah. get on the field, but it's still... <laughs> it's still not going to allow him to have a Borload Savage negation. And then in addition to that, Magnemut uh, no, no, is gonna no, allow actually, him to search during the end phase if he wants to do so for Flame Birch Dragon. Yeah, yeah, easy. Uh, or another Bistial. At this point, I might even <laughs> maybe more Bistials. <laughs> this is cool. I hadn't seen Map, so it doesn't look like he is gonna chain the Link Kribo. But that means the Magnemut is still does in hand to be summoned next well, turn. Well, no. yeah. I'm surprised. He could have yeah. let it come out, then the Snake Eye Ash moves up from the Spell and Trap card zone. But oh, that's fun. Yeah. <laughs> Hansel's like, I'm pretty sure I'm gonna get to negate. And Ruben goes, no, it's Blue Eyes. <laughs> no, that is a blue eyes white dragon. That's a good one. Well, that's a very interesting interaction. I mean, Link Karibo is a pivotal part of these Snake Eye strategies. It's kind of, I would say it's under the radar, but this deck would be so much different if Link Karibo didn't exist. That is very true. It is probably one of the strongest Karibos. I would probably say the strongest at this point. I would tend to agree with you. And now, Hanze considering what his next move is going to be. I can't imagine that they considered a Bistial in all of their calculations. That might have been like the new, the new secret that they kept from Pack potentially, yeah. like the, the little edge in the tournament. I wouldn't have considered it. I was shocked when I no, saw it. Yeah. I have the deck list in front of me and it still surprised me. Anytime that I've seen the Bistials on a side deck, I've been assuming <laughs> that, okay, those are from Voiceless Voice. Uh, Theory and end of story. Maybe he just was like, I'm going to try something to catch him off guard. But we see five monsters on the field here for Hanze. Where does he go next with this? Does he play Formula Synchron? Oof. It's the Nibiru! Rock. It's the pair. You have to pair it with something, and even just pairing it with the Beastial Magnum to make it work like an effect failure to stop the Borrow Load from having the negate. That's huge. It is. Ruben, the man. Can't finish the story with rocks falling out of the sky. No, you cannot. But he still has the Divine Temple and the Snake Eye Ash, so the story not over here for Hanze, because I believe he normal summoned Poplar in the turn, so he'll he be, still be able to add Poplar special from hand and have the three monsters on the field and establish a board. But if they're not on stuff like Anvil Well, not as strong. So yeah, the Ash is special summoned. But you see every, like, they had to account for everything. Like, this was all, like, we, they had to, he, Hanze had to do it just exactly the way he did it to be in this position still. I think he definitely accounted for Nibiru. That's why they put Ash there earlier in the turn, so that it could be special summoned off the temple. Definitely. Certainly, I'm not sure about the Bistial in addition to that, though. Oh, There's yeah. other Bistials <laughs> live going forward. Yeah, yeah maybe, like, considering the Bistial being, like, an Imperm or a Veil or yeah. something like that, but not Magnemut, no. Now, what is he going to be able to do with this? He is going to add the Poplar. Is he going to summon it from the hand? 
He is not going to be able to add since that already happened this turn. But now he can link away uh, the token and a Snake Eye for IP Mascarena. IP Mascarena and Snake Eye Ash can go into Promethean Princess. Promethean Princess can bring back Snake Eye Flame Bird. She can place the IP into the Spell and Trap card zone. Yep, a pretty standard line of play from here. And of course, the Poplar has already been used this turn, so it can't go to the Spell and Trap card zone. Here comes the Flame Burge. And presumably IP will be going to the Spell and Trap card zone any moment. Oh, you could also, this would be a point where if you have another beast deal, like to go after the IP Masquerina when they try and <laughs> select it with Flame Birds. That's interesting. That would we're be wild. To, we're going to have to keep an eye on the beast deals in this format. Yeah, you go into the weekend and you were talking about your fire based strategy and you're like, oh, I couldn't beat them. They had two beast deals. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay, it doesn't look like he's going after IP. He's going to go after Snake Eye Ash. Interesting. Oh, because he's going to have... Oh, because they don't play Amblo. Oh, yeah, because he doesn't have another fire monster to link away the princess. And as long as the princess is on the field, he's not going to be able to push it up. See, that's another advantageous thing of playing the Fire King strategy. If you get in with the princess on your field, you can still destroy it with Kieran mm -hmm. and be able to special some of those non-fire um, monsters. But while the princess is on the field, he's locked into fire, so not going to go after IP Mascarina. Makes sense. I really like the best deals now that I'm watching well, some of these interactions a little bit more. The fact that IP and Link Karibo are such vital pieces to the puzzle. Maybe the best deals are the sufficient side deck choice. Definitely something interesting to keep an eye on. Uh, pop this effect in hand. And Ruben up starts with Snake Eye Ash to add Snake Eye's Poplar. Its effect's going to activate the special summon. That's going to be chained by Droll and Lockbird from Hanze. So he's not going to be able to add a spell and trap card. But not much in inter terms of interruption. He could use the Divine Temple to summon the Snake Eye Ash right now if he wants, but... Well, now he won't get the effect to search because he drolled. Nope, then there's no point in doing that, that's for sure. Things are looking... If Hanze doesn't have any other cars in hand, things are looking pretty good here for Ruben. I mean, he still has the Magnum, but that didn't go anywhere. <laughs> here it is! Beastial Magnum! See, that's also, people always like assume like, oh, it's all, we all figured it out, everyone's using the same deck. No, there's always innovation, always room to figure out these tech options that will make the difference between, oh, I made top cut or I'm going to the finals. And he'll also be able to resolve the Magnemite if he can get the Flame Bird Dragon into the graveyard this turn. Just add, oh, that is so cool. It's, a it's an interaction that, you know, if you've been playing the Bistils, you definitely know, but every now and again, you're playing against somebody who's at the, you go end phase effect, and you're like, you're under draw. You're like, and? I can add from the graveyard. And yeah, in Fire, I like the idea of that in Fire King too, because a lot of times you can use Sunlight Wolf to add back like a Kieran, and then you can use like the oh, Magma yeah. to add the Flame Burst Dragon, and then you have that whole play going. Interesting. All right, so he's going to link away Snake Eye Ash and Nibiru for Hita. The Fire Charmer Ablaze. Now Oak is going to be special summoned. He can choose to either revive the Ash to the field, which he's going to do, as opposed to add it to his hand. I'm pretty sure he wins this. Yeah. It's looking pretty good. I guess the only mistakes would be not to account for Flame Bird summoning Ash or any of his own monsters from the Spawn Trap Red Zone, and then putting Promethean Princess in the graveyard at an inopportune time. Mm, that is something he's going have to be weary of. He also has to worry about Flame Bird bringing back more fire monsters, so he's going to have to really cycle through a lot of fire monsters. Trigger Witch. So he's going to link away the Hida and Link Kribo for Dark, Dark Charmer Gloomy. Yeah. He's going to take the IP. Oh, no, okay. <laughs> Diabell Star, he still hasn't even set original yet. Gets to circumvent the uh, Droll and Lockbird since it just sets to the Spell and Trap card zone. It's impressive that Ruben's been able to do all this without ever getting access to the original. Zero. Thank you. We got it. You won the match. Oh, no. I'm going to kill you. I'm going to make Selene into a 
To Apple? Uh, Selene and to Savage and OTK. Yeah. yeah. Oh, mm -hmm. So Ruben would have won this turn, but Sam sounds like he won on the table C and held it down for his team, and they're going to be moving sorry. on to the finals. The team of uh, PAC. Four. Huh? Top four. Top four. Oh, yeah, sorry. We still got more rounds. I'm getting ahead of myself, but that wow. Incredible match. Top four, like like Sam, that. Pack, and Hanze. And that was an incredible that. game there. Like the Nibiru that. combined yeah. with Bistials. Wow. And it looked awesome. And, I mean, Ruben was going to win that game yeah. thanks to those tech cards. But, unfortunately, for Ruben, but fortunately for the other team, Sam was able to defeat Jose. Now, you talked about you were talking to Jose, right? I, I, did, I didn't want to say this, but... <laughs> what, you want to bring that back up? What did he say it was like kind of the downside about playing on this team? He was afraid that if something went wrong, <laughs> it would all reflect on him. <laughs> it's not his fault. No, they, it isn't. He, he might be the reason why they made it this far exactly. in the first place. There's probably a couple of rounds throughout the tournament where he held it down for them. They did really well. They're all phenomenal players, all six of them, but only one team can move on to the top four. I know Jose is an incredible player, so I know oh, amazing. He'll, he'll bounce back. And to go back to the point you just made, you'll talk to Steven Silverman, he'll never let you forget that there was a match that Dom lost in the top eight of the YCS in Las Vegas that he was able to win with Scott. <laughs> that, mean, that, mean, that means he, they couldn't have done it without him. Couldn't, right? have, done it without couldn't him. have done it without him. An integral part of the team. But, you know, big congrats to the pack. And just a phenomenal play. That Beastial Magnum is probably going to be one of my favorite moments of this weekend because unexpected is the only word I can use to describe that. Yeah, I think we might see that going forward. As this format evolves, it doesn't seem obvious that a Bistial would be the correct card against a fire-based strategy, but it's actually a fire-based strategy that needs to utilize either Link Rebu if you're utilizing Jet Synchron, or of course IP if you're doing some of the more standard plays with Flame Burge. Yeah, I think there's a lot of uh, tech options still to be explored in this format, even though it seems like, oh, these are the fire decks that are doing well and everything. Like, there's a side deck card I like that I haven't seen anyone else use, and everyone I've told to kind of, like, laughs at me. But I, for Fire King Snake Eye specifically, Artifact Lancia. <laughs> That's one of my favorite cards. Because you go first, you establish your board. What are they going to do? Like, really? What are they going to do? They're not going to be seal Magnum at me. <laughs> <laughs> you can chain it to something like Cosmic Cyclone. There's no Axis Kotaker, no World Sea Dragons, Atlantis, no SP Little Knight to clean up anything. Like... I don't know. Maybe it's not great, but there's always options that you should try out. Not, don't let everyone tell you, like, oh, no, this deck won. This is the, the only way to play it. Explore, innovate, find new ways to achieve greatness, and then maybe that could be the difference in how you can move on to win a YCS. Like Pac, they're only two wins away now from being another Team YCS champion. So their story is still alive. They still have all these. Pac does have the opportunity of going two weekends in a row. For Ruben and the Kamal, though, their story has come to an end. Unfortunately, but we'll be right back after a short break with our interview with our winners. So don't go anywhere if you want to see the conclusion of Team YCS Las Vegas.
And it has been a beautiful tournament and a beautiful day here in Las Vegas, but we are starting to wind things down, but the duels are heating up. We're here with Team Supreme Pro. You have seen them up on the stage before, so let's go ahead and start with Hansei. Is it easier to duel in the featured match stage when you've been here so often? Um, yeah, I, I feel so. I feel like you get a little bit more comfortable. It starts to feel like home after a while. Yeah. Pack, you didn't get to necessarily finish your set of duels. Was there something that stood out while you were getting down to the wire there? No, I finished my duel. I won my match. Okay, you got yep. it, you got it. So I'm just saying, is there anything that really jumped out at you on theirs? Nope, just playing good Yu-Gi-Oh, that's just it. Just ready for more good Yu-Gi-Oh, gotcha, gotcha. Sam, honestly, you've been up here before, you're ready to take it, but how do you feel about your chances of taking this whole event with your team? Listen, I got, I got Shaq and Kobe on my team. You know what I'm saying? And I he's definitely also do. Phil Jackson as well. So you're saying there's nobody standing between you and those trophies right here? Yes, nobody. Okay, well, you heard it from them. They may be our champions, they may be not, but let's go back to our desk right away. All right. Thanks, Steven, darling. That was so funny to hear from those guys. I think they're very focused on the tournament right now. That's what they're, they have the goal in mind to win it. They're close to it. They can taste it. Sam, happy to be a part of the team, but his decisive victory there was key. Without Sam winning that game, this round was lost. And uh, the Shaq and Kobe reference, so, you know, every now and again, it's not just Shaq and Kobe. The role players need to chip in, too, and if you can consider himself that role player, well, it was Derek his role Fisher. that really mattered. <laughs> exactly. He was the Derek Fisher there, hitting all those threes. There you go. But it was such an incredible matchup, and I would be happy with if they end up making it to the finals and eventually winning it. Seemed like a great group of guys. I know they've been around. I mean, Hanze's won two NAWCQs. Even though the second one was the championship, didn't get to funnel into Worlds, but, you know, he's still around, still in it to win it. But we have some awesome promos coming up that you want to check out. You Phantom Nightmare Regional Qualifier Game Mat. That's right, for the season you're going to be able to win that, but let's talk, take a look at the top 16 brackets. We had Supreme Pro just taking on This Is Too Long just now. Now they're going to the top four, and looks like Zero Mortals playing and Two Dudes are still going at it on the other side of the bracket. And then we have the Jawari brothers that have made it into the top four. They're awaiting the winner of Sebastian Wesley Todd and Fala Galera and the Disciples. We actually just saw them playing with that overarching camera not too long ago. Yeah, and that's going to have Cam, who we saw in top four last week at the UUDS, along with Christian Arena. And I didn't get to see who their third player was, but we're going to find out. I'm sure maybe it's Sebastian Wesley Todd. I don't, I don't think so. I think he might be on a different team. But we're going to have our top four next. So stick around if you want to see the conclusion of Team YCS Las Vegas. We'll be right back.
Welcome to Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel Deck Flexing, the show where we put two competitors to the test in the ultimate duel. But there's a twist. Each week we have a themed deck that our competitors must build for the duel. Competitors will compete in two rounds. The first round for practice as I hands-on coach one of them and Alec coaches the other. And then we let them duel it out and crown this week's Master Duelist. And along the way, we'll also get to see who the better coach is, right Alec? It's me. All right. Let's get into it. For this week's episode theme, we are very excited to go back to Yu-Gi-Oh's roots with classic decks. Introducing our first competitor, it's Jeremy Vicious Lopez. Well known for his commentary in the fighting game community, Jeremy has been featured on ESPN. Welcome Jeremy Vicious Lopez. Yo, Paul, yo, Alec, thank you for the very, very warm introduction and for even having me on the show. Being all the way back here for this Yu-Gi-Oh match is going to be real, real fun. And his opponent, father champion and content creator, Justin Wong, known as Jay Wong. Justin is one of the most decorated fighting game competitors in the world, with a record nine Evil World Championships throughout his storied 20 year career. Jay Wong is a household name in the fighting game community and one of the first American fighting game players to be sponsored by an esports organization. Welcome, Justin Wong. Oh man, thank you for having me. Thank you for hyping me up. Thank you for making me feel old. You know, I'm older than, than Yu-Gi-Oh, but I've been growing up watching Yu-Gi-Oh. So Jeremy, I have a question for you. How did you get into Yu-Gi-Oh? How did you get started with this game? Uh, it all really kicked off with the, the TV series, right? Just overall, like, that exposure very, very early on, really admiring the series, really admiring the game. It just pretty much took off from there. Wow. And I'll kick the same question to you, Justin. Man, uh, as any other kid, watching the TV show and understanding how the game works to like playing a bit more at like a card shop, growing up in New York City and playing in like these uh, these Swiss format tournaments. Let's talk about Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel. So this game has been out for a little over a year now and I gotta say, it's huge. Have you guys played the game at all? What do you think of it? And what are you kind of hoping to see for the future of Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel? Maybe you can start us out, Jeremy. Every time they release a new set, the first thing on my mind is like, yo, what's going to be the standout theme for Master Duel? What's coming out in the next set? Because I always like the big theme. I'm a big collector. I wanted to make my old decks. I, I used to run Elemental Heroes. It was just amazing that I could still get those cards. I could still run those cards. That is very true. And so now we have a little bit of information on both of our competitors. The next step then is to prepare for battle. Alec and I are going to separate and coach our individual players. I'll be working with Jeremy Vicious Lopez. And I'll be working with Justin Wong. So let's get into it, see what cards they're playing, and let the dueling commence. All right, guys, so we're gonna take a look at what deck Jeremy is cooking for this classic duel. We've got Master Duel open, and Jeremy, I wanted to ask, what are some of the monsters that you're running in your deck? Sure thing. Well, one of my favorite things to kind of uh, tantalize the opponents uh, with is some of the set monsters or set cards that I want to put down from the monsters, right? I do have Man Eater Bug that kind of stands out, Sangan, as well as Witch of the Black Forest. Those three are going to be very, very key components in kind of preventing any sort of like big aggression from my opponents. We're talking about the classics. I'm trying to bring out that Dark Magician as much as possible, right? But if I can't get that beat stick out, just in case, I do have Dark Elf just to kind of establish herself, right? But I'm not going to be swinging too much with her because of the cost, but she will be a, a hefty attacker just in case. Yeah, that's true. I really do like these 2K defenders. 2,000 defense is a lot. It's going to be pretty difficult to swing over. I think that'll be good for setting up the Tribute Summon of Dark Magician. One of the key components that I do like utilizing, obviously, is the trap holes, right? I'm going to be mixing and matching a little bit of having like one of those backed up with like an MST to kind of force the guessing game, right? That's part of the fighting game part of it. I want to implement 50-50s as much as I can. I want to try to rely on maybe like Mystic Elf and Aquamador for a little bit and any sort of like spells that I would need to kind of help combat my opponent. A fissure for some of the big uh, monsters that I can't get rid of by swinging over. If you fall really far behind, I like that you got Monster Reborn for the revival. I really like this trap lineup, honestly. I appreciate that, man. Like I wanna, I wanna make sure that I at least make you proud because you're gonna be coaching me for a little bit. So let's do it. I wanna see uh, whether or not this deck can take down Justin. I'm here with Jay Wong and we're gonna take a look at the spice that he has in his deck for today's challenge. The spice, the classic, obviously, you know, we got we got some some regular cards, giant soldier stone, you know, protect my mm -hmm. defenses just in case I can't have a monster. I need some stalls, right? And you know, solemn judgment. Solemn judgment, I think this one is a good combo just because like if I was if I had a blue eyes out and I can attack, right? I can use solemn judgment 
I'll take out half my life points, but blue eyes might live. And then maybe I can equip a Mega Morph in the next turn, right? Because I had to sacrifice all those life points. It's very like Kaiba-ish, right? You have like your Battle Ox, your Legend Mystical Genie, you know, blue eyes, white dragon. I, you know, I love my blue eyes. I love my dragons. I added Man Eater Bug to, to protect I me as well. I love that card. Yeah, Man Eater Bug's pretty good, man. Change of Heart. Very, very good, strong card for, for, for sacrificing monsters as well. Oh, yeah. Uh, Wall of Illusion, where you just return the monster to the to the, to the opponent's it's so hand. rude. It's, it's very rude. It's fantastic. I have no notes on the deck list. This looks very solid. You want to use as few cards to get rid of as many of your opponent's cards as possible. <laughs> but with this deck list, I wish Vicious luck because he's going to need it. All right, well, I guess it's a pretty good time for us to get a little bit of a warm-up and hop into a practice game. All right, yeah. Let's head to our first round. Let's do this, yeah? Even in the practice right. stage, let's go. Yeah, all right. All right, how are the cards? Sangan, and probably bait something out by throwing down MST. So he, he sets the monster down. Oh, he's he's thinking hard. hard about it. I think I would eat the attack. I think I would eat the attack. Okay. Come on, man. I'm a genie, bro. Give me, Grant me my three yes. wishes. Uh -huh. I like that. Yeah, Soul Exchange, Ooh. man. That's hard of cards right there. Oh, he's thinking. He could... What is he going to use? I'm not going to activate anything. Oh, he's, he's letting it through. What was the cards? I want to see. Oh, he has Oh, he has two Aquamadors. That's a huge He really one. thought he was going to wall us out. Battle phase, straight up. Genie, Genie, grab my second wish, Genie. Come on. We, t we could take this, right? I'm like... I'm okay with taking this, yeah. Yeah. Grant the second wish. See, I've been out of feeling the pressure. Well, he knows how to bait, bait out reactions, bait out cards. I'm not gonna give it to him, right? <laughs> so. Let's just keep it. Gotta play it safe, cause that mirror for us. He's playing it super safe. He's he's playing exactly like a Justin Wong would. I figure if we play like as safely now, when I can't coach you, it'll already be in your head. Yeah. How how dangerous do you like to play? Like, do you like to really toe the line? Yes. <laughs> If I know Paul, I do. They're scheming. I think we could save this Wobbuffy one more turn. That makes me feel like he has nothing. We're bleeding. Tis a flesh wound. It's fine. Okay, we'll take that. That's our monster now. Ooh, brutal, brutal. I hope it's something good. Then they, then they'll really feel bad. Hmm, this one's mean. This is. It's. I feel like we're playing how Kaiba would play. Attack, GD. Grab my third wish. It's okay. Hey, man, it, look, it's, it's just a warm up, you know? Yeah. It's, it's just a warm up. Things go wrong. It'll be better in the, in the real thing. He's just a top deck god. Uh, should we get Raigeki <laughs> or Change of Heart? Okay. Let's get the Raigeki because we're mean. <laughs> I call forth the Blue Eyes White Dragon. Oh, it's so beautiful. Oh, Blue Dream Eyes Summon White Dragon. Dragon. Yeah, that's fine. And we take out by a trap hole. See you later, bud. So the big problem that we have right now is that he's got resources to deal with any monsters that we manage to get on the field. Wait, no, we have reinforcements. Maybe he's doing his like winning speech art. <laughs> I guess man or bug. Is he baiting? He's baiting, right? Like, he's... What the? Hmm. What is that? Then All I'll right. activate reinforcements. He's gonna MST. Yeah, he's an MST. He's in a BM. And I'll heavy storm. Yep. Okay. Yeah. Yep. 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 You know what? I'm not gonna go down swinging or without swinging, so I'm gonna I'm gonna get rid of his just just because. How do you like that, Justin? Oh, wait, that's Wabaku. That's not gonna do anything to me. This BM can like totally turn on him, like because he what? Because like that's a lost man in Like because it's not gonna kill us. Okay, and then acts of despair. GG. Yes, it well, is. I mean, <laughs> yes, now it, it is. is. Okay. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> okay. I had I had a feeling. Battle phase. Yeah, that's it. At least he has Karibo. Okay, good. <laughs> <laughs> got it. I thought about it. Wait, well, what if you got Karibo? <laughs> Let's go. I appreciate the guidance for the most part. You know, like we tried yeah. our best. I'm sorry that I'm 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 not big enough for the backpack to be carried in. So we'll work on it. You know? <laughs> I don't know about that. I feel like you've already got a really, really, really good grasp. Well, now I've passed down all of my skills and knowledge to you. Thank it's you. It's time to take that and bring it home once again. Thank you, I appreciate that. Thank you, we'll, we will try. <laughs> we will try, hopefully the heart of cards are, are back on my side again. <laughs> it's time to jump into the real match, round two, where I will simply be casting 
and he has to take the walk of a duelist on his own against Justin Wong. Let's see how it goes. It's time for the main event of our deck flexing event. Listen, All right, man, Jeremy. You had me in the practice one pretty convincingly, right? But I got, I think I got the heart of the cards on me this time. I, I hope I keep the heart of the cards. We're putting what they've learned to the test. J. Wong versus Vicious. Yeah, somebody's got to feel out, uh, you know, what the other person might have set on their field. It's really tough to tell right now. Hey, if you wanna, if you wanna get rid of my field now, that Raigeki you did from the practice round early. Unfortunately, I don't have a Raigeki, you know, intense. Yeah, so we're still mirroring each other's moves. This is crazy. This is so many cards in play. Nothing is in the graveyard. <laughs> Who's gonna flip their monster first? That is the question that I want to know. Oh, what is that? Relax over oh. there. Relax over there, Justin. Dark Elf. Relax over there. Ooh. So we have our first monster. We've got Dark Elf. 2,000 we'll attack. Swing. We'll swing. You have to pay 1,000. Yeah, you have to pay 1,000 of your life points to attack with Dark Elf. I mean, I have a Sangin. Sangin's going to let Justin get a card to his hand. Man-eater bug. Man-eater bug. Oh, oh man. Man-eater bug's a troublesome one. Why are you good at 50-50s outside of fighting games? Bro? And then I'm going to activate <laughs> this. Change of heart. Uh, let me, let me, give me, give me that, give me that monster. What, what monster is this? That's a Sangin. Oh, he follows a change of heart. We're taking the monster, and then we're gonna summon the big boy. So we tribute summon Blue Eyes White <laughs> Dragon. Okay, so first big summon of the game. Okay, 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 okay. okay. Coming right, out. I got, I got, I got some. I got some. I got some. He starts out with Heavy Storm. The bait Mega Morph. Oh, interesting. That was a bait. That one actually was a really nice bait. Well, guess what? Get him out of here. Oh. Get him out of here. How is, how, is that, how is that little hand able to destroy a dragon? Now suddenly a game that looked pretty squarely in favor of Jay Wong is turning oh. around very quickly he had a, because he's using Monster Reborn to bring them back Jay Wong's Blue Eyes White Dragon. That is huge. Against him. That's huge. That's, That's huge. really huge. Okay. So he so. said, I'm not the only one taking damage here. Really? You're going to take my, my card? My has no pathetic cards, Justin. Come on, pins and needles. Oh, oh Stalin Judgment. This just pays half his life points, negates the dark hole. Wow, Solemn Judgment? We'll take that. That's what I'm talking about. Oh my God. Respect the beard, Justin. Respect the beard. Oh okay? my God. Got 15 health. I knew it. I knew it. <laughs> he had Regeki too. Ooh, he had Regeki as well. <laughs> God told me you were going to do it. <laughs> I, I am out. I'm out. I knew it! This, this duel suddenly got so much scrappier. Very. No, I'm scared. I don't know what you have there. Good. I don't want you to know. I'm about, I'm about to get roasted for this play, right? Uh, side by side, baby. He looks Only good. He looks good. He looks side good. By side. Stylistic choices. I think it's checkmate. Yeah, I, this might be. Unless that's a monster in Vicious's hand right now. Oh! Wait, it's not even made of fun! It's not even made of <laughs> <laughs> The wall of a loop. That's kind of rough. Bro, the fact that I can't kill it yeah, <laughs> makes yeah. it even worse, man. <laughs> Do not tell me he's got the blue eyes right now. Oh. That was rude. That was rude. Is it rude? All right. Now if it so 450 is enough to kill Vicious's life points off here. And if Jay wong has been paying attention to my lessons, okay. just, yep, go straight to battle phase and attack with the bug. And your bug? Ooh. Hey man, GG's bro. Alright. Oh, That's so the second scared. time. That's, That's it. it. That's Man the game. Bug wins the game. That's the second time with Man Eater Bug. Man Eater Bug. <laughs> it's the second time with Man Eater Bug. Excellent. That was very tense. These competitive yeah. fighting game players are different. Yeah, they have, <laughs> yeah, they're built different. Yo, that game, you guys. Crazy. That game. <laughs> I didn't expect it to. Get as intense as that. I was being taught. You you taught me don't put all the eggs in the basket. I'm just I'm just playing lame. <laughs> that was really <laughs> great dueling. Yeah, absolutely incredible. Congratulations to uh, Jay Wong. He wins. You but... are our first champion. <laughs> thank you. But thank I have you. to say, congratulations to you both for a game very well played. Thank thank you guys for even having us, man. It's been a, it's been a lot of fun. Like it's such a it's such a cool like full circle kind of journey. Thank you. It's it's so. Uh... It's an honor, right? It's an honor uh, playing with also Jeremy as well, too. Thanks for watching. This has been Deck Flexing. 
Stay tuned for next week where we'll have two new competitors compete in our next theme, Anime Decks. That's right, and you guys can download Yu-Gi-Oh! Master Duel today. Available on consoles, Steam, and mobile. Play for free now. See you next time. Happy 25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh! card game! Hi, my name is Bryson Boggess, and I voice Yuga Odo in the Yu-Gi-Oh! 7's animated series. As someone who grew up as a fan of the Yu-Gi-Oh! franchise, I couldn't be more excited to take part in this 25th anniversary livestream. One of my favorite memories surrounding Yu-Gi-Oh! was back when I was in junior college, me and a few friends of mine were remembering how much fun we had playing the card game as kids, so we went to the local stores to grab a bunch of starter decks and booster packs and tried to make the best decks that we could, and just compete casually with each other while we reminisced about the days of our childhood, watching watching the show and playing the game. It was all in good fun, but I was definitely the best player with my Fire King slash Hazy Flame hybrid deck. And of course, growing up as a fan of the Yu-Gi-Oh card game, I was more than ecstatic to find out that I was cast as Yuga Odo. And I couldn't be happier to be a part of bringing the Yu-Gi-Oh card game to a new generation of fans and duelists. Happy 25th anniversary, and I look forward to the many more years of dueling to come. Get ready for the rush!
All right, welcome back to beautiful Las Vegas, Nevada. Again, broadcasting to you live from the Expo at World Market Center here. Our team YCS has really been heating up, but now we're just down to the last four teams in our top four semifinals. Uh, this is exciting. So close, players can basically taste it. Victory oh yeah, I mean, right there. Especially for some of our teams that have been on the stage before, they literally have been asked, "Hey, do you think you can take it?" Now, if you get asked that question, I mean, you're really only just a few duels away before you actually get that trophy in your clutches. Yeah, I don't see anyone saying, uh, "Can you win this?" Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Maybe. I mean, you know, it's, I'm so <laughs> well, why close. Why would you say that? Nah, top four is good enough for me. I'll see you guys later, right? <laughs> but the bracket is really stacked here. Let's take a look at who we have left. It's going to be Team Supreme Pro, who just saw a win against Team Two Dudes, and then. And after that, there's Team the Jawari Brothers versus Fala Galera and the Disciples. Very exciting matchup coming up. And get ready with your scorecard once again, because we are coming in with some Snake Eye versus some Fire King. Snake Eye, once again, into our semifinals. It's crazy, too. We've talked about, you know, which are you going to pick, the Fire Kings, or you're going to pick the Snake Eye. I'm really feeling like a Rescue Ace player now since we've seen that. But it didn't make it that far in the tournament yet, so we're just going to have to see what we got here so far. That's Fire right. Kings, the big bodies, though. I mean, it really shows that you can just, just edge things out by basically surviving longer than your opponent can. Now, I believe the teams are ready, so we're going to pass it over to Billy. Or Joe, but that works too. <laughs> but yeah, we are just moments away from watching our top four, the semi-finalist teams. We just saw one of these teams in the feature match area, and we're going to see a team that we've yet to see throughout the weekend. They're walking up on the stage right now for the blue side. We have two dudes, Levi, Gary, and Rashad. The other duelists that you're going to see here in the future match area are ones that you saw just last round, so we'll go over them in just a moment. We're going to be able to get insight into a player that we did not feature last round, so it will be a little bit different. And over on the red side, we have Team Supreme Pro, Hanse Pakawat, and you might know him better as Sam. Hanse doing a great job of emulating that it's time to duel motion, right? That's the best time of all. But it's going to be a little bit of a marathon for them, right? They were just on the stage. We asked them, was that a little bit more comfortable? And Hanse, of course, saying yes. I mean, they're used to being up there. But it's still true that you're up on the hot lights, and maybe your other opponents got a little bit more of a quieter, relaxed duel off on the side. So hopefully they still have their energy with them. They're going to have to sit there for at least another round if they want to make it all the way through. They better get comfortable there. You know what? That's what you have to do. Get comfortable in those hot seats. Exactly. That trophy is not going to take itself home. So eventually, you're going to have to just get used to being up here. And this, this is where you duel. It's your battle city. So again, our players are getting ready here. And man, I mean, we are about to see Fire Kings take on Snake Eye. You mentioned having that scorecard ready. It's been pretty wild to see how each of them has performed. Yeah, I don't know. I think Pac has very, very good technical play. I think almost perfect technical play. He really does, but we're not going to be watching Pac for this first match. Just like Joe previewed, we are going to be taking a look at Sam, it's going to be really neat to go ahead and see what his duel was like. We didn't get to see it, but it was the deciding factor in their last duel. I would not count him out. Sam is a very skilled duelist. He has multiple tops of YCS under his belt as well. Let's not forget about that. And of course, we, how could we forget about Pac? You know, being in the middle seat in the B seat, being able to communicate with both his teammates, carrying them through. I don't know if he's carrying them through, but I definitely know that Pac is just undefeated right now. It's like incredible. Obviously, I mean, look at the incredible records there. Now, Supreme Pro is only 11 wins and one draw, meaning they've got a better record than the opposing team of 10 wins and two losses. Now, that, none of those stats matter during single elimination, of course, because a loss would be the end of your tournament run. But it does show to the other side, this is the stats we're coming in. This is our record. You're going to have to beat us. I think they are going to be very, very strong. And let's not underestimate Sam. I know, very, very well-known player, very well-known among the community. But there's a difference between creating content and becoming a competitor. Well, just as we saw last week during our Master Duel Invitational, we out here, right? Just because you're making videos about the best Blue Eyes deck doesn't mean you don't know how to play another great dragon with 3,000 attack and 2,500 defense. That's right. And well, we're, they're getting settled in. They're getting ready. Judges are settling them in as well. I'm looking forward to seeing some critical play. You know, it's really good that we get to see these matches back to back, you know, Maybe they've gotten comfortable. Did they switch sides or they, have they always been on the red side? 
I believe they were on the blue side last time as Supreme Pros because they were the first ones to take the stage. So maybe the red side will favor them just as well. Now we got to get into this Snake Eyes Fire King matchup because again, you've been keeping score. How has it been going so far in the top cut? In the top cut, most of the time, it has been uh, the Fire King side taking it, but that is completely unsettled because I believe on the, the other one with Maximilian, the pure snake I took it. That's true. Well, we're going right now into game one of our semifinals. We're going to see the die roll. And wow, that's a nine. nine, 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 nine. <laughs> very, very high number. I'm going to go first. Go first? Right. Yes. So go Sam Rashad. with great energy, good sportsmanship, and looks like we're going to get right into it. Rashad will be going first. So Fire King is going to kick things off. Certainly a great way to heat things up. Sam not phased by it again. If you got this far in the tournament, you know the Fire King matchup, so obviously they are prepared. Um, main phase? Into the main phase, normal summon Snake Eye Ash. Thinking about what we're going to do here, never want to let anything go too far without maybe activating a card from the hand. Talking to your teammate is certainly legal here, so maybe we're going to stop it, but it looks like we are going to let it go after all. You know, getting that confirmation is quite nice. It's good for that interaction awareness month, right? You don't just need to stop the Snake Eye Ash because it's doing something. You need to stop the things that are a threat to you. And if you don't have a way to lock things out, perhaps like Droll and Lockbird, it's not really, oh, speak of the Droll and Lockbird, there it is. Well, Droll and Lockbird is going to cut down on quite a few engines that are available to the Fire King, namely the Fire King engine, because now, unless you already have already the Karunix, we're not going to see very many Fire King cards. Probably not there. So Using the effect of Ash, uh, we're going to send away the yeah. Poplar. Good. We're going to special summon from the deck. Talk about monsters with 3,000 attack and 2,500 defense. Looks like the Flamberge Dragon returns to the field once more. No. Oh, really? Yeah. Now we're just loading in the grave additional monsters yeah. just in case, but he, we're going to be he, bringing he, a card he, back. He went Ash, uh, uh, sorry, Oak Summer. Because effect, also uh, the Poplar can the, also the, activate the, 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 the put into the, the spawn trap zone. Stop it. All right. Effect failure comes down, and that's going to basically turn off the Snake Eye Oak from bringing out that 3,250, sorry, 2,500 attack defense monster. Yeah, wow, exactly. I am <laughs> hey, right it there. has been a long weekend. Don't fault yourself. And our players, too, have been really going through match after match after match. Again, a YCS is a marathon, not a sprint. So don't fault yourself for that. It's Again, a tough position to be in right now, but it seems like we're sending our card into the graveyard to special summon out Dia Bellstar, Ouch. the Black Witch. Dia Bellstar is certainly another way to get into the game because you can set that card. You're not adding the card from your deck to your hand. Yes. Yes. And uh, the Effect Veiler, maybe you could have used it against there. Didn't necessarily know that there was a Dia Bellstar there because it wasn't telegraphy via Wanted or something like that. So not necessarily a mistake, just operating on the information that you have. Now, we are able to send that Poplar away for cost if necessary and uh, get three monsters onto the field. And the graveyard is loaded. There's actually a lot they can consider. Considering the oak has not activated the effect just yet, if we put that into the graveyard in some way, shape, or form, and then revive it, you know, special summon back from the graveyard, the effect will be live again. Maybe we have access to that Flamber Dragon once again. Certainly something you can try for. But let's take a look in the deck here as we're operating under original Sinful Spoils here. Snake Eye trying to get a level one fire monster. A lot of different choices, obviously, especially in the Fire King version of the deck. You can always go for Ponyx. But Ponyx wouldn't be doing a whole lot since it wouldn't be able to add anything. So we're going back with the Snake Eye Ash. Now, the Snake Eye Ash effect has already been used to bring out the Oak, so I think a lot of it is going to be basically relying on uh, the oak hitting the graveyard and maybe re-special summoning it back out. That effect failure putting in a lot of work in terms of this current position in the game. Rashad trying to plan out his plays. Still could be a Nibiru coming down at any moment here. We didn't necessarily see Sam's hand, so we're not sure what it is that he might have. Again, when we're saying Sam, that's just a colloquial nickname for this popular play. Itapod is who we mean. Yeah, I, I've only known him as Sam. And here we have the IP Mascarena. IP Mascarena Link summoned off with the Oak, likely going into the Promethean Princess. Promethean Princess now can special summon back the Oak if necessary. 
It is the only life card, after all, that still has an effect after it is summoned. Absolutely does. Now, remember, we've always talked about our graveyard, especially during this tournament, and so there's so many good monsters that Rashad has placed there that if Sam decided that he wanted to go ahead and put out either Dark the Dark Charmer, Gloomy, or Hita the Fire Channeler, or Shubi's Fire Charmer, would be able to just grab those monsters and they're really, really powerful. So, especially with that Arvada in the graveyard, that could be dangerous. Now, Rashad summons out the Amblo Whale. Every time we make the Amblo Whale call, we see an Appaloosa instead. That's the caster's right. curse. However, Sam, like you said, did not put any fire or dark monsters in the graveyard, making it a lot harder for Rashad to kind of extend through all those hand interruptions. I think in our future tournaments, you go to your locals next week, really watch that graveyard. Speaking of watching the graveyard, we're going to send another Droll and Lockbird down there so we can use the effect of one for one to grab a level one monster of some kind. I think one for one, one, for one should be in every one that's playing Fire Strategies deck right now. I think it's just too good. So it looks like we're going to see another great card here. It is going to be our yeah, Poplar. Uh, in this it looks like we did get an update. Our other match right now is one to one. So we are getting some scores in. That means that this duel is going to be even more important because it's holding the bridge between both duelists, or teams, I should say. Oh, oh, take a look at that graveyard. Oh. Uh-oh. Basically going shopping in your graveyard. That's not a good sign. It's almost like your opponent's <laughs> trade binder. You're just like, oh, you know what? I'll take these. Yeah, I'll take these. That's a great deal. My two fire monsters for your Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames. <laughs> now, that is a dangerous point to make, that there is a Promethean Princess in that graveyard. So even if you do try to go into a Hita or a Dark, there's potential they will be destroyed. But it really matters that, hey, I can get more monsters. As long as I can generate two monsters, I may have a follow-up, maybe go into the Dark. My, you know, my fire shopping didn't work out. Now I can go my Dark shopping. <laughs> yeah, you know what? Now I'm more of a Dark duelist. I changed my mind. But it does look like we're going to link these off, and I think it's probably going to be heated. It'll also be an SP Little Knight, but there's the heated. Oh, my God. Goodness, that's gorgeous. It's too shiny. My eyes are getting blinded. Definitely under the hot lights of Las Vegas here as Poplar enters the Spell and Trap Zone. And we're attempting to use the effect of Hita. Hita's effect, special summoning back. Doesn't care about the Promethean Princess's effect. Doesn't try to use it to destroy the Amblo Whale and another card on the field. How interesting. Maybe doesn't want to enable the destruction effect when you lose Hita. Obviously, that gives you a little bit more access to resources as well. I think one key thing to note is that there isn't a normal summon done by Sam just yet. The first summon was coming from one for one. And if the Hita does get destroyed and we add a 1500 defense monster into the hand, it could be a Snake I.O. can just regenerate the entire field. It absolutely could. It also could express a weakness in Rashad's hand. Perhaps it's very fragile and cannot allow Triple Tactics talent to rifle through it if he thinks that Sam has it. Mm -hmm. It looks like we're going to send two fires to the graveyard, and it's time to special summon something from the deck. This time, it is that beautiful quarter century secret rare, Flamberge Dragon. This is very dangerous. I think if we push the monster into the back, the Amble Whale, that is going to hurt a lot now. That opens up the field for a lot of attack. So 3,027 and also an 1850. However, we may need a little more damage. 1850 plus 27 is 3K. How much is that? That You're the math now. We're a little short at the moment. Yeah. Now, Rashad not yeah. even blinking here, maybe still holding on to Nibiru, the primal being, about to clear off this field and not particularly worried about it because so many of the different effects have been used already. So, but there's still options for Sam. But what if Rashad has a Nibiru? I think that would be the only thing that would be keeping me in this game. Obviously, you want to hold the line for your teammates, give them time to play, but... I'm not sure how you get back into this duel otherwise. Now, remember, Nibiru alone will not be enough. Usually, it's got to be combined with some other supporting card from the hand. But the resources are running out, and if a triple tactics talent did come down, it might be difficult for Rashad to get out into the game in the next turn if he survives this one. At this moment, Ham is basically playing a duel puzzle. Where's the one hit that can get 8,000 damage? Well, definitely did well in his classes in Duel Academy so far, as you can tell from the beautiful field there. Just trying to determine how to close this game out and get a number on the board for him. 
Now, right now, the only type of monsters that Sam can summon are fire-type monsters. Locked out. Fire attribute monsters. Fire attribute, yes. Locked out because of the Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames, which is not something that's permanent. If you link her off, of course, you can summon monsters of different attributes, but she can't be linked off herself because that'd be violating her own restriction. Mm -hmm. And we are going to perform a... Link summon. Wait, isn't that his own copy of? Yeah, Shisha? that's uh, that's <laughs> Sam, a generous guy, but maybe not that generous. Let's go ahead and keep those cards in your uh, own let's graveyard. Let's put right into my graveyard, and here's my other copy. Just like <laughs> we were saying, our graveyard. And, well, we don't share that much, you know, that much room. Okay, <laughs> he's just trying to be nice. We're not roommates. <laughs> <laughs> and we are going into the Nightmare Phoenix. Are we going into Zalantis? Don't think we're going to discard yeah, here. Yeah, gonna there's the Zalantis. No, we can't go into Zalantis just yet. I think that we have to start off with a Salamangre first, the Raging Phoenix. Now, this is the dangerous point. We're going to keep pushing. Mm -hmm. Rashad holding it down so far. Are we hucking rocks at each other? I mean, we might. Right. Not particularly worried. We haven't attempted to advance to the battle phase, oh, so that would that be the opportunity. Dangerous. That was very dangerous. Oh, Almost misstep yeah, there. Oh, shit, god damn. Uh, soup, soup? Yeah. All right, game two. Uh, okay, Rashad didn't have anything of interest. <laughs> no, okay. Holy. Nice finish. See, this is the way that you would use the World Sea Dragon's Atlantis to attack through a field that doesn't have any monsters. Like, uh, the biggest concern was, oh, your opponent needs a monster. Oh, we need to summon out the Promethean Princess and then summon out the Raging Phoenix. What really matters is that you need a Raging Phoenix in the graveyard and then a fire monster to destroy. As long as you can do at least 4,000 damage, the rest of the way will come from that Raging Phoenix. Sam just smiling there again. Inapod just really proud of himself in that duel and just making sure that, hey, he, he thought maybe his opponent had something, but to his surprise, really, there wasn't anything coming in. Now, as a Fire King duelist, what are the staples that you're putting in trying to close this out against a Snake Eye duelist? I think this is a tough one. I mean, cross out designators should go in because there's so much overlap in terms of those particular cards. I don't think we were going to see a call by the grave. I think that's just too dangerous because of how long call by the grave lasts and it could come back to your turn and you still wouldn't be able to use it. And that's a bit rough. We may see maybe some cosmic cyclone just to deal with the field spell. The field spell is going to be pivotal mm -hmm. when it comes to like answering some disruption from the hands such as the rock or the one that we keep on throwing at each other this whole weekend, which is the Nibiru. Uh, there's also potentials for Kurikara, Solemn Strike. Oh yeah, there's just so many great choices out there. The Kurikara of Incarnate we've seen across some of the lists throughout the tournament, but we haven't really got to see it on the field, at least not in the matches that I got to cast. But it shows you that level one fire monsters have been an exciting part of the game for quite some time. They're just all sort of congealing together into these interesting deck builds. And really there's been a lot of creativity expressed this weekend as well. Mm -hmm. Now I think the Supreme Pro team, everyone there they're able to carry their own weight. It's not just relying on Pac. Pac is a nice advisor to have, you know, if it does finish first, but I think everyone there, they're just super, super good. Everyone just being able to play all the way through. Oh no, absolutely all passionate hey, duelists. And is this gonna be a hat trick Thank you. for Mr. Pac? Game teacher, brother. If all Pac the teams, team YCS's, uh, yes, he's ready. gotten the previous one, I believe. Just it, last week, just yeah. Just last week. That's two under his belt, and he's gonna get the third one in a row. We're gonna have to buy him a new shelf just so he can make room for all those trophies. And I believe we can take a look at the current standing at the moment for the top four teams. The Jawari brothers won, uh, won against the uh, the Fala Galera. So and I the think disciples. what I'm saying is that means that at least one duelist completed their two out of three matches on the Jawari Brothers team, and one of the duelists completed their match on the Fala Galera and the Disciples team. So that means they're down to just one game that or counts. One duelist. Over one duelist. One, one duelist. duelist apiece. One duelist. There we go. It is a team YCS. I'm not used to the extra scoring, but here we are. Yeah, the team, you know, three people, they're all just one big duelist. Polymerization <laughs> makes that team. Oh, it looks like an update. The Jawari brothers defeated Team Ragnarok, but that might have been from our top eight. But again, let's go ahead and get into this game. Game number two at position C. Looks like Rashad might be going first this time, getting those Fire King cards on the board before anything happens on Itapot's side. Interesting note to kind of point out is that Rashad did win the die roll. He had the opportunity to choose to go first, but he did oh, yes, not secure it. Might have just thought that it would be better to go second, and well, that may not have played out as well as he expected, but he's going first this time. 
So we're gonna start with Snake Eye Ash. Snake Eye Ash summoned out. It does resolve. Are we gonna see another draw on Logbird? Usually when that resolve, we can see uh, the draw on Logbird. Oh, there it is. Oh, there is oh. the cross of designated. We mentioned that this is a really, really good side. Not just for the disruption from, from uh, the hand, but also, well, for the rest of the deck. Both of them smiling, Sam wearing the heart of the cards on his sleeve, just has nothing he can do to answer of it. Looking over to his players, you know, kind of smiling, certainly not a bad sport about it, but just knows I can't do anything about it. But that is one less draw in the Lockbird that he has to deal with, so that beautiful Snake Eye Ash is going to get to resolve its effect. Okay, that's one card out of Sam's hand, and we got the Ash to resolve, and the Poplar summoned. The Poplar is not going to be able to add a card, and this opens up the Fire King line without it getting too restricted, unless there's even more disruption. No, and I think you're really right when you talk about the Called by the Grave earlier. You know, if you had Called by the Grave in that same situation, you would not be able to use a Droll and Lockbird yourself, but if for any reason Rashad ends this turn and happens to keep his own Droll and Lockbird, that effect will be able to be used, because Crossout Designator only negates it during that turn. That's right. And we are adding the original Sinful Spoil Snake Eye into hand. I assume it's going to plop right back on the field there. But first... Ash effect, and we're going to send away the Poplar. This has been uh, the more common line of the combo where they start off with either the Oak or the Flamberish. And Got to see Oak. Definitely see an Ibiru in the deck there. Something to keep a heads up for later of if Sam's trying to get into the game. And... Right now, Drone Lockbird is not live, so we are having a little consulting moment to make sure that, hey, maybe I'll still have be able to just get everything online. <laughs> it's good. It goes it's through. It's good. Okay. You know, finding the perfect timing is very key here. That's like that's the most crucial thing we've been talking all all weekend. This is the interaction awareness format. Yes. Interaction Awareness Month. Interaction Awareness Month. I mean, it just is so important, again, not to just block any card you see. You want to stop the right card in the combo just so that you can see the light of day at your following turn. No, I think there is something to think about here during the consulting. When you're consulting with your teammate, you may telegraph to your opponent what you might have. Just a little bit. It's kind of the danger there, right? You almost want to make sure that you, you work out the... You have to communicate. You're, you have to be speaking it out loud. But it would be nice to maybe not necessarily have to say, hey, do I activate this? Yeah, that telegraphing could be important. Or maybe they're speaking in code words, and we can't find out. Oh, that's true, too. More aspects of the Team YCS. <laughs> here, study up on how we're going to communicate here so that the opponent can't figure out what we're saying. The Team YCS meta evolves time and time again, and it's so great to have these team tournaments. Obviously, that's something we had since the beginning of Yu-Gi-Oh!, but very much in the spirit of the game. And speaking of the spirit of the game, Itapont won that first one, we know, but also Levi on the blue side has won a duel as well. Gary versus Pakawat, there's been no changes, so this really is anybody's game. And we get to the Link Karibo into the Salamangre Sunlight Wolf. That's two Cybers monsters with different attributes, and we are going to Deco Talker Heat to get a draw. That's going to be 1,000 life points. That's going to be paid from Rashad. Really just an incredible card. Again, Deco Talker Heat Soul, something TCG players have been looking forward to for a long time. And look, it's really paying off. You just get to keep using those resources and also kind of get those monsters Ooh, in the graveyard. Ooh, a triple oh. tactics oh. talent. That is the most dangerous oh, card man. if it does get to resolve. And uh, likely going to reveal you the hand. This is a forceful sentry. And so we've got the oh. infinite permanence there, a Snake Eye Ash, a Snake Eye Oak, as well as a one for one. Oh, this is going to be pretty rough. See, if you're able to use both cross out and triple tactics, having those two cards in your hand, going first, just some of the best things you can have, the knowledge. The knowledge that you know that, oh, okay, there's going to be a one for one. There's probably going to be a Snake Eye Ash. We probably could put away one of them, so we only need to answer one yeah, particular line. Yeah, or do we get rid of the infinite impermanence so that I can build a bigger was, line? Exactly. You don't have to guess what your opponent is going to do. You know exactly what your opponent can do. And so you can set up your plays in that way. Now, granted, for the most part, these players have been playing against these types of decks all tournament long, so they likely know how they want to set up their board. But isn't it nice just to know instead of guess? I, this is kind of... Difficult here. Oh, they are, are having a little bit of a judge call. Uh, I think they're answering something uh, currently. I'm not trolling, fam. And that's fine. Just give them just a moment so we can figure out what's going on here. Again, our other players are just going to be playing it out. And so the duel is paused for just a moment, but that doesn't mean anything bad. It just means the judges are taking a look into things and maybe they have some questions. 
But yes, it's one of those things where this tournament is still going on strong. I mean, the fact that the Fire King matchup and the Snake Eye matchup is as cool as it's been so far, it's very intricate. It's not just about like slapping cards down the table. It's not one of our prior Yu-Gi-Oh formats about big monsters that just say no to one thing. Kind of like the Skull Guardian or the Voiceless mm -hmm. Voice. It's much more about these micro nuanced interactions and having the team format allows you to communicate with your opponent and just make sure that the stuff, you do exactly what it is you need to do. That's right. Well, if you actually look at the game set that we saw earlier, we had the Oak, the One for One, the Ash, and the Imperm. And if you get to put one back, like, which one's the best one here, you think? The Imperm, I feel, isn't going to be doing a whole lot. I mean, obviously, you put the Imperm back if you want to continue your combos uninterrupted. But you almost could just bait out the infinite impermanence and just put back one of the monsters or even the one for one so you limit your opponent's ability to get in the game as much as possible and just deal with the fact that they have infinite impermanence and maybe held on to it too long. Mm -hmm. uh, if we can get like get rid of the monster, the one for one loses a lot of value because the only monster that you would have is likely oak. You're not gonna let them keep the ash and then they put the oak plus the one for one. You probably wanna keep the oak just so they can have the follow up but now you have to throw it away and now you kind of lose your resources and if there's a negation that's attached to it, now you're getting into like a really tight situation where you have a negate in your hand, you can't really do anything with it. That sounds like a painful choice to me. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, as they get settled in with the judge. Looks like, again, we are still seeing that the other players are still going. So again, Pac's still playing there. We see that they are cutting. And same deal with Hansei and his opponent. So the duel just is going to continue. Uh, looks like we do have a judge call here, so we're gonna get some information there. But again, we'll find out later. Don't worry about that. Our judges are great, hardworking duelists that give up their time to be here at this tournament. So we know they're in safe hands. So Hansel, he's starting off with a Poplar play from what I can see, and he's going to continue with his play. Poplar is now being pushed into the Spell and Trap Zone. <laughs> oh yeah, no, it's great, because we can actually see Hansei's duel pretty well here. I just saw the Link Karibo there being special summoned and they're just shuffling their hands as well. Shows you that, you know, you really become fluent in these decks, even if you are someone who came into the game because you were a fan of the series or maybe you haven't played in a while. Hopefully this has been a master class. You're really ready. You've completed your Duel Academy class on what the Phantom Nightmare format looks like. It's time for you to go to your official tournament store and break out those cards with the best of them. So is there any event that you're looking forward to? Well, yep. you know, the OTS Championships, that beautiful Promethean Princess Bestower of Flames mat, it's cool. The regional one's great too, but it's got that beautiful OTS Championship logo. So yeah. I definitely want to be competing. I think that's going to be coming up in a couple of weeks. Okay. I'm also looking forward to doing some competing myself. Usually I focus more on the judging aspect, but I've uh, finally got a replacement. I can t take, you know, take a step down from there and enjoy some good old fashioned Yu-Gi-Oh. Just join the players. It, you know, there's just something about going to large events and competing with your friends, being in the same atmosphere. But let's take a look at the current score now. The Jawari brothers have done it. They've taken their opponents two to one against the Falagarea and the Disciples. So they're waiting for this current round to complete to find who their next opponent is going to be. It's gonna be interesting. That's the final boss waiting for them in the finals, but we still have to figure out who is going to challenge them. Is it going to be our Team Supreme Pro? Or is it going to be our team two dudes? But there's three dudes. I wonder which <laughs> two of them are the dudes. The other one is, you will address me as Sir Duelist. <laughs> and I believe we're coming back into the game here. And the triple tactics talent has resolved. We're getting rid of the one for one. I believe the one for one, you know, a bit of a risky card if you leave it in there. Like what if they draw into a different monster? That means they can still hold on to that oak and that oak will provide the follow up. But yep. uh, Rashad still is in a very solid position. He did manage to resolve the Cross of Designer and got a peek at the hand and got rid of a card. And he's going to have more cards than Sam for sure because with that, Deco Taker Hitzel, we're just drawing even more cards. Ooh, tight position. Certainly, certainly. And the infinite permanence certainly just not something to worry about again because you've really gotten it. This would be an opportunity for the infinite permanence to come down, obviously, to block the shot of Ponix. But it doesn't seem like that's going to happen. Looks like we're going right into the Sanctuary. Likely. The, letting them keep the Fire King Island on the field could create a, a liability later on, and maybe that's what we want. There are ways that you can stop, say, the big Garunix, Sacred Fire Garunix, and if you negate that, maybe you don't get to see the Kirin, don't get to see the Arvada, and it doesn't really provide all that much value. 
True, but we've also seen duelists go ahead and get rid of their own Fire King Island by Link summoning out Nightmare Unicorn, discarding a card as weird as it sounds to bl basically blast away your own field spell, but by placing it back in the deck, it doesn't have that negative drawback, so you are not blowing up your own field. I think that's a little bit risky, but you know, you do what you must, because if you get rid of your own card, first of all, you're losing a card on your own, and you also put a dead draw into your deck, because you don't want to see this card anymore. You've already used most of your Fire King effects. Well, what a duelist will do to win, that's between them and their deck. But looks like we're going to be sending Ponix to the graveyard. Yeah, let the cards speak for themselves, I suppose. Let the cards do the talking, right? <laughs> that's right. And we're going to see the Sacred Fire Garunix. That's going to ah, Sacred nice. Fire High Avatar Garunix. We don't want to mix Is that there one up. A high Avatar Garunix? I believe it. I thought it was just Sacred Fire Garunix. Oh, you're right, Sacred Fire Garunix. I was making the joke earlier from the deck list having the different games. My yes. apologies there. Remember, there's four different Garunixes. <laughs> It looks like that might have been all she wrote, and Sam is scooping up that duel. I think it's a smart move to save a little bit of time. You need to uh, make sure that these games could go e either way. It could be a complete blowout, or it can be an extreme grind. If you are really, really well-versed with your deck, these should be very quick games. Exactly. Like, it's very decisive. The decisive moment, you will be able to see it. But the Game 2 winner here, we have Rashad. So one game apiece. This is uh, anybody's game. I know, and again, the Jawari brothers waiting them down at the end of the tunnel here, but we still have to figure out who our winner is. And Hansei seems like he's doing okay. What a full field you got there. So again, full dueling action. Hey, I think there's a slight advantage for finishing earlier. Maybe sit in the crowd, wait for them, watch the opponent, know what your opponents are coming up with. That's true, the Jawari brothers do just get to kick back and relax and just kind of wait things out. I mean, they took the route of just finish the game quickly. That's all it takes. And, uh, okay, 1-1. One, one. Okay. Now, Rashad looking into his deck here, possibly going to go ahead and access the side, or just verify, you know, are there any options maybe that I want to put in that I didn't see game one? I'm finally back in this, I'm representing my team, but you cannot make any mistakes. This is the semifinals. They're so close. They're just so close right now. It's, it, every one of these matches has been a nail biter. It has been incredible. I hope you guys at home are having a good time too, because it's one of these things where like, it's, it's hard to watch these duelists. They're all great duelists. They're all great decks, but we can only have one. It's a team YCS, but there can still only be one winning team. That's right. Uh, you know what? Yu-Gi-Oh! is all about making friends. Even if your friends don't carry their weight, maybe they kind of let you down a little bit. Just remember, you're still friends at the end of the day. We're all enjoying Yu-Gi-Oh! Exactly. The real team YCS was the friends we made along the way. And I got to be friends with a lot of these people. It's because of Yu-Gi-Oh! I got to meet so many of them. And I got to meet you, got to meet Billy in the back as well. Just great times all around. And this has been just a wonderful week from the quarter century celebration all the way here to the top cut of our Team YCS. Now again, Team Supreme Pro, they are still one and one with Team Two Dudes. So we can see obviously active play between that A table at the front there. Yep, A table still going on. B table also still playing as well. So. Who knows? We're going to see if uh, there's going to be any major changes. I really hope that this does not end without us getting a conclusive match on Table C. Those walk-off home runs are cool, but just like in the Master Duel World Championship Series event, you know, you want to know who it was that was going to finish it. We can't let it be this Jesse Con joshua schmidt rivalry forever. You want to see a finisher. Yeah, absolutely. Don't leave me hanging. This is a cliffhanger, and I don't like it. <laughs> to be continued. <laughs> <laughs> Tune in next time. But I believe they have just finished shuffling up. One game apiece. Rashad has won for the two dudes, and Sam has won for the Supreme Pro. We're getting really close. They're drawing out their hands right now. Great sportsmanship there, too. The handshake and just getting ready. Both of these duelists are just, they, they know what this is all about. They know there could be only one winner, so they're just going to try to do their best and exhibit great sportsmanship. I think they're going to be jumping in fairly soon. What do you think the Snake Eye side uh, should be siding against the Fire King this time around? Now they get to choose to go first. Well, you get to have like some fun, different options. I don't want to spoil any surprises because, of course, we still have one final match. But, you know, thinking about it, we know that the Cosmic Cyclone is just the end-all, be-all. Everybody has been including it either in the main deck or side deck this tournament because of how fragile Fire Kings are. So I feel like that's a pretty good safe bet. You may not even need to do more than that because obviously the Snake Eye deck is so powerful that it can carry you this far. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the most interesting things about the deck list across the board for Team Supreme Pro 
is I could pick up any of these and it would be the exact same. They just Crazy. know it's the best deck, and the best deck has brought them to game three of our semifinals of the Team YCS. Here we are. We're starting off with the field spell? There we go. The judge pointing out that that is not a monster card, so why don't we go ahead and move that right over there in the there field we spell go. zone. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. A lot of people, remember, you have to maintain the proper layout for your dueling field, or the judges will call you out. Now, I'm really excited to see a certain card that we haven't oh. shown, but I'm just going to wait to see if that happens. Oh, Won't spoil oh, the surprise, but man, there are some really cool plays that Sam can make with his deck. I hope we get to see it. I hope we get to oh, feature it. Oh, man, if we see that, oh my goodness, it is. The chat's going to go wild. Starting off with the D-Bell Star, uh, because we have the Divine Temple that placed one card into the back. Now, speaking about the back, let's take a look at our table scores. Again, Levi has won against Hansei. Uh, Gary and Pakawan are one apiece, and Rashad and Itapot, we know, are one each. Ooh, the D-Bell Star gets negated by the Infinite Impermanence. I think it's still a really good option just to not give access to those cards. Oh, we are normal summoning Ash Blossom, Joy of Spring, and we are performing a Synchro Summon. Or oh, is it Link Summon? No, it's a Synchro into Baron de Fleur. That might be the first Synchro Summon I've seen in quite some time. Putting it mysteriously in the column where Relinquished Anima could get it. I wonder if that's to try to get it out. Yeah, it could be a bait, but uh, here we are. We're passing turn to Rashad. Rashad draws for turn. All right, just wondering what we're going to do next. Rashad sort of pensively staring at his cards, not interacting with his teammates, thinking for himself here. I'm going to start by activating Bonfire. The bonfire is lit, and it's good. Searching out for those Pyro monsters. Pyro's becoming, you know, it used to be such an under, basically an underdog yeah. typing, you know? There's not that much of a Now, oh, it's the best type. Oh, yeah, I know there are people who were counting the days until there was good Pyro support, but... That aside, their pain is over. They no longer have to wait. Pyros are here to stay. Mm -hmm. They're going for the bonfire. Bonfire search. Well, the, even though we did use an Ash Blossom, it does telegraph, hey, my hand does not have a lot of Snake Eye stuff to kind of push forward. That's a bit unfortunate, but maybe there's a lot of disruption from the hand. I think there's just... You can't oh, write there's the troll. Jordan Lockbird. Jordan oh. Lockbird with the so, Ronda Floor staring it down is going to be a pretty decent field for Sam. Yeah, this is a this is a high pressure situation now because we spoke about Gamma before, where Gamma gets to negate the card and destroy it, and that removal is so key of just just cleaning up the field. The Ronda Floor does the same thing. Not only that, during your own standby phase, we're going to do a little switcheroo. It's nice to see the cycle effect of Baron de Fleur during the standby phase getting a level 9 or lower monster out of the graveyard that's so powerful after you've used up its single negate effect. We're going to special summon out Diabelle Star, okay? And uh, there's going to be chain link 1, chain link 2. That, that's the powerful use of Poplar, being able to manipulate your chain link to kind of protect your Diabelle Star. Certainly a great friend to Dia Bellstar, and they'll have many adventures continuing throughout the year. But looks like we're going to go ahead and get the original Sinful Spoils Snake Eye. That's set into column number four. Are we going to immediately activate it? That likely could be stopped, but there's a lot of danger here. There's so much danger right now. Looking into the graveyard, there's both a fire and a dark monster. So that's going to provide Rashad with potential follow-up with just the Charmer Link monsters. And you do have to consider that there may be a triple tactics talent at the ready here. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a true danger. When you're running around the floor, it's good, but as we've seen many a time in Master Duel, just using that negate effect as quickly as you can usually will open you up for your best monster to get stolen by your opponent. Mm -hmm. This is a very tight situation. You can hear that in the background. Sam being advised, just wait it out. It's okay. Don't worry about it. Looks like we can see that in the Searching through there. We did see the Cosmic Cyclones in there as well. Right now, Snake Eye Oak. Okay, Snake Eye Oak has been special summon onto the field. Likely can summon back that Poplar if needed. 
Now the duelists here, they're just the moving going, uh, oak, just so incredibly go. well, but again, they're being yeah. very thoughtful, very meticulous. No movement, no card, nothing is played on accident here. Sam always making sure to get some sort of consult, making sure that he is being patient. Again, take a look at the scores here. This is really a nail biter. Every duelist has won a game. These are some of our best in the room. Again, this is our top four semifinals. And whoever's waiting for them, well, they better get ready because they've got a great opponent coming. I mean, Pack is so strong. The entire team of Supreme Pro just doing incredible. Also, two dudes also equally incredible in this match. Take a look at the extra deck here. It looks like we are going to possibly conduct a Link Summon. This is a strange position. Do you make the IP Mask Arena and then make it into the next monster? Well, it would help because then if we're on the floor, decides to negate that effect, whatever IP Mask Arena brought out wouldn't be destroyed. But that doesn't feel like a good application of it. It might just yeah. be... That's just putting bodies on the field that may not I think, sink. I think there may be more disruption from the hand and having the on the floor, just holding the fort. It's just so much more pressure. When you use disruptions from the hand and you chain and you build more chains and all of a sudden you get the lashing getting negated by you know, such a big monster, that's a big problem. Okay, we're going to go to Hita. Hita is a very strong option because there is the ash in the graveyard, which can be special summon back. That's a... The, Kind of a, a catch-22, right? Because you either stop the Hita, yeah, and they get a monster, this, it, right? because they can use its effect when it's Sorry, destroyed, or you don't stop no, the Hita, and they get a monster, because they use its effect and it wasn't destroyed. Yeah, I would. To all yeah. Right. Yeah, he, yeah, he can't search, yeah. right? Sure. I'll just be yeah. And don't forget that Jordan Lockbridge still alive, so we, if we do get that card destroyed, that's going to hurt. But instead, sure. we are going to see uh, sure. Fire King High Avatar, Kieran, destroy. <laughs> destroy the Hita, but there's no, there's not a lot of value there. Now we're going to see ah because it oh, wasn't going in. there's the there Nibiru. It is. It just that's a very shiny Perfect rock. Perfect timing, by the way, using that Baron de Fleur to basically stop the effect. And now that the game was starting to get out of Sam's hands, drop the rock. So Nibiru the Primal Being has been activated. We're still thinking here, possibly doing some additional chains. So we mentioned previously that, you know, you have to wait for different things that got to come onto the field before you drop the Nibiru. Hita is one of those monsters that you have to stop. And since Hita is gone, even if there is a follow-up, it's not going to be Hita. They're not going to be kind of rummaging through your graveyard. For those of you at home wondering why Hita's effect did not resolve, it wasn't because it was negated, right? It left the field, but its arrows weren't on the field to point to any zone, so there wasn't any monster special summon there. So I really thought that was a little bit strange that uh, they committed an additional monster, that Kieran, that Kieran right now has no value for that. Basically lost an additional card from hand, and maybe we are getting the turn back. Well done. That is such a crucial point. Is there a single card that can do it? Of course there is, because there is a Snake Eye Oak, and with the opponent's Snake Eye Oak, your own Ash could be revived. Interesting, just summoning out the Droll and Lockbird. There's our Nibiru, the Primal Being, just an incredibly oh, powerful sorry. card since it was first released. And Summon the monster first, Sam. Summon the monster first. Let's get to that point. There we go. Oh, this is oh, big. No. So, using I'm Dark the Dark Charver Gloomy to special summon the Dia Bellstar, and now you get to immediately set one of those great simple spoils cards. I'm sorry, but my dark is really shiny, and your Dia Bellstar likes my dark. <laughs> why, why don't you come over here and hang out with us? Yeah. yeah. And bring, bring an original with you. <laughs> <laughs> well, she definitely brought the original simple spoils, but we haven't activated it yet. Take a look at both players' graveyards. A lot of interesting cards on both oh, sides. Now put back the Dia Bellstar into oh, the other side. Yeah, we want to make sure we're not we running off with Dia Bellstar. Let's yeah. go ahead and collapse you those You almost gave away your heat to last round. Yeah. <laughs> you can... Is that the trade? I'll take the secret rare Dia Bellstar for yours. And here we are. Appaloosa starting off. Okay, this is going to be very, very safe. It looks like we cannot use those dice, obviously, because that would be against the tournament policy guidelines, but it did seem to be it was a two material. And we're going to send away the field spell to get our engine kick started. Now, Appaloosa... Just the safest option here. Your opponent's going to have a hard time getting in if their spells only get them more monsters, and those monsters' effects are negated. That Nibiru token completely cuts off infinite impermanence. It absolutely does. You can play very safely here, and we do know that impermanence is a very popular card right now, and Rashad revealed it earlier in the set. I think the only option available now for Rashad to even make a comeback, you need both Valor and a Nibiru, and you need them in the same chain. You absolutely do. All you can do is pray for the rock to plummet from the sky. 
If that, he shot, that, it's got it. He's got a great poker face. That that token is really in the way now. Like well timed, perfect timing right, right. to make the counterplay, and the counterplay is really just. This rock is just blocking you. It's it's a boulder. It's in the middle of the road here, and uh, it's really hard. It's really really hard. We've seen how many times getting stuck with a token could be the end of the duel, whether it was Sword Soul format or somebody hits you with a Gold Pride Nitro Blaster. <laughs> getting a token stuck on your field locks you out of all those great cards like Infinite and Permanence or Evenly Matched. So it's no joke to give your opponent a monster. We get to the Flamberge Dragon, Flamberge, just coming out every now and then. Every couple, uh, every 20 minutes or so, we're gonna see one summon onto the field. It's yeah. been a little shy this set. It hasn't been the immediate starter. It hasn't been the first thing they've gone for because they know what each other are playing, so they've really gotta make these plays carefully. And speaking of careful plays, let's move oh, that token to the back. He pushed it to the back, but that's okay, I think, because but he still can't use infinite impermanence. Exactly. He might have been more worried about the fact that there was a body on the field, but you're absolutely right. The token just moving the spell and trap zone, that doesn't change anything. No evenly matched, no imperm, no anything. There's a lot of damage on the field here, and we're just basically getting the numbers. We're doing math. This is math class. All right, well, here comes the Bestower of Flames, bringing out some even more numbers. I think and by the way, check out the co-link, by the way. Because Nightmare Phoenix is co-linked with Opelousa, no monsters will be destroyed by battle. And here is the Zelantis. Oh, wow. As long as we can enter battle phase, this could be a very clean finish. There's no effect veiler option. And once you go into the battle phase, you can't use those cards. Exactly. Uh, this is, uh, 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 18 plus 19. Counting out the damage. 18 plus 19. Yeah, that definitely has the damage, for sure. Because Appaloosa has at least 16, x 16, 25, and with the destroyed Phoenix, that's 19, plus onto the Salamangrate. That's definitely over 8,000. So, so, so Making sure that we calculate everything and play this out fairly. Right. That's a, that's a lot of that. No, this is definitely enough. Oh, yeah. This is... Oh, did he not declare the attack? Sorry, Sorry. Like, I'm just going too fast. I'm sorry. Slowing things down just to make sure that we're doing this in order correctly. I was going way too fast. Oh, yeah, I gotta calm down sometimes. I mean, the nerves can get the best of you. Even if you're a seasoned duelist, we've seen it before. Duelists love this game. They can try to play it off cool. They can say, yeah, we're just in it to win it. They love and care about this game. And this is something a little too excited, yeah. They just can't choke on these particular points. No, Appaloosa has about well, at least 16. Two materials, I believe, so he should be 1,600. That's correct. And then you have a 2,500. You know, let's, uh, let's oh, and that, that was here. the handshake, by the way. It looks like they are packing up the cards, so maybe the duel isn't paused after all. It looks like it seems that Pac was, or excuse me, not Pac, Sam was the winner there. Well, Pac's team, Team Supreme Pro. Well, we'll find out after this pause has ended. If we do out the math, we have 2,500. Another 16, okay. Even. I think even if the Phoenix didn't attack, I think it's fine. Oh, yeah, those are yeah. huge numbers. So but again, we've already seen the handshake, so yeah. no need to wonder. We know exactly who took that duel. But it seems like we still have some games going on here. Pac is obviously still currently in play, and so is Hanse as well. Sam leaning over there and just having a great time, but it's true. He's got to slow down, so if his team wins, he needs to represent them well by just keeping his cool and getting ready for the next game. Yes. The judges have decided that Red has a one. So Team Red, Team Supreme Pro is going to be moving on to the finals. That's incredible. So if you guys want to know the math behind all of this, because there's... It ah, but not, not Red one in the sense of the entire team, just Sam one on that side. Oh, just Sam one on that side? Okay, so we are still in it. We still have two more games going on. And so let's talk about the math right there. Because of the Appaloosa existing onto the field, so there is the 2,500 from the Zolantis, mm -hmm. and then there's the at least 16. If there was more material, it could be higher. And there was the also the 19 from the Phoenix. Say the Phoenix didn't attack, okay? And we went for the destruction effect, we summoned back our copy of the Salamangre Raging Phoenix. That would gain the additional 19 anyway, that pushing it over 4,000. But the 16 and the 25 already is more. But, all right, since uh, the current table is complete, we're going to move on to table B, back to pack. Just some fantastic play there. It was really neat to see all those different combos. And you can see Sam just talking with his opponent, Rashad, just all the cool stuff that they got to exchange. But things are very serious over at Pac's table because the duel is still in progress. Well, the Zealant is like a one-turn finish. 
is a very incredible piece in the arsenal. But you know, if people didn't have access to that, you know, some people are saying, oh, Mazzalantis, it should be the next card to go. It's too strong. But if they didn't have that, we have access code. If we didn't have that, there's Boral Sword. If we didn't have that, then we can always move down the line of these monsters that usually are the game closers. Yu-Gi-Oh! has had so many different game mechanics where you combine multiple monsters into powerful bosses that you can access from the extra deck. And you're absolutely right, Access Code Talker, the bane of Master Duel, right? And so many other different cards out there that just really pile it on. So I don't think if there were any changes to the deck and they decided not to use Zelantis anymore, there would obviously be some other powerful link for it at the ready. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, this is a close one. Remember, the previous score now, or at least the current score now, we have one point for sure, one match point just from Sam's table, and uh, the other ones are all tied up. So They're all tied up, that's right. so close. This puts them at a slight advantage, but we're gonna have to see if the other teammates carry through. Gosh, I mean, Sam had the hard part right, he was showing his nerves, and now the easy part's done, but having recently watched a team of my own, it is hard to watch your teammates, like, continue and continue on, and all you can do is just cheer them on. But we're going right into this game three of Pakawat versus his opponent here. Gary smiling, the understands. smiling. Something has happened previously when we entered into this game state. It is currently now Pac's turn. So it looks like Pac has just summoned out Flamberge and offering his deck for a cut on the opposing side. We do see a Snake Eye Ash in the graveyard as well as a set card and a Dia Bell Star. Oh, I wonder what Gary has. Gary, how did we end summon. up with this current game state where I there's will. Nibiru, there is Infinite and Permanence. Oh, and look at the failure. graveyard though. We got to see the graveyard fanned uh, out. We saw Effect Failure. We saw like, two copies of Infinite I know, Permanence. I think the they even saw Nibiru. So well, Gary has certainly been slowing Pac down, but I think Pac is finally on the upswing here. Now Pac has just pushed the Dia Bell Star into the Spell and Trap Zone. I like this type of removal. There's two types of removal that I find to be the most fascinating. Putting back into the deck, that's one. Now, speaking of one, those tied games are really important because since Sam clinched that first game, if Hansei wins or Pac wins, that's going to be a walk-off home run for Team Supreme Pro. Both of the two dudes players who remain, those two dudes, have to win those two duels. That's right. That's correct. And we are banishing that face down card. Oh, that's a huge one. That's a great follow up. You can get the card back. That card couldn't be, uh, can be put back into rotation as long as you have the wanted poster. However, yes, please, please go for it. Uh, getting there is the other question. We don't know how many cards Gary has in his hand at the moment. Good. Doesn't seem like he has very much. Definitely just off camera shot there, but everything seems to be going back way. Combining these monsters. Uh, that 2, oh, Appaloosa. 2,400 attacks, three materials. This is a repeat. Yep. <laughs> the Appaloosa coming down. Are we going to be able to see another Zelantis push it's just, another, you know, mirroring each it's other? It's you know, the play styles double. are the same. It's the deck are the same. We're going to do the exact it's same thing. Hey, they train together. Yeah. Obviously, they're doing it right, but it looks like Pac is passing oh, the turn wow. there. Yep. So now play goes over to Gary. Now, Gary does seem to have more than one card, and we're going to send the Dia Bell Star A4 a Dia Bell uh, Star. Thinking. And one great turn thinking. deserves another. Uh, oh. Oh, chain link oh, two. We're going to see the special summon of the Flamber Dragon through the uh, effect of Divine Temple. Divine Temple, such a good. just like I, I can't believe that we did not play this earlier. It's one of those things where there are so many good field spells that don't make sense at first, and you realize, no, that is the backbone of the deck. They made this card for a reason. And Divine Temple, the Snake Eye, is certainly really getting up there in the pantheon of the gods of just great field spells. Absolutely. And now we have a set, Wanted Seeker um, of the Sinful Spoils. Oh, yeah, oh, there is one in the graveyard, so we're going to be able to put that card back. So the SP not getting as much value for yep. banishing that card, but it does slow it down because now the Dia Buster cannot you know, set that card face down. Will certainly help to get rid of the unknown knowns at the time, but it's true that that just let Gary recycle more resources. Could he have done it the other way? Maybe have done it to put the card back first and then summon the Dia Bell Star? Maybe he could have put that card back in rotation That's immediately? Correct. Might not have wanted to risk it, may uh, wanted to commit responses. that body of the board as fast as possible. So and, oh, Appaloosa taking the hit. Oh, I did not expect that. Yep. Certainly an easy way to get rid of it, just have the bigger monster. But that he did trade away oh, the battle phase for this. So we are now in main phase two. Poplar has been summoned up. Is there any further response? It does resolve. 
Clear communication. I like this. Very clear communication. You've got to get used to it again. This is a two-player game. Here it's technically a six-player game with our team YCS, but you got to communicate with your opponents. And speaking of which, looks like we are going to go ahead and take a look at our Wanted Seeker of Sinful Spoils here. Really just an incredible card there. I'm not sure if that's the best rendering of Dia Bellstar. Maybe that's why she doesn't like those Sinful Spoils so much. Yep, that's correct. Mm -hmm. Flameberg on field, uh, unknown card. Oh, card. that graveyard yep. is so loaded. However, there what still is the Promethean Princess in the graveyard, so not all is lost just yet. There could be a strong follow-up. Yeah, right. As long as the key card gets removed, we could see the turn come back to pack. He already filled both. Oh, now Gary's getting some advice from it's his like, own teammates. I mean, they're so definitely close. helps. I mean, Rashad's done, and he definitely yeah, knows uh, what this wow. deck is. If they recognize oh, that their opponents play. are playing exact Target. identical copies of the decks. Yeah, oh, and now we have the summon of Hita. That is a special summon. Now, you don't want to lose your Promethean cool. Princess at this point. Uh, um, Pack thinking about just that. Here's the Princess in hand. Cycling out of the graveyard. You've got to you do it. You have to use it. Uh, chain Promethean, target, target. Oh, that's the perfect target? Yeah, sure. You're going to give your opponent a carp through the Hita. But uh, here we are. Promethean Princess like destroying two. the two. And Promethean Princess uh, destroying the Flamberge. Nice. Flamberge activating in the graveyard. You know, the Embers are coming back. The little ones are coming back. Now, Hita will go ahead and get a Fire Monster, too. But what's better than Fire Monster is literally two Fire Monsters. And that two Fire Monster is going to bring back another Fire Monster through Snake Eye Oak. And also adding you another card. That's a lot of cards. That's why the recursion of the deck is just so dangerous. Like all these little ones, yeah. We count for multiple huh? cards. Each card counts for at least two. Well, that's why we saw so much success oh, across the tournament yeah, of searching. various this different anti-graveyard strategies, whether it was Kashtira, but the fire decks learn to play around them, so they're hanging in there with the best of them. I think there's an art uh, to this. The yeah. art is the art of survival. You definitely have a lot of little bodies on the board, but you're right that you just can't give up if you see the wrong thing there. So Peck doing a great job bringing out the Poplar there. Poplar, and of course we have also the Ash. So many cards. And the Poplar by getting another card into the hand, and that's why we call them the Snake Eyes. Hey, I mean, it is Vegas. <laughs> Don't roll that. Yep. Don't roll that when you start <laughs> uh, the game. You added, uh, what'd you add off this? Uh, uh, original. original. And, then you added and the original has been added to the hand, yeah, and... Yeah. Oh, there's just so much. Ash is a weird card, being able to add Ash. Well, you want to do it sometimes because, hey, yeah, if you've seen all of the family of Snake Eye monsters, go ahead and get Ash so that next turn you can see all of the family of Snake Eye monsters. Well, the art of survival is key yeah, here good. because one turn is more than enough. The aggression is never the issue. It's the defense. If you, if you can play a perfect defense to survive the turn, getting the turn back, countering uh, with your own one-turn finish. Material, Those fires are sure blowing strong. Ponix is going to go ahead and get into the deck here. Is the Fire King stuff going to be enough now? We've got through the, the so much uh, Pokemon's board, so maybe, the, maybe it's time for Fire King to finally show itself. So I believe we just got a spell card <laughs> added. I'm not sure if that was Fire King <laughs> Island. Or well, I saw the island still in the deck, so I would assume that it would be Sanctuary that was added. Uh, what do you think uh. the best line here? Seems like Gary is asking for what? additional advice. I mean, they're I so I close to they want to make sure they get the best play possible. And, you know, consulting your friends is uh, an option you have at these YCSs. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's kind of like being on a road trip, right? Nothing, Gary's in the driver's seat, and he's got his teammates as his navigators. A nib, like, nothing. Like, uh, sometimes you just want that second opinion. And if I were in their shoes, I would also want a second opinion. Everyone, everything's on the line here. And I would like it so that, you know, we share our turn. You know, we played this one together. So it looks like we did end up grabbing that Fire King Island after all. So we're going to go ahead and activate it onto the field. Now, Puck smiling there, maybe not as worried. Oh, is that a set cosmic cycle? I don't know. Is that something that... I don't think that Pac is the type of person that would have uh, useless cards in uh, the back. And I don't think he's the type that bluffs a lot. And when he bluffs, they're, they're live bluffs. They're actual cards. In it to win it for sure. We are seeing the Fire King Island destroy the Ponix in order to go grab something. No, I destroyed the Kirin. Oh, okay, yeah. Okay, there's going to be some solid follow-up here. Now, we're going to get the, the action from the Sacred Grunix added to hand Single and the... Two what? High One King character Avatar, character. Yeah. or sorry, the Fire King Avatar, High Kirin. Speaking of road trip, looks like I got turned around. It was the Ponix who went to the graveyard for Link Karibo's Link Summon, and then the Fire King Island, of course, destroying the sure. Kirin. And the face down is across the desert. It was a live card after live all. Live card. Unfortunately, yep. being a pure Snake Eye deck, you cannot hit any of the Fire King cards. It's true. How do you play against the mirror match? Eh, just run something different. A bottom foot. Yep. 
Oh, this is going to be a tough position for Pac now. With the Arvada being put onto the field, there's now going to be a monster negation on the turn following up. The Sacred uh, Fire Garunix, or Sacred Fire King Garunix, that one is a much stronger monster here. Well, now we're going to the extra deck, speaking of strong monsters, and we did see that Nightmare Unicorn. Perhaps maybe this is the time to get rid of it. Obviously, the board is clear, so if you were worried about Cosmic Cyclone before, well, now you don't have to be because you cleared that, that face down. This is interesting. Looking at the current field, most of those Snake Eye monsters, they're in defense yeah. position. Even though their attacks are boosted by that Divine Temple. Huh? Does it also boost the defense? No, I believe it only boosts the attack. I think 1,100 each. 1,100 is a lot. That puts them around like 19, 18, 2,000. Big numbers for sure. That matters a lot. Only if because, we get that far. Because most of these only have 200 defense, and I believe Link Karibu has 300 attack. 300 attack is not going to be able to get rid of any of these monsters. I don't know, but they're in defense. They only have 200 defense. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm mm. They're going to be able to push through you, but uh, we'll see what's the best way to clear it. We're going to go SP. SP, we're going to banish. It seems like we're not going to be finishing it off this turn, but we're going to clear off some of these cards. Oh, banishing the Oak is significant. Now, it really has come all the way down to this. Levi taking two games against Hansei is one. And then Rashad had lost previously to Itapot. So again, Gary versus Pack. this is it. Again, art of survival. You just need to survive. You just need to survive and you'll make your way back. Both teams probably saying that same thing to themselves. Just got to hang in there, hang in there. But again, this is only the semifinals. Another team awaits. Uh, I'm wondering if there's any other disruption in the graveyard that Pac may Didn't or may not have. No, I started my turn with Nomos on the top left. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Oh boy, the popular never actually got the no. actual effect to summon itself out. Oh, this is a tight position. If we count the numbers here, we have about yeah. six so link materials worth of monsters. May be able to close it out here. Again, even the life points are tied 6,300 to 6,300. What a nail biter. If Pac does not have a card in hand, we may see a reverse of a Zelantis push. Now, we are getting kind of low here on the clock, so a reminder for our friends at home, this is going to be a single elimination round, so there cannot be a draw. Our judges are here to help our players understand the single elimination time rules, so we'll get into that if it comes up. Okay, so Flambridge has been summoned onto the field. Flambridge has the ability to push one of those monsters into the spell and trap zone, but is that even necessary if we go for a Zelantis play? Feel like Zelantis might be the weapon of choice here. Obviously, we have seen so much of it on the Fire King side, and you could really do it on the Snake Eye side too. But it's just about whether or not you could do it, because remember, we did see that SP Little Knight, no attacking directly this turn. Oh, this is so close. Don't, you know, you don't want to choke at the end. Yeah, you already used it. Don't run us off the road. Which one? The popular one. Yeah. Don't say the wrong the thing. One. Don't speak too fast. Think about everything you want to say first, because once you say something, you commit into it. Poplar has been pushed into the Spell and Trap Zone now. I know. It, the pressure is so high right now. The players do not want to make a single mistake. All okay. their friends at home are watching, and literally their friends are on stage watching yeah. it too. And we're going to special summon into the Sunlight yeah. Wolf. Okay. And Flam Burge effect. Time to do a resource raid, getting Ponix over there so we can add a fire monster. I mean, you definitely don't want to mess up yep. here, but the yeah, clock is running so low. We have a clock. Oh, so they have a clock. Mm -hmm. You know how much time is it, right? Okay, yeah. so two monsters have been summoned onto the field. And Salamangra effect? Are we going to use the effect or not? I mean, you summon it into the zone. Resources do matter here. Oh, looking into that extra deck. Not locked into fire monsters like your opponent oh. is. Maybe time it's to do something time. different. I can't tell if there is a card in Pac's hand. We're even. We're well, even. that's what happens. We're coming to the middle of the game, so yes. just trying to no. break it apart. Clock's going oh. down. Yeah, Everybody's certainly even. aware. Life points are even, so it's going to come down to we're, some we're interesting we're plays. And again, there cannot be a draw. We have to have one team advance. So how does this actually work when you get into time in Top Cut? So it should be checking at the end of the current phase when time is called. Then, if the life points are the same, you would go to the end of the current turn. If the life points are the same, then you would go to an additional turn, and you would go on that turn-by-turn -turn basis. But it's not first damage, it's at the end of the turn, the life point totals. Okay. Oh, I think there may be a slow play applied. 
That might be a three minute time extension, so we might be getting a little bit of time back on the board, but again, you do have to pick up the pace yeah. there. I know there's a lot of pressure, but you still have to play at a reasonable pace. Again, we talk about it a lot. It is a Yu-Gi-Oh! competition. You may be great at your cards, but you do also need to observe the rules of the game. I won battle just so we would be even, so I didn't lose in time. Just got a hang tight. You got follow-up. Oh, there's so many things to consider. They even considered the clock as well. Well, this was a 55-minute round. I know, I know. That's but a lot with of these, time. It's these incredibly difficult to navigate. Both players having points of interaction every time you play a card. It is going to be difficult to kind of keep things moving. He just got follow-up. <laughs> and there's no need to get angry at each other. <laughs> oh, he's not. He's just saying that, hey, man, Pac's good. That Gary is putting respect on his opponent's name. Exactly. <laughs> He's exactly, both of them I, are just good toys. It's like, it's good Yu-Gi-Oh! I know the teammates are like, oh, you gotta win this, you gotta win this. Like, they're having the nail-biter of their life. Oh, goodness. Like I said, you know, last week was just too much for me watching my own teammate. I, I really feel for the guys on stage. All right, well, I'm pretty sure we're gonna be able to escape this current phase, but there's only two minutes and 20 seconds and less. Taking a look at that and graveyard. That graveyard is loaded. Now there is loaded with some of the greatest cards I've ever seen in the game. It's so shiny. So shiny. A summon limit in there, Hita, SP, cross out. Oh my goodness. That's the most starlight or quarter century grave I've seen. All shine all the time, but we're not done yet. Looks like we might be doing Deco Talk or he Oh no, it would be Deco Talk or There are monsters in the There's an SP. I think there might be an uh, is there an IP? And the witch. Yeah. Okay. Looks like we're going for DBL so the Black Witch. No, the SP Little Knight. Interesting. Gives you additional link arrows as well. He's got to pick up the pace here. Huh? He has to pick That's up the I'm pace. About doing. I mean, like, you're so close to making it to the finals. No, you, you don't want to fumble, but you also don't want to get issued another slow play. <laughs> slow playing right now, especially with the judge next to you, the oh, one yeah. who just issued you for not playing quick enough. Oh, that could be a really risky move here. Yeah, you do need to keep up the place to play of the game, and it's just incredible because, again, looking back on this, this is either going to be the greatest decisions he's made or decisions he regrets till the next tournament. He's got three cards. I do damage, I win. Yeah, this was three minutes, right? Yeah, it's a minute left. I'm talking about this. One minute left. Do they not have access code? I mean, that's the joke. They're sleeping on access code, Talker, but I'll tell you, it's pretty good. And we are seeing people use Link Monsters of all different attributes. Might be something to think about for that 15th extra deck slot. Hold on a second. That's a Diabelt or Summon from Selene, correct? That is That should be in defense position. Mm, you're right. That should be in defense. Oh, but there's a Zelantis. If you're using the Zelantis effect, that's going to reposition everything. But is that enough? Okay, that's going to help reposition. That's going to help reposition that Diabell Star. That would correct the, that game state. Just you have to be very, very careful. That's why you can't put a Link Spellcaster in the grave and special summon it via Selene. Now, remind me, is this the same turn in which Gary used the effect of the SP Little Knight to banish a card, preventing him from attacking directly? Oh, oh, it's been such a long no, turn. No, can he can he not actually attack? I'm not too sure. Snake Eye Oakwad banished. That's correct, that's correct, but I know our judges are paying attention, our players are too. Has the Snake Eye Oak gotten banished on this turn? I'm not is quite that, sure. It's been, it's been a very long turn. Is that why Pac is so calm? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe that's the secret he's sitting on. Yeah, I said anything on res, I nibbed him. There's nothing else. Hmm? I leave the princess. But huh? there is an Ash on the field, and that is not a direct attack. Mm -hmm. That would just be big damage, and oh, then you end the phase, and that would be all she wrote. Uh, now they're arguing about the what's the correct play. You know, I know you like the teammates' support, but you know, you're, at the end of the day, you're the pilot right here, sitting, you know, in control. Exactly. What a great team, YCS. We've got great commentators on the stage as well, narrating what exactly well, Gary and Pack should do from their teammates' perspective. If they can't attack directly, would that be the end? It's okay. Yeah, so how this is going to work is that um, as at, at the end of the current I hear judges are explaining. Yep. yep. I hear cards being shuffled. Maybe there's a Nibiru. Okay. Could be. If it's not the same, if, if at the end of the phase, if at the end of the turn the life is not the same, then we win. Guys, whoever has higher life wins. So, so check, every, at, check at the end of every turn, correct? Correct. Okay. That's correct. Just like we talked about, it's at the end of every turn. It's not just because you got to scratch along the way. You have to get to the end of that turn. Is it okay? Thinking. I want to But we did use Nibiru. That's where the confidence came from. 
<laughs> I'm gonna have to do math again. Let's get out let's, of the no, Let's do it. Now, Diabelle Star does not have yeah. that many defense points. I don't think it's equivalent of. The, uh, if you get the yeah, Ash plus D about start, is that 3,000 so defense? Really if it's under, for, under we have a, an uh, opportunity to get that victory. Uh, well, Diabelle Star's got the beautiful Dark Magician sets, 2,500 attack, 2,000 defense. Three, so that'll be uh, all the that the Nibiru token uh, would have besides 3, the defense from the Snake Eye Ash. Uh, Snake Eye Ash, I believe, has only 200 uh, defense, three, if I'm not mistaken. Fire Monster with 200 defense? What year is this? Awesome it's a thousand defense. A thousand. It's actually pretty big. That's why when the Link Karibo was on the field, Pac yeah, probably wasn't sweating it. Okay. Now, I remember and most of the Snake Eye cards, they do have 2,000 defense. But Pretty this is not the monsters. one. Now, this is a very big Nibir token. Are we going to see a follow-up on this? Now, don't worry about that Divine Temple. It can't push out that Poplar. <laughs> it was already used earlier that turn. See? We talked about this earlier, the okay. art of survival. The art of survival, that's all you gotta do is see the light of another turn. And that light is called Nibiru. <laughs> it is a light monster after all. Um, I just don't care, that's it. Yeah, just care, yeah. Oh boy. At least that's a light token. Normal summon. Normal summon. No. Oh. We're gonna use the effect of Snake Eye Ash. Does pack run anima? Relinquish Anima, is that in the deck list? That is not in the deck list. So you even in that zone, I don't think that would really matter. So that's not an option. What's that? Almost uh, telegraphing it, though. It, almost. That's <laughs> okay? Yeah. We're going to use the effect of Poplar summoning itself from the hand. And we do have that Link Karibo in the graveyard just to dodge yeah, any effect over. negation yeah. here, but obviously Infinite Permanence won't be dropping down from the hand. And yeah. from Both Pax right, memory right. seems to indicate that it's Let's only a Kieran in hand. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pack just not Karibo letting Gary close out that game. It was so close. Defense. Waiting for them to commit super, super hard. Very patient, not uh, telegraphing effect. anything. And then, you know, when the chips are down, the Nibiru came down too. Oh, absolutely. You know, Pack's team, not necessarily made of the same members, but Pack was on a winning team from the Team YCS just last week. So, certainly comfortable, definitely played these different matchups and getting this game on. Pack is the winning team. <laughs> <laughs> That's the secret sauce. The secret sauce and pack. Uh, I would not, you know, discredit Kamal or Ruben. They are also oh, no, very they decorated great duelists. Stuff, great stuff. Using like some of the most respected Rebo? duelists out there. Oh yeah, and just teasing, just teasing. Effect of Nightmare Phoenix. Discord just synchron target island. Oh, the, see, this is what I mean by letting the Fire Island just stay on the field, okay, turning into a liability. That's gonna destroy the token. Also, now to we're going to attack mode. That might um, be all she wrote. Confirm, at the end of the turn, whoever has more life wins the duel. That's a lot of damage, though. That's 19 plus that another 3,000. Sure. Yeah. That's what I said. Is there a Nibiru? Nope, that is a Kirin. I think Kirin's going to destroy another monster in the hand. That's going to be the Snake Eye Ash, and that's going to summon out Kirin in defense. But Kirin only has 200 defense, though. Ooh. And Flamberge is going to summon no out. out. That's so hard. Yes. This is very difficult. Everything yep. lined up now. There's going to also be the Garunix being summoned onto the field. Now you have a very big problem. You have to deal with also the Snake Eye Flamberge Dragon, and if you destroy that, well, two more monsters no come out. I, exactly. Pack just taking a commanding position, no matter what Gary puts on the table. Pack is just like, okay, now I'm going to use this card, and that's how you get this far in the tournament. Yeah. Even though the Fire King deck may have a little bit of an advantage. This feels like a little playground argument. Oh, well, if I play this, I'll have this then. Or if you play this, I'll have that then. And this is exactly the back and forth that we're seeing on this field. No, I play this card. No, I play this card. And we're still not done yet here. I think I popped that. With the Princess and then Kieran. Don't get the Monster Negate. Uh, Promethean Princess. Okay. How I'm negating that. They're attempting to find some way to get an Arvada to negate. No, I'm popping this here. The, uh, uh, Flamber Dragon. Certainly honest um, Yu-Gi-Oh here again, you do have to communicate fully yeah, and out loud yeah. to your uh, players that you're working with so your opponents so do you, get to listen in and know what's coming up next. Or their code words. And what else? Okay. They're targeting Nib, the Nibir and uh, the Garunix? Looks like it. Trigger, trigger. Is this, this is such a tight position. I mean, these players aren't in the top four seat for no reason. They are here 
because they know what they're doing and they know how to maximize the advantage. They've proven they are champion duelists already. Some of them are literally having these trophies already at home, but that doesn't matter to them. They want to take home another victory. They are true, passionate duelists. So because of that, Kieran, see Kieran in the hand, this is one of those plays that the Fire Kings are able to make. Just destroy a, a random fire monster and set off the entire graveyard. Just light a match into the graveyard and they're all going to just burst right back out. Suddenly we're off to the races indeed. And Pack taking one last pensive look at the graveyard, all the cards that have been used so far. But this is... You see what I'm seeing, right? You see what I'm seeing? Yeah. Okay. Sure. A little bit of that code word stuff. You see what I'm seeing? You see what I'm seeing? I see what I'm seeing. Yeah. Summon Insane. out the Arvada oh, and oh. destroying the Flamberge. I see it now. And then now new I'll go uh, new triggers. Yeah. Uh, new triggers. Um, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. One, two. Yeah. Like, no, yeah. why, why don't Just you, so why, careful letting the duels do their own talking here. Why can't swing over that and win, and win the game? Yes, game. Yeah, sure. I mean, or you could, you could, you could, you could play too as, mm. as well. No, I'm not going to trigger nothing. Nothing. Oh, no triggers. No response. Because uh, there is a Superstar Slayer Typhon attacking into What a great the, way to Wow! Do it. Just absolute incredible work. You think I'm going to You think I'm going to need my my, my my Flamberge? No. Instead, I'm just going to hit with Flamberge. And a huge, huge Star Slayer. The Typhon. I did not expect to see Typhon Sky Crisis come off the field, but you know, he found every single possible option. He thought that he was going to come Completely countered, but you know what? We're in time. I guess we're gonna have just to do damage, right? Then and who else can do it other than Typhon with the 2900 attack over the 2700 Promethean Princess? Just a giant monster, but just a little too small. Excellent play. You can hear our crowd applauding. Obviously, we've got a little bit of a, a line. I mean, everybody is excited to see this duel. And, and honestly, look at this, too. They're so excited to make it through. Hanse and Sam just having to cheer for Pack and just hope that he makes it. He did. However, we still have one more set here. Can you believe that we have finally gotten this far in the tournament? Oh, it is incredible. Now, these winners here, they're going to have to get comfortable in those seats again. They might be going to the blue seat this time. We're not spoiling the surprise, but we still didn't see that card. Yeah, that, card that card, oh my goodness, if we see that in the finals, I'm going to be just screaming. If you hear somebody just pop off in the background, it might be me. But again, <laughs> we have an interview coming up. But before that, let's talk about our top four teams and how we got here. Supreme Pro beat two dudes, 2-2-1. Two, two, the Jawari brothers beat Falagarada and the Disciples, 2-1. Two, two, so now our finals here is the Supreme Pros and the Jawari brothers. I have no idea who could possibly win out of these amazing champions. It's going to be a really exciting set. That's don't go away. We have the interview coming up with our current winners of the round. So don't go away. We'll be right back after a short break.
We are here on stage after an incredibly exciting top four feature match. I'm here with the winners, ready for an interview. I'd say I know you've dueled in the feature match area a lot, so I'm going to ask you a little bit of a different question. How excited are you to reach the finals with two of your close friends? Amazing. Phenomenal. Nothing better. These guys right. are great. All right, Pac, we saw the end of that last game there. Is there anything that stood out in that critical match against Snake Eyes? Uh, not much. He's got to be patient, you know? So I just sat there and waited and then just strike like a snake. Like Snake Eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Sam, with this final match coming up, would you prefer to play against Snake Eyes or Fire King Snake Eyes? No matter. <laughs> Doesn't know my way. Any deck. Voiceless, perhaps. <laughs> Voiceless, please. No, we got so low. Sorry. I, 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 sorry. <laughs> Voiceless. Awesome. A lot of excitement here at the feature match at the top four, but I'm going to send it back to the booth before our final feature match. That's how you know you have the heart of a true duelist. I mean, they are still, they went, they lived through that. That might as well have been a finals, and they're still excited for more Yu-Gi-Oh! Yeah, they got to get comfortable in those seats. I mean, they've warmed up the seats already, to be honest. And a pack mentioned, you have to be patient. This is definitely the patience format. You can't just jump right into it. You have to just kind of sit and watch and wait. And just like you said, just strike like a snake and grab victory from the jaws of defeat. That's right. Oh, wow. That is just, I, I don't know how I am going to live through the finals with excitement like that. And again, there's still so many great moves that we have left to see, so many great duelists that we have left to feature here. We're down to the final six players, the final two teams. Again, it's the Jawari brothers versus our Supreme Pro. It's insane. But if you didn't get to go to this event, we have plenty of great events coming up in the future, the Phantom Nightmare OTS Championships, where you get that beautiful plan that we were talking about with the Promethean Princess. We also have upcoming the Speed Duel GX uh, Midterm Paradox release celebration on March 27th through April 7th. The Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series comes to Medal in Columbia in March 30th through 31st, as well as the Remote Duel Main Event Series returning on March 30th through 31st as well. We'll be at Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series Raleigh, North Carolina, April 20th through 21st. And then finally, the Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series returns to one of the greatest gaming cities of all time, Indian and check a look at our World Championship Qualifiers. There's the Central America World Championship Qualifier in Mexico City in Mexico, June 21st to 23rd. We have the South America World Championship Qualifier in Lima, Peru, June 28th to the 30th. Oceanic World Championship Qualifier in Auckland, New Zealand, June 28th to 30th. And the North American World Championship Qualifier here in Austin, Texas, Yeehaw. July. <laughs> at July 19th to 21st, and the European World Championship Qualifier in Berlin, Germany, July 26th to 28th. Can you tell I'm excited that Yu-Gi-Oh! was coming back to Texas? Because I'm excited that Yu-Gi-Oh! was coming back to Texas. <laughs> I think I can tell. <laughs> but again, those events are them. Yeah. We still have the finals. Some we one team, one gonna team. Crowned. They're going to be crowned the Team YCS Champion here in Las Vegas. Looking forward to it, but we don't get there until we have a short break. But please don't go anywhere. It's about to get insane from here.
25th anniversary to the Yu-Gi-Oh card game. Hey everyone, I'm Wai Chang, and I am the voice of Nail Sayonji in Yu-Gi-Oh 7s. Thank you so much for coming to join our stream. My favorite Yu-Gi-Oh memory has to be the first virtual cast meetup that we did for 7s. Um, I just remember thinking that everyone was so smart and funny and talented, and I just knew that I was going to be a part of something really, really special. Nail's most iconic line? <laughs> what a curious question! Everything he says is iconic. It feels genuinely wonderful to be a part of something that brings so many people so much joy. You know, whenever I go to a convention and I see someone cosplaying as a Yu-Gi-Oh character, or I'm scrolling on a social and I uh, see a post about, you know, the winner of that month's tournament, it legit brings a smile to my face. You know, when I was a kid, I actually had a teacher who introduced me to Yu-Gi-Oh and gave me my first pack of cards. So years later, getting to voice Nail and Sevens, I mean, it's a full circle moment. If I could play any other character in Yu-Gi-Oh, it would be Pegasus. I mean, come on, Yugi boy. Thank you again for joining our stream. We really appreciate everyone's donations, and I just hope everyone has a good day. Peace. And welcome back to Team YCS Las Vegas, Nevada here at the Expo at the World Market Center. We're streaming here live and we are down to the wire. This is it. This is the final round. We're getting close. And uh, these players, they fought a long, hard weekend to make it to the final seat. They had to play 10 rounds of Swiss over the course of the first two days and then of course throughout the top 16 bracket. And let's actually take a look at the bracket, at least the latter stages of the bracket here. We saw in the previous feature match, Supreme Pro victorious over two dudes, but we kind of had going on behind the scenes where the Jawari brothers defeating Fala Galeria and the Disciples, which now leaves us with Supreme Pro versus the Jawari brothers in our finals. Yes, this is it. Two teams going in, one team coming out, the champion. This is very exciting. If you look at the amount of premier event wins for these players, it's more than my hand can count. Seriously, the team that walks out of here is just gonna add to a list of credentials that's really quite profound already. I think there's over 11 premier wins. Hanse has the championship winner. He's also one of the older WCQ winners as well. Chris with the five w, uh, YCS wins. Hani has Two wins, Heisem uh, uh, has one, Pack has three, and even Sam has the invitational win for the remote duel. Which means we have a variety of differing wins. We've got 3v3 victories within this, we have remote duel YCS, traditional YCS, the championship. Across the board. The WCQ across the board, every type of victory you can imagine. And these are wins, these are not tops, these are wins. So we are Moments away of getting into our finals, we're gonna be introducing into our finalists shortly as we pass it to Steven. Again, I cannot believe how incredible this weekend is. That last match just took my breath away, but we still are not done yet. So let's go ahead and introduce one of our final teams. It's the Jawari brothers. Again, holding it in the A spot is going to be Christopher. In the B spot is Hani, and in the C spot is Haisung. Now this wouldn't be a tournament again without incredible opponents for them to face, and we know the Supreme Pros can do it. So let's go ahead and have the Supreme Pros take the stage for their encore performance. You know them well, in the A spot, it's Hansei. In the B spot, it's Pac. And Sam is holding it down in the C spot. I mean, at this point, the seats have warmed up to them. They've been in the red seat for some time now. I think they're basically, you know, this is the comfort seat now. They're, they're making themselves at home. 
They're about to establish a home field advantage, having sat in those <laughs> seats now in our top eight feature match, top four feature match, and now here in the finals. Ah, the incredible performance. A lot of people think, oh, you know, this is gonna be uh, the easiest tournament ever. Well, not anymore. Everyone here, championship level players, very difficult, very difficult. I can't imagine just staring down any of these players. These are all, like, if you fought them 1v1, it'd be just insane. And this is what they're playing for, the trophy, the title, and all the other prizes that they're gonna get and uh, they're just moments away. Now remember, we are going into the final round, which means the clock is now 65 minutes, and they still need best two out of three, two out of three. Yeah, hopefully they played a nice quick pace and time doesn't matter with the additional 10 minutes past what we saw in the top four. I don't think it should be much of an issue, so it'll be fantastic to watch these top tier players. One thing I want to point out here is Supreme Pro is on the cusp of not only taking down this entire weekend, but doing so without dropping a full map. They're coming into this round with 12 total wins across the Swiss and the top cut with one single draw and of course, no losses. As in contrast to the Jawari brothers, they do have 11 wins, but they have two losses on their current record and zero draws. And the feature table that we're gonna be taking a look at is going to be table B, Hani Jawari versus Pakowet Pam Sormwet. And honestly, even though the Jamari brothers had those two losses during Swift, Swiss, it doesn't really matter all that much if they're able to take home those three trophies. Yeah, it's all about winning the finals, really. <laughs> Nobody asks how you got there necessarily when they see the trophy. They just know that you earned it. <laughs> you did it. That's true. That's true. It'd just be a cool crowning achievement, not only to say that you were able to win the 3v3 YCS with two of your close friends, but that you did it without dropping a match the entire time. Because, you know, we talk so much and we have over the course of this weekend about how you might individually lose your match, but if your two close friends are able to pick it up on their end, you end up winning and moving on. One thing that we should report though is unfortunately Sam does have a game loss for swearing after his previous match, which means his team is actually already going to be down a single game. He'll be playing at the C spot against Heisum. Yeah, you gotta be careful. Remember, unsporting conduct is still unsporting conduct. Just be very careful. Remember, you're in a large stage. You gotta do what you gotta do, but you know, keep it, you know, keep it nice and clean. You know, it's critical to understand that we're not playing at our kitchen table anymore. We're playing here on the bright lights under a lot of stress. Yeah. Although the stakes are really high and the emotion front really high, you do have to be wary about your language. Yeah. Well, the players are about to get ready. I think they're just about to shuffle up. Once they shuffle up, I mean, the clock will be, will start ticking. So that'll be even bigger of an accomplishment for Supreme Pro if they're able to pull this out. Not only will they be able to walk away without dropping a match, they're gonna potentially have to do so in the finals with one of their teammates having been down a game because of a game loss. That's an unfortunate disadvantage. <laughs> we talked about the advantages of just having all your team just basically being one game up and being one game down before the clock even starts. It definitely hurts. But if there's any team that I think could pull it out, it's definitely going to be Supreme Pro. Yeah, I mean, they've just been outperforming everyone, going undefeated on day one, and in day two, they kept that undefeated record all the way through, and all the way through with the top cuts as well. I don't know, that's a crazy achievement. I mean, if you're playing like four rounds of Yu-Gi-Oh! at locals, and it's like, oh, I go in undefeated, okay, cool. But then we go eight rounds, that's like very impressive already, securing like a top cut spot, but then you continue that streak. Man, these guys, they can't stop, won't stop winning. 13 rounds thus far. 13 rounds, oh wow, that's... 45 minutes around, you do the math, you know, that's a lot of Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> 10 hours of basically undefeated Yu-Gi-Oh! <laughs> exactly. It's really quite impressive. And we are getting started here into game number one of the YCS Las Vegas Finals. Waiting for the judges' queue to start the game. And they're about to roll the die. That's a three that we can see on camera. Ten. But start. that's a 10, yeah, we'll uh, definitely going to be more. Looking into the strategy, we have Fire King Snake Eye again versus regular Snake Eye. It feels like they're just competing for dominance here. It's been the theme of the weekend, and again, the question that I've asked several times is, what is better, Snake Eyes or Fire Kings incorporating Snake Eyes? Well, this match will be very indicative of which of those two decks ultimately reign supreme this weekend. I feel like these two players are at the pinnacle of their deck list. They know what the builds are. They know what's the best interactions. That's why they're here in the finals. Honey starting off with a Bonfire, getting Ash. I think this is a good call because when you open with a Bonfire, usually it could prove to be a weaker hand. But we've seen the follow. We've seen the Diabell Stars follow up and still push the play through. But does Honey have that? 
I think one thing that's indicative about the way Pac plays is he's so well-tuned for how to use his hand interruptions. He can look at his hand, evaluate the quantity of which he's opened with when going second, place his hand down, watch his opponent play, and instantly know that Bonfire is going to be met with Ash. That was predetermined when he opened his hand. It's an important thing to do. Even though if you're going second, you can look at your hand and kind of predetermine which of your hand interactions you would choose to use based on some of the common sequences. Now, Hani follows up with a normal summon of Poplar. Poplar yeah. gets negated by effect failure. That graveyard is very, very shiny. Now there's even more follow-up, but now we're looking at the Fire King Island. If only there was a Jorn Lockbird so that we don't have to commit that many cards, but the Snake Eye deck sure. is one deck that definitely can use very few resources to generate a full field of an advantage. And unfortunately for Hani here, he's sending an Oak from the hand, which is not necessarily the most ideal card to destroy. But at least as a fire attribute. It is a, well, yes, of course. That's going to add the Sacred um, Fire King Garunix. Sure. Garunix Special effect, Summon. Sure. Effect of Sacred Fire King Garunix. So presumably he's going to destroy Ponix from his deck. Yes. Since there are no Fire King monsters in the graveyard, there's no real value in destroying the ones that would normally just Special Summon another monster. And we're going to be destroying the Ponix. Unfortunately, you know, in one end, you wouldn't be able to do this if you didn't draw the Fire Island, but that Ponix, when it returns back in the opening turn, isn't going to necessarily generate a ton of advantage. He's only going to be able to search the Sanctuary when he summons it next time. Oh, wow. High Sum has already taken one game so far, but that was, of course, from the game loss, so this is the current score update. We have all the matches basically taking off 0-0 with Chris versus uh, Hanse. We have Hani versus Pac, that's what we're seeing right now, and uh, High Sum versus Sam. 1-0. So we see yep. Hida hitting the field. He's yet to yep. use the effect. Well, now he is, of course, on Ash Blossom. The Grunix made its way to the Spell and Trap card zone as a result of Poplar. Sure. And now we see the first princess of probably many that we're going to see here in the finals today. Yep. I mean, that's why Ash Blossom Joyous Spring is a little bit of a liability by sharing that fire attribute. So one of the things here is by utilizing the Fire Island uh, to destroy the Oak, he can now special summon it later in the turn with Promethean Princess. Okay. And now having yeah, the Ponix in the graveyard, it kind of makes a lot of sense as to why you destroy that with Karunix. Sure. It put the other level one into the graveyard. Okay, so now we have summoned out the Ponix onto the field. That's going to trigger, and we're going to add a card into our hand. And it seems like we have added Sanctuary. Yeah, a level one that adds some value. Of course, he has the Poplar in his graveyard as well. But there's a little bit of incremental value because now he'll have a face-up card on the field in case he has original simple spoils. Or just the Oak Effect, for example. Oak Effect? Yeah. That's going to be successful. There's not a lot of disruption for that anymore because the Ash Blossom has already been used. It's not negated. And we're going to summon out the Snake Eye Ash. Hani's done a really good job of showcasing how to navigate through hand interactions because although he's been met with both Ash yep. Blossom and Effect Veiler, it doesn't really seem like it's affected him too much. And we're going to special summon out the Snake Eyes Flambear's Dragon through the effect of Ash. I mean, one of the advantages of playing the Fire King package is that you can use the Sanctuary and you pay costs. Everything that lives on the field is just another aspect to get access to more Snake Eye cards and using that to pay cost. We're using the effect of Flambear's. And we are putting yeah, sure. the Hita into the spawn trap zone. I think that's going to allow us for a little bit of follow-up later on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one and a half or two. We've seen a variety of things put into the spawn yeah. trap card zone. Obviously, IP and SP yeah. are some of the more common ones, but we've seen everything from Link Rebo to Hita. Mm -hmm. Flexibility of Flame Flameberg is just fantastic. You can set it up as an interruption. You can not only interrupt yep. by actually special summoning something like IP back. Bringing back your opponent's mm -hmm. Link Rebo is an interruption inherently as well. Yeah, and uh, now we've got into the Salamangra Sunlight Wolf, and the Flamber Dragon has been sent to the grave, but that's going to summon out the Snake Eye Oak and the Ash into the arrow. I'm not sure if you used the effect to add no, anything just here, yet. I think. This was here? Yeah. It was on the end. It was, oh, it was on the end? Oh, like, it, was, it was just in between? It was above oh, okay. Okay. Oh, okay, sure. yeah, just be careful of the zoning right there. Checking. I think he wants to yep. potentially add the Oak back to his hand, yeah, so he wanted to wait to go into Link Rebo. Mm -hmm. And now we're going to proceed to Link Summon further with... Uh, Different attributes, cyber monsters. Are we going for the additional draw? 
and of course we are. I already cut, yep. you, you need that value, and remember, using that particular effect of the deco target heat, so will cost a thousand life points. That thousand life points makes the reach a little bit shorter when it comes to the later end combos if you need to deal damage. Here is a copy of IP Mascarena. Look into the graveyard. We have loaded the graveyard with a copy that of is. the Promethean Princess. So that's a form of follow-up. Uh, I believe there's also a Garunix in the graveyard. So that's another form of follow-up. And Here not to mention the IP okay. Masquerina as I well. That can turn to SP or other cards. My turn? Yeah. Draw. Honey just told his teammates I made full board through two hand interruptions. Divine Temple vote. Ooh, Divine Temple of the Snake Eye. Ooh, and Hani has the brutal combination of Effect Veiler and Nibiru in his hand. Well, if anyone's going to play through it, it's going to be Pac. Pac has been playing through that time and time again through this entire tournament. He's very comfortable with that. But Hani is also a very skilled player. Will he find the patience and the timing to land those two hand interruptions? Flambear Dragon has been placed into the spell trap zone through the field spell. Lullaby of Obedience. Ooh, Ooh here it this is. is the card that we've been waiting for. Lullaby of Obedience. You can call any card in your opponent's deck. You know, if they have it, they have to give it to you either summon it onto the field or give it to you in your hand. And it allows you to search whether it's Poplar or Ash. Either of them oh, would have triggered their effects. So good. Not only are they sharing graveyard now, they're now yes. more or less sharing the deck. So now you talk about cards like Reinforcements of the Army, Bonfire that allow you to search your deck for specific monsters. When you activate exactly. Lullaby of Obedience, it's almost like you go from three copies of Bonfire to six copies of Bonfire in these mirror match. Resolve. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Resolve. if you say you called sure. the Poplar, you'd be adding a Poplar into your hand. You could just activate and just summon yes, it up for free exactly. as well. It's crazy. It sort of mitigates the ability of your opponent to decide whether or not it goes into the field or hand with a card like Poplar. Mm. But Lullaby of Obedience does cost life points to activate. It's quite a steep cost nonetheless. Worth it. You need help, Heishmer, now? No. You good, Chris? Okay. Uh, Honey, while right, waiting for Pack to play, just checking up on his teammates. So this is Team YCS. Give us our Debout Star, uh, on the special summon, uh, using the Ash to send to the grave and get that special. That does not activate. Now we're going to activate the Debout Star to set one of those sinful spoil speller traps into the spell trap zone. That's going to be the original. Original. Curious here if Hani is going to respond with the IP Mascarena. So you can use SP to banish it, but there are ways to kind of recur it as long as we have additional copies of the wanted secret of sinful spoils to keep that into rotation. Thank you. Honey's very patient with his IP mask, right? even though there are okay, monsters being developed. Yeah. I think we're going to use the effect now to use Deco Takahizo to draw a card, so that's going to put them at equal life points, 6,000 six, six. to 6,000. The value of getting a Sunlight Wolf effect, a Heat Soul effect on your turn, and then a Heat Soul effect on your opponent's turn. It's just one of these decks where it seemingly plays to the board while replenishing your hand. It's a really brutal one-two combo. Mm -hmm. Effect of IP. Sure. We're going to use the effect of IP Mascarena. Summon. With the Link Rebo, we're going to summon out the SP Little Knight. Okay. That's going to have a trigger effect because it did use an extra uh, deck monster. And uh, one thing to note is that it doesn't uh, just banish cards on the field, it also banishes okay, cards so in the graveyard. So let's see where he goes Changing with this SP. Two. It is going to be for that original Sinful Spoils. Banish. That was my instinct when he okay. originally said it with the Black Witch. Uh, well, well, even though you couldn't get stopped, say, by an Ash Blossom, you do commit it to the field and uh, risk getting hit by other cards. One thing to note, because Hani did special summon, Pack is now able to summon the Flame Burge from his Spell and Trap card zone with the Divine Temple. And that is the opponent's turn, so it can have an additional fall, but just taking away opponent's monsters, too. Mm -hmm. This is a, an interesting situation. You can feel the tenseness here. This is a very critical turn. I mean, that was the IP Masquerina activating, and we're now still a pack trying to push through. It's a bit unfortunate. Are we going to use the princess in the graveyard to kind of knock out the monster, target the other Ash, and destroy something? I don't think there's an Amble Whale or to follow up on that. There is a Garunix, however, for the destruction. That's good. Okay. Get your grave. 
Finding the line to get that OTK. Honey has allowed Pack to continue play, so the open game state now returns to Pack. Cars in hand? Three. Three? Three cars Three. in hand. Great resource management. Yeah, we know one of them is the Nibiru that we saw. We know one of them is the Oak that he added back to his hand the previous turn. And the other is the mystery card that he got off of Heat Soul. Uh, attack over a Little Knight. Take 14. you're going to the battle phase, attacking over the Little Knight. I mean, don't commit into anything that could just break your own board. So SP Little Knight usually forces that battle phase. I'm thinking. Wasn't uh, what, is, what are you talking about? What is that? I declare an attack. You There's no effect. No, I, okay. That's Snake, the temple summoned the flamber swung yep. attack. Yeah. That's why the temple is so, just so it. effective. Cars in edge? Three? Thank you. Yeah, the Divine Temple, I commented on this yesterday. It's a card that you read. It doesn't seemingly line up as a powerful field spell in comparison to some of the other ones that we've seen popularized over the course of the last couple of years. But then when you actually watch it play, it slots in so beautifully with the Snake Eye strategy. Take 200. Yes. Yeah, it's just so good that you get the free mo monster that just summoned out. You can place a monster of and then summon out later on. You can use that to kind of follow through with Nibiru yeah. just in mm -hmm. case. And just having that backup strategy available once you get hit by those hand disruption, just play right through it. <laughs> That's really the critical interaction to me is the way to play through Nibiru. Well, also just lighting up well in the mirror match because you can sure. obviously there's special summoning on both players' turns back and forth. Yep. Um, Honda has been summoned on the field. I don't think there's any further activation. The Sanctuary is gone. The Fire King Island's already on the field. Snake Eye Ash, declare an attack. Okay. Snake Eye Ash is going to attack over the Ponyx that only Main has two? 200 fence. Main phase two. That's my grave. Yeah. <laughs> That's a funny question. Can I see my grave? Can I see my graveyard? Yes, you can. Mm -hmm. Yes, you may. <laughs> have Poplar. Yep, perfect. Perfect, so so he says. Summons. So Look at that. Pack is calculating Let's the number go. of summons, evaluating what he needs to uh, do next. Flambridge. I will target your... Uh, Pack of Flambridge. Uh, Promethean? Yep. We're going to put away the princess. If he passes his turn, this is going to be quite interesting, but we're going to take the two monsters that were left on the field, the Diabell Star and the Ash, no. and we're going to it's look it's at the extra deck. Okay, so it goes to his grave. Thank you. That was not his Ash. Remember, that was from the Lullaby of Obedience. Yes, of course, the Lullaby of Obedience. That's a card that we were hinting at throughout the weekend whenever Pack was playing, but we had yet to actually see it in the feature match area. As a matter of fact, his entire uh, team is playing three copies. Mm -hmm. And now that the Fine Bush has pushed that um, Promethean Princess into the back. The special summon of the Hita is not yeah, going to be disrupted, and we're going to special summon back a Poplar from yeah, Hani's yeah. graveyard. I saw my one game one. Yeah, yeah. Right. yeah. I think Pac just realized that his original symbol spoils was banished, and that was yeah, that was enough for him to scoop his cards. Wow, Hani just planned that right from the beginning. Just missed that line there. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. I think I could have broken that. Yep. Mm. No way you could. Yeah, Pac just thought about it and there was no way he could break that I think going first very significant advantage yeah so as we zoom back out here we kind of see a table a it looks like whatever Hansel just did was met with an effect variant. I didn't look particularly pleased by it it looked like as we were well aware of at table C that his sim has already been up a game yes this is going to be a tight spot. I mean, the pressure is on. Hani's team definitely having the advantage. The, J the Jawari brothers. We already know they're up at least one game at table C, one game at table B. But we still have 51 minutes to go. This is a, this is a long one for sure. I really hope that we don't have to get that far into the round. <laughs> Me these neither. Players, particularly when, you know, you watch Packwad play, as I mentioned earlier, he really understands the intricacies, the intricacies of his deck, and he plays at a blistering fast speed for most of the duel. And occasionally you need to take, you know, 15, 20 seconds to really think through something, but usually he's just instant in some of his plays. That's right. And he also plays this guy with absolute confidence. Yeah, it's confident, and he, you know, he declares so that both players can hear very clearly when he's either thinking or activating an effect. It's really something that if you're hoping to go on to the YCS circuit and travel around to some of these events that you really should look to try and replicate. Yes. I mean, we don't want to end up with getting those slow plays. It's very dangerous, especially at this stage in the game. Remember, our penalties from the previous day, they do add up, and they continue on to the day two and into the top cut. It's very, very dangerous, and it's a very slippery slope. But both of these players have been there before in the finals of a YCS. So even though Hani's up a game, you know, he's remaining clear, focused, no emotions from Pack either. He knows that he could very easily win these next two games. I think both players are going to have to hold back their emotion till the very end because any sort of 
reveal the emotion could be a sign of weakness and it could be a read can help your opponent read what you have in your hand and you don't really want to fall into that category i wonder what these players are going to decide against each other again it's like snake eye pure versus a fire king snake eye it's a it's a tight spot i mean if you go into the crossout designator which we kind of saw in the previous game where pack had a crossout designator it was destroyed by uh, the opponent's card however he couldn't activate it because he didn't have any of those Fire King cards to negate. Mm, I saw that in the last round. Yeah, yeah so is Crossout still a high value card? I still think so. I think there are still other very crucial cards that you could probably use against, such as Triple Tactics Talent, perhaps. You can probably use it against Snake Eye Ash. Maybe the Flying Burge. I think the advantage of, say, the Pure Snake Eye is that you have multiple Flying Burge. Like banishing one of them won't hurt you all too much. But these are some of the options that they have. I'm really curious to see whether or not the Biss deals go in. We saw Yes, Pack actually utilized the Bistials because of the reality that Link Rebo and IP Mascarena are so vital to their combos and both are dark monsters that will reach the graveyard in the midst of the combo. But with that being said, it looks like we are ready. The players at Table B have shuffled up and we'll be jumping into game two. That's right. Likely Pack is going to choose to go first on this one. I don't think we're going to do anything that spicy where we're going to switch. Like, yeah, you can go first. The deck, I feel like the decks naturally are just so okay. good against each other just by base, and right now we're just doing minor technical sides just to get that slight edge. Bonfire. Ash. And we're getting Ash on the bonfire. Thank you. Oh, is there a mm. follow-up on this? Well, it could potentially be crossout designator. Call Ash. Yes, it is. Sure. Good call. Oh, and looking at the current table scores, table A with Chris taking one over Hansei. B, of course, we have Hani taking the first game against Pac, and C, they're still going at their, technically their first game, but game two uh, is Haisam versus Pac with one on Haisam. Yeah, Team Supreme Pro, really an uphill battle at this point. Yeah, this is a very significant advantage. You have to win two in a row for all the players. I'm going to win my match, Hani. Sounds oh. like Hassam just said he's going he's gonna to win his match. Wow, is that three in. hand interactions? That was Ash Valor and Mourner. And Mourner could deal damage if you remove that monster as well. I mean, Mourner has been seeing more and more play. A lot of these top cut deck lists have included Mourner now. Yeah, it's a card like we commented on earlier that with the rise in popularity of Effect Valor and Infinite Impermanence, it slots in really great as a seventh, eighth, or even ninth copy. And it's not going to be necessarily as popular across the entire field this weekend. So it also gives you a little bit of resistance against Crossout Designator if a player is elected not to include it in their deck. That's right. I think it's a wonderful hand interruption because it also doesn't align up the attributes as well. You're not going to expect to see the, uh, the Wind Charmer exactly. <laughs> to be put in to kind of take control of the situation here. Now, speaking of Charmers, we have Hita, and we're going to target the Ash Blossom. Honey, actually running pretty low on cards. I mean, you're committing quite a few hand disruptions. That's three now, down to two cards left in hand. Are we able to establish a field on pack side now that can disrupt three cards? Yeah, of course, it's one of the liabilities of playing hand interruptions whose attributes line up in this way. I, I mean, you still have to play right, Ash. Right it's right one now, of the best ones. Okay. Uh, Honey well. says it's looking okay, so those two cards in hand must be pretty powerful cards if he's saying that things look okay. Is it a fourth hand interaction? That would be crazy. It could be uh, infinite impermanence. It could be something that's still usable. And it's a ghost bulb. So many of those sisters coming down. Oh, wow. We've gone through Earth. We've gone through ash? Fire. Yeah. We've gone through oh, all yeah. of us. Oh, no. That was really cool. That was a probably... Oh. Again, <laughs> even in part, this is This is an overload of hand interruption. I was about to say, when Hani said, oh, it's looking pretty good, maybe it was a bluff. <laughs> maybe his hand was just five hand interactions. It depends on what pack draws now. I mean, he had to pass. Yeah, there's a variety of... Oh! Does he have a sixth one? No. No! That was incredible. Hand interruption into hand interruption. We've gone through most of the attribute table now. And another... I think that's all the cards in his hand. <laughs> oh. The Ash has been taken out, okay. But is it over just... I don't think it's over. That's every... That's almost every attribute. Except for Dark. Except for Dark. Wow, Hani's just going to tap the top of his deck. I mean, we are in Las Vegas of all places, right? Yep. One card up the top. Could it be Ash? Could it be Poplar? I mean, there's so many different cards. Attack, attack. 
both players committing every single card. I think we're in a simplified game state at this point. Yeah, Hani it can be okay, is so excited to draw. He could not be more enthusiastic here. You just saw him just, yes, please attack. I just want to see the next card on my top of my deck. I know there's nothing he that you really is, uh, can do from here. He is begging his deck to answer his call. He's begging Asher his Asher Bonfire, deck. Asher Bonfire. He's calling it right now. He needs it to take this one. Based on the theme here, you should probably specify not Ash Blossom. Yeah, no, that's, that's definitely not the Ash we want. Because he knows the pack is locked into fire monsters, and although he can continue making plays, none of them are really overwhelmingly powerful. Heat has already been used, for example. Exactly, and the key right now is that Hani survived the turn. The Art of Survival play, comes into play once again. So the interruption here, the pack could, play you know, really could potentially set up. Yeah, I, I think this makes a lot of sense is just assume there's no topic because you can go to like Phoenix to put a fire on the field. Did I, Hani get it? Oh, if I, he if could I close out the game if he has it. If but I knew anything about Hani, he no. would have slammed it. We're going into game three. That was incredible. I mean, with the hand that he was dealt, he made the most out of it, giving him a chance to take the game. Imperm, imperm. Ash. Ghost Mortar, Ash, <laughs> Baylor. Ghost wow. You know, some people say, oh, I drew a lot of hand interruptions. I just didn't have anything to play with. Hani took that to another level. Yeah, you can take all those hand interruptions, just make your opponent not be able to play, and so that you can hope that they commit everything as well, and now we're in the simplified game state, and it's all about the heart of the cards, the luck of the draw. Wow. Okay. Sorry, a little bit of everything this weekend. A very, very difficult situation. I mean, I don't know. Looking at that hand, he felt so confident, too. He I knew know. exactly how that board was going to end. He knew that both players are going to either have it or not. Like, you're just going to take chances here. I do like a pack basically ended up saying, am I really just going to summon a Nightmare Phoenix so that there's a fire attribute on the field to go with the Promethean Princess in the graveyard? Because that's no good follow-up on yeah. my end. I'm just going to hope the top of Hani's deck works more for me than it does for him. And uh, he's like, no, I'm just going to pass on this. He even consulted his own teammate, you know, having that you know extra assurance. Definitely worth it. Do I water my board down and just hope that he draws, uh, let's say, another infinite impermanence? Yeah. And that's exactly what ended up happening. Well, that's the format. We were playing with a ton of hand interruptions now. I mean, we've also witnessed, like, Shinping's list where it's just all hand interruptions. It seems like that's what the format has come down to, hand interruptions, and make sure that you have more monsters than your opponent to play. But you always want to draw only a combination of them. On Fratsi Vahani, he'd just do all of them. That's right. 42 minutes left, duelists are siding. Seems like we get to turn this game around, perhaps. Hani getting a chance to go first once again. As you can see Hani counting through things, making sure everything's lined up properly. These players have probably gone over their side decking patterns for this matchup all throughout the weekend. They're very in tune, very aware of what needs to come in and out. That's right. And that actually, that's something that you should be practicing. Knowing your siding patterns, knowing the matchup, knowing that you should side in or out, knowing, remembering to side back out properly once the match finishes so they don't get penalized. These are all very important aspects of the game. These are things that you should do when you actually build your deck. You don't want to necessarily just put a bunch of cards that you think are generically powerful into your side deck and not count how many cards you plan on taking out in certain matchups, right? Because then you could end up saying, wow, there are 10 really good cards in my side deck for this matchup, but I can't afford to take up more than four. Mm -hmm. These players coming into this weekend, as many players would making this making it this far into the event, yeah. they know precisely the ratios that they need to go in and out in these particular matchups, whether it's against Snake Eyes, Snake Eyes with Fire Kings, or any of the other top decks. So we have one game apiece for Hani and a pack. And we just had a shot of the crowd there. They're gathering quite the audience, and uh, all of them are eager to see who is, or rather, which team is going to be crowned the Team YCS champions of Las Vegas. Yeah, for our sake, I really hope at table A, Hanse is able to either prolong the game or outright win the game so that we can see the conclusion of our games between Hani and Pakawat. Because if Chris is able to win there at table A, the match will be over. But it's such a scary opponent. Chris is just a five-time YCS champion. Definitely not not, a, not an easy player to, to play against. I mean, Hanse is the only player to ever win two North American World Championship qualifier or somewhat equivalent events. I mean, you know, he's no yeah, slouch himself. Definitely not. Very decorated players. This whole table is just full of decorated players. It is, across the entire table. Yeah. It's really, really an honor to sit back and watch these players battle it out here at the finals of our Team YCS in Las Vegas. I think the siding is nearing completion. Hani is now shuffling up the deck. And uh, once the shuffling is complete, the deck is coming down, and then we're going to be getting ready. Shuffle up close. You know, give uh, the deck a good shuffle. I mean, the last hand, 
not looking too hot, you know, but he saw exactly what he could do and he was very comfortable with it. This is experience. This is experience shown on camera. I really want to go back and say that Hani did a really great bluffer. Kaisen's like, how's it looking over there? And he's like, oh, not too bad at all. When his hand is literally five hand interruptions with no starter <laughs> cards. And here we are going into game number three at table B of the finals of the Team YCS Las Vegas. So we'll get to see Hani go first. One, two, three, four, five. The judges are signaling it in, getting us ready to play. I'll draw one in. She's there, okay. So this will be the last game between these two players for the entire weekend. Will it finish up? I wonder what the score is right now on Hansei's table. We won the bull, Heisen. This is the most absurd hand I've ever seen in my life. Okay, well, Hani seems pretty confident All with this hand. Snake Eye Ash, activate the ability. And uh, current table scores uh, at zero. position number A, matter. we oh, have right. uh, Chris with uh, one uh, and Hanse at zero. That's, that's if their game finishes, we might not that's see so. the conclusion mm. of this. Table B, one game apiece with Hani and Pack, and of course table C, Haisam with the two and O. Oh Hani is feeling pretty good. You can see in his hand he has a crossout designator, and he has a copy of Summon Limit. Oh, that could completely shut out Pack. So. Hopefully the siding patterns work out. We hopefully we practice this. Should I even be summoning them? Oh, they're yeah, getting adv advice from each other. Yeah. Just yeah. for the extra assurance, Same extra confidence. You know, it's nice to have a friend to back you up. You know, typically when drone Lockbright hits the graveyard, it can be pretty backbreaking. Honey yep. immediately is like, yep, totally fine. My hand is that powerful Don't worry, right now. Christopher mm -hmm. LeBlanc, I'm going in. Bro, I'm not worried, bro. I'm about to nib him for his life, bro. Don't disrespect me <laughs> like that again, bro. <laughs> now, we've seen those uh, drone loppers come down uh, for Team Supreme Pro previously, and oh. it was against the Snake Eye Fire King. It has long term percussions where you do not get the full setup, and they get to, to. find to the what? moment the where they can strike. The goal anyways? Wait. Think about it. Think about, think on Ash. Okay. Heisem's like, slow it down, honey. I know your hand is that powerful, but let's just make sure everything's Ash. lining up properly. How do you get the flame burge? Let's, let's be, Ash. let's not get too I'm eager now. To to, it's like a bit of a guardian angel. Like, how are you getting the flame burge, my friend? Like, let's just slow it down a little bit. Think about the position that we're in. If summon limit, that's fine. Just don't do nothing. That's good for me. Pack making the read that there's a summon limit available. That's impressive. Pack just basically can read his entire hand because of that, which is an important that thing to know, by the way. That's what that is fine. a true Yu-Gi-Oh skill. Fine. Being That's able right. to I'm read what, your, what cards your opponent has. And these two. Pack staying calm, even though he knows that there is going to you be know, a can... limit on his summons Seven coming off. up later on. Promethean Princess. Yep. And uh, we're going to go into Promethean yep. Princess. These players are playing at a really blistering pace, or at least Hani is, and they have 37 minutes left in the round, so this isn't because time is closing. They are just that excited. They're just that excited, that I confident. What do you want me to end on? You think I should just end on this? Because you can't even beat this, dude. <laughs> you can't beat this. Now, this particular field, him, only right? the Promethean Princess and the um, Snake yeah, Eye Yeah, sure, just follow up and everything. Ash. Like, it's just game. Sure. And if they have the follow-up of the trap card uh, in the actually, back, actually, it's well, going to be very, very what, bro? difficult. Game, so he has a wanted set that he got off of Blackwitch, Black Witch, and of course he, we know he has summon limit in his hand. Pack even knows he has summon limit in his hand. Honey is super the stars. confident now. Not committing any further, knowing exactly what he has, knowing how strong his current field is. No, dude. Thinking that he has this. You see, the problem here is looking at Pack's list, he doesn't actually have any outs to summon limit. That is, that is very true. And there I may be, there may be some clever siding that could have prevented this. I think there's the possibility that Hani and Pac just know each other's deck list because yeah. they, you know, sometimes they build decks together. And as a result, mm -hmm. Hani's confidence is that with knowledge of what is in Pac's deck, Summon Limit might just be outright game. Fight. We're getting a Poplar effect. Oh, hold yeah. on. There may be something Pac can do. Pack staying really calm, not giving the read to, to Hani. Hani already smiling, super confident, very vocal about the position he's in. And we're going to see the summon limit. Pack says it's fine with me. And we're going to get the Divine Temple of Snake Eye. We won. We won. Let's go. It sounds like a table A. It's come to an end. That has concluded no the game at a different table. No Hani gets up from his Never chair. Needed. 
Super Kevin, happy that his team has go. taken the, the championship. Go. The goal. Remember me. Wow. Well, according to my scorecard, the Fire King has taken it once again. <laughs> but this one was inconclusive. It was tough. I don't know if Hack actually had a way of getting around the summon limit. Now, the way he said that's fine with me or it's good with me, I don't know if that was just a way of making it so that Hani's confidence wasn't boosted even more than it was, or if he really did have something in the back of his mind. Because looking over his deck list, it really doesn't seem like he has a great way of getting around it besides maybe setting infinite impermanence at some point. I think an alternative way that we can turn off that summon limit is to use Quasar Designator and sign in your own copy of summon mm. limit. And then you can use that to turn off, even if there's multiple copies of summon limit, they'll all be turned off at the same time. That was probably one of the ways. However, right now, this is the moment for the Jawari brothers. Yeah, this is always one of the most emotional moments because when you see these players, they didn't just win a YCS, they did it with two of their best friends, or in some cases, literally your brother. The, the level of confidence they have in their play, understanding where they are at all times, and I kind of want to bring up one thing that they did, which is really spectacular, is that they were not they were not playing any Fire King Avatar Kirin. Yeah, Hani actually registered the wrong Kirin in his deck at the beginning of the event, and the solution to that is to remove Kirin from his deck entirely. He played this entire event without Fire King High Avatar Kirin. That means the Fire King package is more or less kind of a dead draw almost, but he manages to use that as a resource package for all those Snake Eye cards instead of using it as a form of disruption. Imagine playing the entire at least game one. Presumably he's going to side out the Fire King package in game two and three, which some players actually just do in that strategy outright, but make it so that you're required to do it because you simply do not have the entire Fire King package in your deck because of a deck list error at the beginning of the day. Yeah. And I remember, you know, thinking back at the beginning of yesterday, I can imagine if you sat down and asked them how confident they were, they would have probably said, we're confident in our play. Our deck list, though, not so much. Uh, yeah. Fast forward now, what's this, 13, 14, 15 rounds later, they ended up winning the entire event, even with one of their players with a major deck list error. Or maybe we don't need the uh, Fire King High Avatar, Kieran. But this is just demonstrating how it's the player, not just the deck. Yeah, it really also showcases the viability of the Snake Eye package, that you can incorporate Snake Eyes with a watered-down version of the Fire Kings, and it's still sufficient enough to go and win the entire event. I mean, they understand the position that they were in. You can hear Hani be like, yo, I've got this. I know what I'm doing. I don't need to commit any further. They understand positioning, and they knew that they were just gonna take it from that particular point. With that being said, it sounds like they're ready on stage for our winner's interview. So we're gonna go back to the stage and hear from these players who are now YCS champions. And YCS champions they are, guys. You can see it on your face, but tell us, how does it feel to win the Team YCS in Las Vegas? Amazing. Awesome. Amazing. Winning awesome. with my brother. <laughs> Not real. I mean, at this point, you have just struggled your way through all of these different matches, you know, winning behind the scenes and everything. we got to ask you, where did the journey start? How did you start playing this great card game? The TV show. The show. The show, the show the is show. what brought you. So that guy right over there, right? Yugi Moto himself. Yep. Yeah. So. Here's the thing, though. You've already won the team championship. What are your goals for Yu-Gi-Oh! now? Worlds. Win more, win more worlds. events. Is that what we're going to do? Worlds. Winning Nats is the start, and then Worlds. All right. Honey, I saw you jumping up, telling them to trust your testing. What advice do you have for players at home so they can get right here on the stage with you? I mean, at the end of the day, there's a lot of avenues to get better. You could get coaching. You could, you could play the game constantly, grind, find the winning formula with your testing circle. And at the end of the day, we just put in mad work. Me, my, my students, everybody, we just put in mad work and we got here. Mad work pays off, right? Yep. Guys, well, look, you go ahead and take your victory lap. And congratulations again on being our Team YCS champions. Let's give it up, guys. And that was incredible. Congratulations to the, Jir the Jawari brothers. Winning with your brother. Oh, I mean, I have a twin brother. I would have loved to win with him, so I can only imagine how exciting it is for them and to be at this stage and win another YCS. All these, they've won Team YCS before, and now they're back at it again. Yeah, I have a younger brother. I actually taught to play Yu-Gi-Oh when he was a younger brother. And when he was younger, and I couldn't imagine what it would be like to win with him beside me. Definitely. It was an incredible tournament, though, and now we finally have our answers to who's going to win, what deck was going to make it on top. And, you know, Hani playing with, you know, a less than perfect deck list, I think. But <laughs> <laughs> still, you have to, I mean, it's anything with like Yu Gi Oh! Anytime you can encounter a situation, you can only do what's in your control. Oh, maybe you made a mistake, but you got to move on from there. You can't let that mistake have a ripple effect onto the rest of your tournament because even a mistake that looks like it might cripple you, you can still win. 
And uh, he definitely capitalized on his mistake using that package to generate the resources and just make the most out of the lemons he was dealt. So looking over the entire weekend, what were some of your favorite moments? Oh man, that's a tough one, but I think I'm just gonna have to go back to that moment today with Ruben and that Beastial Magnum because that was just the most unexpected thing I'd, I'd seen. And the fact that there's other options that are out there. I mean, we saw the team uh, with Pax team using Lullaby of Obedience. There's still so much more to be discovered by this format. So I'm just excited what's gonna come from this event. Mm. How about you, Tom? For me, I got to witness you, Bell, on the stage. We were so close of seeing someone inflicting their own damage, 8,000 damage onto themselves, really, really close. And that just goes to show that, hey, these are potential strategies for the future. That was the one that I was going to say, but another one that really stands out is really just Honey's hand there in game two. Yes. Sometimes people go and say, oh, I really just do too many hand interruptions. I don't think you could take it to another level with what how with the way Honey opened up there in that second game. So confident, like, oh, I got this. Oh, my hand, not too bad. And you, you just you realize, hey, I can force the position into where the top deck is the last thing that really matters. I mean, and it is Las Vegas. Could you imagine if the top card actually was a Snake Eyes Whoa. Ashes reaction? <laughs> that is incredible. Definitely is. I think we're almost ready for the trophy ceremony here very shortly. I think they're getting in place. So another thing to comment on is going forward, have we settled it? Is it Fire Kings with the Snake Eyes as opposed to just solely a Fire King? It's set? hard to tell. Strategy? It's really hard to tell because Honey's List isn't exactly a full Fire King package. This is true. <laughs> like, but how do you, does it count? He surely, has it, I guess you check it in. Better. The scorecard, right. do you check it off? <laughs> it's really amazing. So I think Chris played Fire Kings with the Snake Eyes. Mm -hmm. Hani played fake Fire Kings kind of with Snake Eyes, yeah. a little watered down version. And then his brother Heisen just actually only played Snake Eyes. So we saw three different sort of variations here. Yep, showing you there's a lot of different ways to use those powerful fire cards. You know, for me, I'm going with the Fire King strategy. Arvata is so impactful and opens up a lot of different plays and ways to play through. The fact that you just normal summon Arvata, attack over an SP Little Knight, maybe you stymie their turn, sometimes they just end on SP Little Knight. I'm a big fan of Arvata, so I'm going to be looking at the Fire King Snake Eye deck for going out for it, but I think there's still a lot to be explored. I think the team, the all of Voiceless Voice made it to Top Cut, right? Yep. So that's a deck I'm going to keep my eye on going out to it, and what cards you can incorporate into your strategies to counteract the decks that are clearly dominating the meta right now. And as Pack was able to showcase there, there are cards that need to be explored and discovered. Lullaby of Obedience, a card that we've seen fluctuate in popularity over the course of mm -hmm. Yu-Gi-Oh's history, showcasing itself here, and it really was impressive to watch it in this particular match. I think Lullaby of Obedience and Crossout Designator, they kind of go hand in hand. When you have so much overlap within the decks and adding, say, a Poplar into hand, adding an Ash into hand, we've witnessed how strong that can be. Although, you know, it gets a little messy sometimes, like, oh, I summoned the Ash. Oh, that, that's my Ash, by the way. Don't, don't put it into the wrong graveyard, okay? And there's also a funnier card that I think some people also experimented with, Exchange, the classic exchange where you can take a card out of your opponent's <laughs> hand. That also triggers Poplar as well, if you can rip it out of their hand. Really? Yeah, that it is does. really funny. Yeah, and you also get the knowledge from exchange. We're like, oh, what do you got? What do I have to play around? You can set that's your cards first. Yet. You can set your cards first and only give them a limited option. Ooh, that's kind of cool. <laughs> I'm going to have to look into exchange when I get back. But I do like that. that there's so much to explore, so many different cards. I mean, there's so that's what Yu-Gi-Oh! is so different from other trading card games, is that we have so many cards throughout the years that you can impact the new strategies as well. But I think we're ready to present our trophy, so I'm going to pass it to Darling. Steven, take it away. Thank you so much, Billy. Again, we talked about this all weekend long, but let's crown our Team YCS champions. Give it up one more time for the Jawari brothers. And they would be crowned if the head judge didn't hand them that beautiful Anotherverse Glutonia trophy. And the good news is we have one for each of our players. Again, one oh. more time for the Jawari Brothers, our Team YCS Las Vegas 2024 champions. Yeah. All right, let's send it back to the desk for some final thoughts. All right, what an incredible Team YCS here in Las Vegas. It's always a lot of fun. You know, it's just incredible to have a Team YCS where you can win with your friends. You see it's a lot more fun when you're sitting next to your buds. I mean, it's great winning solo, but having your your brothers and your friends next to you, an irreplaceable memory for sure. It was like a Yugi Joey moment at that point. I mean, being with your brothers, um, this is an unbelievable moment for sure. And with that trophy, there's another trophy added into their trophy case. They are, they are already loaded with trophies. It was an absolute privilege to sit here and watch 
over the course of these last two days, the variety of different decks that we saw, and finally finalizing the rise of these fire decks to the top. It was, you know, kind of in the back of everybody's mind, and it really showcased here in the finals where we saw those two strategies combat each other. And it was really a privilege to sit here in the booth and watch that over the course of the weekend. Absolutely. And uh, with people spectating this event, they're going to definitely take notes, find out what's better, hopefully evolve the event even further, hopefully evolve the format even further. What are your thoughts on that, Billy? Um, I, I think we are going to see a lot more developments in this format. It is just the beginning. Phantom Nightmare did just come out. There's more stuff coming along the way that's going to change things up as well. So you're going to have to stay tuned and figure it out. But I know I had an incredible weekend. I can't wait for the next YCS that we're going to have live streamed coming to you soon in the future. But any final thoughts from you guys to recap the, the weekend? I or just in general for the format as a whole? In the format as a whole, I think right now we're in a format where Cross Out Designate has indicated how strong it can be in a format where you just overlap with so many cards. Uh, I think many of the feature matches have signified that, hey, if I land my Cross Out Designator against some of your key cards, Triple Tactics, Talent, your Ash, maybe even your Flamberge, and cut you out of that one key play, a lot of people just end up picking up their cards. For me, it's going to be whether or not Lullaby of Obedience actually becomes a card that we see in other main decks going forward. Pack and his entire team main decked it. Is that going to be the theme, the three cross out three Lullaby format? We'll have to see. It's going to be interesting. It's triple Tactics Talent, what is the card to look for now? Maybe Lullaby of Obedience is the next one. But I'm going to toss it to Steven to close out the show. Again, what an incredible series of duels that we've seen across the board here. And here's the thing, we do have more Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series events that we're going to have this year, but you know what? None of this happens without you. So instead of watching from home, next time we would love to see you in the greatest place of all, a Yu-Gi-Oh! Championship Series at the best time to be here when it's time to duel. So stay tuned. Someday we'll see you up here. We can't wait to crown you as our champion. Till then. Thanks. <laughs> okay, looks like we're... Yum, 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 yum.